Preface to the Last Essays of Elia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb Preface by a Friend of the Late Elia This poor gentleman, who for some months past had been in a declining way, hath at length paid his final tribute to nature. To say truth, it is time he were gone. The humour of the thing, if there was ever much in it, was pretty well exhausted, and a two years and a half existence has been a tolerable duration for a phantom. I am now at liberty to confess that much which I have heard objected to my late friend's writings was well founded. Crude they are, I grant you, a sort of unlicked, incondite thing, villainously pranked in an affected array of antique modes and phrases. They had not been his, if they had been other than such, and better it is that a writer should be natural in a self-pleasing quaintness than to affect a naturalness so called that should be strange to him. Egotistical they have been pronounced by some who did not know that what he tells us as of himself was often true only historically of another, as in a former essay, to save many instances, where under the first person, his favourite figure, he shadows forth the forlorn estate of a country boy placed at a London school far from his friends and connections, in direct opposition to his own early history. If it be egotism to imply and twine with his own identity the griefs and affections of another, making himself many or reducing many unto himself, then is the skilful novelist who all alone brings in his hero or heroine speaking of themselves the greatest egotist of all, who yet has never, therefore, been accused of that narrowness. And how shall the intenser dramatist escape being faulty, who, doubtless, under cover of passion uttered by another, oftentimes gives blameless vent to his most inward feelings, and expresses his own story modestly? My late friend was in many respects a singular character. Those who did not like him hated him, and some who once liked him afterwards became his bitterest haters. The truth is, he gave himself too little concern what he uttered, and in whose presence. He observed neither time nor place, and would e'en out with what came uppermost. With the severe religionist he would pass for a free-thinker, while the other faction set him down for a bigot, or persuaded themselves that he belied his sentiments. Few understood him, and I am not certain that at all times he quite understood himself. He too much affected that dangerous figure, irony. He sowed doubtful speeches, and reaped 
plain, unequivocal hatred. He would interrupt the gravest discussion with some light jest, and yet, perhaps, not quite irrelevant in ears that could understand it. Your long and much talkers hated him. The informal habit of his mind, joined to an inveterate impediment of speech, forbade him to be an orator, and he seemed determined that no one else should play that part when he was present. He was petite and ordinary in his person and appearance. I have seen him sometimes in what is called good company, but where he has been a stranger, sit silent, and be suspected for an odd fellow. Till some unlucky occasion provoking it, he would stutter out some senseless pun, not altogether senseless, perhaps, if rightly taken, which has stamped his character for the evening. It was hit or miss with him, but nine times out of ten he contrived by this device to send away a whole company his enemies. His conceptions rose kindlier than his utterance, and his happiest impromptus had the appearance of effort. He has been accused of trying to be witty, when, in truth, he was but struggling to give his poor thoughts articulation. He chose his companions for some individuality of character which they manifested. Hence not many persons of science, and few professed literati, were of his counsels. They were, for the most part, persons of an uncertain fortune, and as to such people commonly nothing is more obnoxious than a gentleman of settled though moderate income, he passed with most of them for a great miser. To my knowledge this was a mistake. His intimados, to confess a truth, were in the world's eye a ragged regiment. He found them floating on the surface of society, and the colour or something else in the weed pleased him. The burrs stuck to him, but they were good and loving burrs for all that. He never greatly cared for the society of what are called good people. If any of these were scandalised, and offences were sure to arise, he could not help it. When he has been remonstrated with, for not making more concessions to the feelings of good people, he would retort by asking what one point did these good people ever concede to him. He was temperate in his meals and diversions, but always kept a little on this side of abstemiousness. Only in the use of the Indian weed he might be thought a little excessive. He took it, he would say, as a solvent of speech. Marry, as the friendly vapour ascended, how his prattle would curl up sometimes with it. The ligaments which tongue-tied him were loosened, and the stammerer proceeded a status. I do not know whether I ought to bemoan or rejoice that my old friend is departed. His jests were beginning to grow obsolete, and his stories to be found out. He felt the approaches of age, and while he pretended to cling to life, you saw how slender were the ties left to bind him. Discoursing with him latterly on this subject, he expressed himself with a pettishness which I thought unworthy of him. In our walks about his suburban retreat, as he called it, 
at Shacklewell, some children belonging to a school of industry had met us, and bowed and curtsied, as he thought, in an especial manner to him. They take me for a visiting governor, he muttered earnestly. He had a horror, which he carried to a foible, of looking like anything important and parochial. He thought that he approached nearer to that stamp daily. He had a general aversion from being treated like a grave or respectable character, and kept a wary eye upon the advances of age that should so entitle him. He herded always, while it was possible, with people younger than himself. He did not conform to the march of time, but was dragged along in the procession. His manners lagged behind his years. He was too much of the boy-man. The toga virilis never sat gracefully on his shoulders. The impressions of infancy had burnt into him, and he resented the impertinence of manhood. These were weaknesses, but such as they were, they are a key to explicate some of his writings. End of Preface Essay 1 of the Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison Blakesmore in Hertfordshire I do not know a pleasure more affecting than to range at will over the deserted apartments of some fine old family mansion. The traces of extinct grandeur admit of a better passion than envy, and contemplations on the great and good whom we fancy in succession to have been its inhabitants, weave for us illusions incompatible with the bustle of modern occupancy and vanities of foolish present aristocracy. The same difference of feeling, I think, attends us between entering an empty and a crowded church. In the latter it is chance but some present human frailty, an act of inattention on the part of some of the auditory, or a trait of affectation or worse vainglory on that of the preacher, puts us by our best thoughts, disharmonizing the place and the occasion. But wouldst thou know the beauty of holiness? Go alone on some weekday, borrowing the keys of good Master Sexton, traverse the cool aisles of some country church, think of the piety that has kneeled there, the congregations, old and young, that have found consolation there, the meek pastor, the docile parishioner, with no disturbing emotions, no cross-conflicting comparisons, drink in the tranquillity of the place, till thou thyself become as fixed and motionless as the marble effigies that kneel and weep around thee. Journeying northward lately, I could not resist going some few miles out of my road, to look upon the remains of an old great house with which I had been impressed in this way in infancy. I was apprised that the owner of it had lately pulled it down. Still, I had a vague notion that it could not all have perished, that so much solidity with magnificence could not have been crushed all at once into the mere dust and rubbish which I found it. The work of ruin had proceeded with a swift hand indeed, and the demolition of a few weeks had reduced it to an antiquity. 
I was astonished at the indistinction of everything. Where had stood the great gates? What bounded the courtyard? Where about did the outhouses commence? A few bricks only lay as representatives of that which was so stately and so spacious. Death does not shrink up his human victim at this rate. The burnt ashes of a man weigh more in their proportion. Had I seen these brick and mortar knaves at their process of destruction, at the plucking of every panel, I should have felt the varlets at my heart. I should have cried out to them to spare a plank, at least, out of the cheerful storeroom, in whose hot window-seat I used to sit and read Cowley, with the grass plat before, and the hum and flappings of that one solitary wasp that ever haunted it about me. It is in mine ears now, as oft as summer returns. Or a panel of the yellow room. Why, every plank and panel of that house for me had magic in it. The tapestry bedrooms, tapestry so much better than painting, not adorning merely but peopling the wainscots, at which childhood ever and anon would steal a look, shifting its coverlid, replaced as quickly, to exercise its tender courage in a momentary eye encounter with those stern bright visages staring reciprocally, all ovid on the walls, in colours vivider than his descriptions. At Teon, in mid-sprout, with the unappeasable prudery of Diana, and the still more provoking and almost culinary coolness of Dan Phoebus, eel fashion, deliberately divesting of Marcias. Then that haunted room in which old Mrs. Battle died, wherein too I have crept but always in the daytime with a passion of fear and a sneaking curiosity, terror-tainted, to hold communication with the past. How shall they build it up again? It was an old deserted place, yet not so long deserted, but the traces of the splendour of past inmates were everywhere apparent. Its furniture was still standing, even to the tarnished gilt-leather battledoors, and crumbling feathers of shuttlecocks in the nursery, which told the children had once played there. But I was a lonely child, and had the range at will of every apartment, knew every nook and corner, wondered and worshipped everywhere. The solitude of childhood is not so much the mother of thought as it is the feeder of love, and silence, and admiration. So strange a passion for the place possessed me in those years, that though there lay, I shame to say, how few roods distant from the mansion, half hid by trees, what I judged some romantic lake, such was the spell which bound me to the house, and such my carefulness not to pass its strict and proper precincts, that the idle waters lay unexplored for me and not till late in life, curiosity prevailing over elder devotion, I found, to my astonishment, a pretty brawling brook had been the Lacus incognitus of my infancy. Variegated views, extensive prospects, and those at no great distance from the house, I was told of such. What were they to me, being out of the boundaries of my Eden? so far from a wish to roam, I would have drawn, methought, still closer the fences of my chosen prison, and have been hemmed in by a yet securer cincture of those excluding garden walls. I could have exclaimed with that garden-loving poet, Bind me, ye woodbines, in your twines, curl me about, ye gadding vines, and, oh, so close your circles lace, that I may never leave this place. 
but lest your fetters prove too weak, ere I your silken bondage break, do you, O oh, brambles, chain me too, and courteous briars nail me through. I was here as in a lonely temple, snug firesides, the low-built roof, parlours ten feet by ten, frugal boards, and all the homeliness of home, these were the condition of my birth, the wholesome soil which I was planted in. Yet, without impeachment to their tenderest lessons, I am not sorry to have had glances of something beyond, and to have taken it but a peep in childhood at the contrasting accidents of a great fortune. To have the feeling of gentility, it is not necessary to have been born gentle. The pride of ancestry may be had on cheaper terms than to be obliged to an importunate race of ancestors, and the coatless antiquary in his unemblazoned cell, revolving the long line of a Mowbray's or de Clifford's pedigree, at those sounding names may warm himself into as gay a vanity as those who do inherit them. The claims of birth are ideal merely, and what herald shall go about to strip me of an idea? Is it trenchant to their swords? Can it be hacked off as a spur can, or torn away like a tarnished garter? What else were the families of the great to us? What pleasure should we take in their tedious genealogies, or their capitulatory brass monuments? What to us the uninterrupted current of their bloods, if our own did not answer within us to a cognate and correspondent elevation? Or wherefore else, O oh, tattered and diminished scutcheon, that hung upon the time-worn walls of thy princely stairs, Blakesmore, have I in childhood so oft stood poring upon thy mystic characters, thy emblematic supporters, with their prophetic resurgam, till every dreg of peasantry purging off, I received into myself very gentility. Thou wert first in my morning eyes, and of nights hast detained my steps from bedward, till it was but a step from gazing at thee to dreaming on thee. This is the only true gentry by adoption, the veritable change of blood, and not, as empirics have fabled, by transfusion. Who it was by dying that had earned the splendid trophy I know not, I inquired not, but its fading rags and colours cobweb-stained, told that its subject was of two centuries back. And what if my ancestor at that date were some Damoetas, feeding flocks not his own, upon the hills of Lincoln? Did I in less earnest vindicate to myself the family trappings of this once proud Sigon, repaying by a backward triumph the insults he might possibly have heaped in his lifetime upon my poor pastoral progenitor. If it were presumption so to speculate, the present owners of the mansion had least reason to complain. They had long forsaken the old house of their fathers for a newer trifle, and I was left to appropriate to myself what images I could pick up to raise my fancy or to soothe my vanity. I was the true descendant of these old Wentworths, and not the present family of that name, who had fled the old waste places. Mine was that gallery of good old family portraits, which, as I have gone over, giving them in fancy my own family name, one and then another, would seem to smile 
reaching forward from the canvas to recognize the new relationship, while the rest looked grave, as it seemed, at the vacancy in their dwelling and thoughts of fled posterity. That beauty with the cool blue pastoral drapery and a lamb that hung next the great bay window with the bright yellow Hertfordshire hair and eye of watchet hue so like my Alice. I am persuaded she was a true Elia, Mildred Elia, I take it. Mine too, Blakesmore, was thy noble marble hall, with its mosaic pavements and its twelve Caesars, stately busts in marble ranged round, of whose countenances young reader of faces as i was the frowning beauty of nero i remember had most of my wonder but the mild galba had my love there they stood in the coldness of death yet freshness of immortality mine too thy lofty justice hall with its one chair of authority high-backed and wicked once the terror of luckless poacher or self-forgetful maiden, so common sense that bats have roosted in it. Mine, too, whose else, thy costly fruit-garden, with its sun-baked southern wall, the ampler pleasure-garden, rising backwards from the house in triple terraces, with flower-pots now of palest lead, save that a speck here and there, saved from the elements, bespeak their pristine state to have been gilt and glittering the verdant quarters backward are still and stretching still beyond in old formality thy furry wilderness the haunt of the squirrel and the day-long murmuring wood-pigeon with that antique image in the centre god or goddess i wist not but child of athens or old rome paid never a sincerer worship to Pan or to Sylvanus in their native groves than I to that fragmental mystery. Was it for this that I kissed my childish hands too fervently in your idol worship, walks and windings of Blake's Moor? For this, or what sin of mine, has the plough passed over your pleasant places? I sometimes think that, as men, when they die, do not die all, so of their extinguished habitations there may be a hope. Essay 2 of the last essays of elia by charles lamb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison poor relations a poor relation is the most irrelevant thing in nature a piece of impertinent correspondency, an odious approximation, a haunting conscience, a preposterous shadow lengthening in the noontide of your prosperity, an unwelcome remembrancer, a perpetually recurring mortification, a drain on your purse a more intolerable dun upon your pride, a drawback upon success, a rebuke to your rising, a stain in your blood, a blot on your scutcheon, a rent in your garment, a death's head at your banquet, Agathocles pot, a Mordecai in your gate, a Lazarus at your door, a lion in your path, a frog in your chamber, a fly in your ointment, a moat in your eye, 
a triumph to your enemy, an apology to your friends, the one thing not needful, the hail in harvest, the ounce of sour in a pound of sweet. He is known by his knock. Your heart telleth you, That is Mr. Addison, A rap between familiarity and respect, That demands, and at the same time Seems to despair of entertainment. He entereth smiling and embarrassed. He holdeth out his hand to you to shake, and draweth it back again, he casually looketh in about dinner-time, when the table is full. He offereth to go away, seeing you have company, but is induced to stay. He filleth a chair, and your visitor's two children are accommodated at a side-table. He never cometh upon open days, when your wife says, with some complacency, My dear, perhaps Mr. Addison will drop in to-day. He remembereth birthdays, and professeth he is fortunate to have stumbled upon one. He declareth against fish, the turbot being small, yet suffereth himself to be importuned into a slice against his first resolution. He sticketh by the port, yet will be prevailed upon to empty the remainder glass of claret, if a stranger press it upon him. He is a puzzle to the servants, who are fearful of being too obsequious or not civil enough to him. The guests think they have seen him before. Every one speculateth upon his condition, and the most part take him to be a tide-waiter. He calleth you by your Christian name, to imply that his other is the same with your own. He is too familiar by half, yet you wish he had less diffidence. With half the familiarity, he might pass for a casual dependent. With more boldness, he would be in no danger of being taken for what he is. He is too humble for a friend, yet taketh on him more state than befits a client. He is a worse guest than a country tenant, inasmuch as he bringeth up no rent. Yet tis odds from his garb and demeanour that your guests take him for one. He is asked to make one at the whist-table, refuseth on the score of poverty, and resents being left out. When the company break up, he proffereth to go for a coach, and lets the servant go. He recollects your grandfather, and will thrust in some mean and quite unimportant anecdote of the family. He knew it when it was not quite so flourishing, as he is blessed in seeing it now. He reviveth past situations to institute what he calleth favourable comparisons. With a reflecting sort of congratulation, he will inquire the price of your furniture, and insults you with a special commendation of your window-curtains. He is of opinion that the urn is the more elegant shape, but after all there was something more comfortable about the old tea-kettle, which you must remember. He dare say you must find a great convenience in having a carriage of your own, and appealeth to your lady if it is not so, inquireth if you have had your arms done in vellum yet, and did not know till lately that such and such had been the crest of the family. His memory is unseasonable, 
his compliments perverse, his talk a trouble, his stay pertinacious, and when he goeth away you dismiss his chair into a corner as precipitately as possible, and feel fairly rid of two nuisances. There is a worse evil under the sun, and that is a female poor relation. You may do something with the other, you may pass him off tolerably well, but your indigent she-relative is hopeless. He is an old humorist, you may say, and affects to go threadbare. His circumstances are better than folks would take them to be. You are fond of having a character at your table, and truly he is one. But in the indications of female poverty there can be no disguise. No woman dresses below herself from caprice. The truth must out without shuffling. She is plainly related to the Lammels, or what does she at their house? She is, in all probability, your wife's cousin. Nine times out of ten, at least, this is the case. Her garb is something between a gentlewoman and a beggar, yet the former evidently predominates. She is most provokingly humble, and ostentatiously sensible to her inferiority. He may require to be repressed sometimes, aliquando soflaminandos erat, but there is no raising her. You send her soup at dinner, and she begs to be helped after the gentleman. Mr. Engleby requests the honour of taking wine with her, she hesitates between port and Madeira, and chooses the former, because he does. She calls the servant sir, and insists on not troubling him to hold her plate. The housekeeper patronises her. The children's governess takes upon her to correct her when she has mistaken the piano for a harpsichord. Richard Amlet, Esquire, in the play, is a notable instance of the disadvantages to which this chimerical notion of affinity constituting a claim to acquaintance may subject the spirit of a gentleman. A little foolish blood is all that is betwixt him and a lady of great estate. His stars are perpetually crossed, by the malignant maternity of an old woman who persists in calling him her son Dick. But she has wherewithal in the end to recompense his indignities and float him again upon the brilliant surface, under which it had been her seeming business and pleasure all along to sink him. All men, besides, are not of Dick's temperament. I knew an Amlet in real life, who, wanting Dick's buoyancy, sank indeed. Poor Wingard was of my own standing at Christ's, a fine classic and a youth of promise. If he had a blemish, it was too much pride, but its quality was inoffensive. It was not of that sort which hardens the heart, and serves to keep inferiors at a distance. It only sought to ward off derogation from itself. It was the principle of self-respect, carried as far as it could go, without infringing upon that respect which he would have everyone else equally maintain for himself. He would have you to think alike with him on this topic. Many a quarrel have I had with him when we were rather older boys, and our tallness made us more obnoxious to observation in the blue clothes 
because I would not thread the alleys and blind ways of the town with him to elude notice, when we have been out together on a holiday in the streets of this sneering and prying metropolis. Wingard went, saw with these notions to Oxford, where the dignity and sweetness of a scholar's life meeting with the alloy of a humble introduction wrought in him a passionate devotion to the place with a profound aversion from the society the servitor's gown worse than his school array clung to him with nessian venom he thought himself ridiculous in a garb under which latimer must have walked erect and in which Hooker, in his young days, possibly flaunted in a vein of no discommendable vanity. In the depth of college shades, or in his lonely chamber, the poor student shrunk from observation. He found shelter among books which insult not, and studies that ask no questions of a youth's finances. He was lord of his library, and seldom cared for looking out beyond his domains. The healing influence of studious pursuits was upon him, to soothe and to abstract. He was almost a healthy man, when the waywardness of his fate broke out against him with a second and worse malignity. The father of Wingard, had hitherto exercised the humble profession of house-painter at Nuneaton near Oxford. A supposed interest with some of the heads of the colleges had now induced him to take up his abode in that city, with the hope of being employed upon some public works which were talked of. From that moment I read in the countenance of the young man the determination which at length tore him from academical pursuits for ever. To a person unacquainted with our universities, the distance between the gownsmen and the townsmen, as they are called, the trading part of the latter especially, is carried to an excess that would appear harsh and incredible. The temperament of Wingard's father was diametrically the reverse of his own. Old Wingard was a little, busy, cringing tradesman, who, with his son upon his arm, would stand bowing and scraping, cap in hand, to anything that wore the semblance of a gown, insensible to the winks and opener remonstrances of the young man, to whose chamber-fellow, or equal in standing, perhaps, he was thus obsequiously and gratuitously ducking. Such a state of things could not last. Wingard must change the air of Oxford, or be suffocated. He chose the former and let the sturdy moralist, who strains the point of the filial duties as high as they can bear, censure the dereliction. He cannot estimate the struggle. I stood with Wingard the last afternoon I ever saw him, under the eaves of his paternal dwelling. It was in the fine lane, leading from the high street, to the back of Jesus College, where Wingard kept his rooms. He seemed thoughtful and more reconciled. I ventured to rally him, finding him in a better mood, upon a representation of the artist evangelist, which the old man, whose affairs were beginning to flourish, had caused to be set up in a splendid sort of frame over his really handsome shop either as a token of prosperity or badge of gratitude to his saint. Wingard looked up at the luke, and, like Satan, knew his mounted sign, and fled. 
A letter on his father's table the next morning announced that he had accepted a commission in a regiment about to embark for Portugal. He was among the first who perished before the walls of San Sebastian. I do not know how, upon a subject which I began with treating half seriously, I should have fallen upon a recital so eminently painful. But this theme of poor relationship is replete with so much matter for tragic as well as comic associations, that it is difficult to keep the account distinct without blending. The earliest impressions which I received on this matter are certainly not attended with anything painful or very humiliating in the recalling. At my father's table, no very splendid one, was to be found every Saturday the mysterious figure of an aged gentleman, clothed in neat black, of a sad yet comely appearance. His deportment was of the essence of gravity, his words few or none, and I was not to make a noise in his presence. I had little inclination to have done so, for my cue was to admire in silence. A particular elbow-chair was appropriated to him, which was in no case to be violated. A peculiar sort of sweet pudding, which appeared on no other occasion, distinguished the days of his coming. I used to think him a prodigiously rich man. All I could make out of him was that he and my father had been schoolfellows a world ago at Lincoln, and that he came from the Mint. The Mint I knew to be a place where all the money was coined, and I thought he was the owner of all that money. Awful ideas of the Tower twined themselves about his presence. He seemed above human infirmities and passions. A sort of melancholy grandeur invested him. From some inexplicable doom I fancied him obliged to go about in an eternal suit of mourning. A captive, a stately being, let out of the tower on Saturdays. Often have I wondered at the temerity of my father, who, in spite of an habitual general respect, which we all in common manifested towards him, would venture now and then to stand up against him in some argument touching their youthful days. The houses of the ancient city of Lincoln are divided, as most of my readers know, between the dwellers on the hill and in the valley. This marked distinction formed an obvious division between the boys who lived above, however brought together in a common school, and the boys whose paternal residence was on the plain. A sufficient cause of hostility in the code of these young Grotiuses. My father had been a leading mountaineer, and would still maintain the general superiority in skill and hardihood of the above boys, his own faction, over the below boys, so were they called, of which party his contemporary had been a chieftain. Many and hot were the skirmishes on this topic, the only one upon which the old gentleman was ever brought out, and bad blood bred, even sometimes almost to the recommencement, so I expected, of actual hostilities. But my father, who scorned to insist upon advantages, generally contrived to turn the conversation upon some adroit by-commendation of the old minster in the general preference of which, before all other cathedrals in the island, the dweller on the hill and the plain born could meet on a conciliating level, and lay down their less important differences. Once only 
I saw the old gentleman really ruffled, and I remembered with anguish the thought that came over me. Perhaps he will never come here again. He had been pressed to take another plate of the viand, which I have already mentioned as the indispensable concomitant of his visits. He had refused, with a resistance amounting to rigour, when my aunt, an old Lincolnian, but who had something of this in common with my cousin Bridget, that she would sometimes press civility out of season, uttered the following memorable application. "'Do take another slice, Mr. Bullet, for you do not get pudding every day.' The old gentleman said nothing at the time, but he took occasion, in the course of the evening, when some argument had intervened between them, to utter with an emphasis which chilled the company, and which chills me now as I write it, "'Woman, you are superannuated!' John Billet did not survive long after the digesting of this affront, but he survived long enough to assure me that peace was actually restored, and if I remember aright, another pudding was discreetly substituted in the place of that which had occasioned the offence. He died at the Mint, anno 1781, where he had long held a what he accounted a comfortable independence, and with five pounds fourteen shillings and a penny which were found in his escritoire after his decease left the world blessing god that he had enough to bury him and that he had never been obliged to any man for a sixpence Essay three of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Stage illusion. A play is said to be well or ill acted in proportion to the scenical illusion produced. Whether such illusion can in any case be perfect is not the question. The nearest approach to it, we are told, is when the actor appears wholly unconscious of the presence of spectators. In tragedy, in all which is to affect the feelings, this undivided attention to his stage business seems indispensable. Yet it is, in fact, dispensed with every day by our cleverest tragedians. And while these references to an audience in the shape of rant or sentiment are not too frequent or palpable, a sufficient quantity of illusion for the purposes of dramatic interest may be said to be produced in spite of them. But, tragedy apart, it may be inquired whether, in certain characters in comedy, especially those which are a little extravagant, or which involve some notion repugnant to the moral sense, it is not a proof of the highest skill in the comedian, when, without absolutely appealing to an audience, he keeps up a tacit understanding with them, and makes them, unconsciously to themselves, a party in the scene. The utmost nicety is required in the mode of doing this, but we speak only of the great artists in the profession. The most mortifying infirmity in human nature to feel in ourselves, or to contemplate in another, is perhaps cowardice. To see a coward done to the life upon a stage would produce anything but mirth. 
yet we most of us remember Jack Bannister's cowards. Could anything be more agreeable, more pleasant? We love the rogues. How was this effected but by the exquisite art of the actor in a perpetual sub-insinuation to us, the spectators, even in the extremity of the shaking fit, that he was not half such a coward as we took him for? We saw all the common symptoms of the malady upon him, the quivering lip, the cowering knees, the teeth chattering, and could have sworn that man was frightened. But we forgot all the while, or kept it almost a secret to ourselves, that he never once lost his self-possession, that he let out by a thousand droll looks and gestures, meant at us, and not at all supposed to be visible to his fellows in the scene, that his confidence in his own resources had never once deserted him. Was this a genuine picture of a coward, or not rather a likeness, which the clever artist contrived to palm upon us instead of an original, while we secretly connived at the delusion for the purpose of greater pleasure than a more genuine counterfeiting of the imbecility, helplessness, and utter self-desertion which we know to be concomitants of cowardice in real life could have given us. Why are misers so hateful in the world, and so endurable on the stage, but because the skilful actor, by a sort of sub-reference rather than direct appeal to us, disarms the character of a great deal of its odiousness, by seeming to engage our compassion for the insecure tenure by which he holds his money-bags and parchments. By this subtle vent, half of the hatefulness of the character, the self-closeness with which in real life it coils itself up from the sympathies of men, evaporates. The miser becomes sympathetic, i.e., is no genuine miser. Here again a diverting likeness is substituted for a very disagreeable reality. Spleen, irritability, the pitiable infirmities of old men, which produce only pain to behold in the realities, counterfeited upon a stage, divert not altogether for the comic appendages to them, but in part from an inner conviction that they are being acted before us, that a likeness only is going on, and not the thing itself. They please by being done under the life, or beside it, not to the life. When Gatti acts an old man, is he angry indeed, or only a pleasant counterfeit, just enough of a likeness to recognise, without pressing upon us the uneasy sense of reality. Comedians, paradoxical as it may seem, may be too natural. It was the case with the late actor. Nothing could be more earnest or true than the manner of Mr. Emery. This told excellently in his tyke and characters of a tragic cast but when he carried the same rigid exclusiveness of attention to the stage business, and willful blindness and oblivion of everything before the curtain into his comedy, it produced a harsh and dissonant effect. He was out of keeping with the rest of the Passone Dramatis. There was as little link between him and them as betwixt himself and the audience. He was a third estate, dry, repulsive, and unsocial to all. Individually considered, his execution was masterly, but comedy is not this unbending thing, for this reason that the same degree of credibility is not required of it 
as to serious scenes. The degrees of credibility demanded to the two things may be illustrated by the different sort of truth which we expect when a man tells us a mournful or a merry story. If we suspect the former of falsehood in any one tittle, we reject it altogether. Our tears refuse to flow at a suspected imposition. But the teller of a mirthful tale has the latitude allowed him. We are content with less than absolute truth. Tis the same with dramatic illusion. We confess we love in comedy to see an audience naturalised behind the scenes, taken in into the interest of the drama, welcomed as bystanders, however. There is something ungracious in a comic actor holding himself aloof from all participation or concern with those who are come to be diverted by him. Macbeth must see the dagger, and no ear but his own be told of it, but an old fool in farce may think he sees something, and by conscious words and looks express it as plainly as he can speak to pit, box, and gallery. When an impertinent in tragedy, an Osric, for instance, breaks in upon the serious passions of the scene, we approve of the contempt with which he is treated. But when the pleasant impertinent of comedy, in a piece purely meant to give delight and raise mirth out of whimsical perplexities, worries the studious man with taking up his leisure or making his house his home, the same sort of contempt expressed, however natural, would destroy the balance of delight in the spectators. To make the intrusion comic, the actor who plays the annoyed man must a little desert nature. He must, in short, be thinking of the audience, and express only so much dissatisfaction and peevishness as is consistent with the pleasure of comedy. In other words, his perplexity must seem half put on. If he repel the intruder with the sober set face of a man in earnest, and more especially if he deliver his expostulations in the tone which in the world must necessarily provoke a duel, his real-life manner will destroy the whimsical and purely dramatic existence of the other character, which to render it comic demands an antagonist comicality on the part of the character opposed to it, and convert what was meant for mirth rather than belief into a downright piece of impertinence indeed, which would raise no diversion in us, but rather stir pain to see inflicted in earnest upon any unworthy person. A very judicious actor, in most of his parts, seems to have fallen into an error of this sort in his playing with Mr. Wrench in the farce of Free and Easy. Many instances would be tedious. These may suffice to show that comic acting at least does not always demand from the performer that strict abstraction from all reference to an audience which is exacted of it, but that in some cases a sort of compromise may take place, and all the purposes of dramatic delight be attained by a judicious understanding not too openly announced between the lips. Essay four of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. To the shade of Elliston. 
joyousest of once embodied spirits, whither at length hast thou flown? To what genial region are we permitted to conjecture that thou hast flitted? Art thou sowing thy wild oats yet? The harvest time was still to come with thee, upon casual sands of Avernus? Or art thou enacting rover, as we would gladlier think, by wandering Elysian streams? This mortal frame, while thou didst play thy brief antics amongst us, was in truth anything but a prison to thee as the vain platonist dreams of this body to be no better than a county jail forsooth or some house of durance vile whereof the five senses are the fetters thou knewest better than to be in a hurry to cast off those jibes and had notice to quit i fear before thou wert quite ready to abandon this fleshly tenement it was thy pleasure-house thy palace of dainty devices thy louvre or thy white hall what new mysterious lodgings dost thou tenant now or when may we expect thy aerial house-warming tartarus we know and we have read of the blessed shades and now cannot I intelligibly fancy thee in either? Is it too much to hazard a conjecture that, as the schoolmen admitted a receptacle apart for patriarchs and unchristened babes, there may exist, not far, perchance, from that storehouse of all vanities which Milton saw in visions, a limbo somewhere for players and that up thither like aerial vapours fly both all stage things and all that in stage things built their fond hopes of glory or lasting fame all the unaccomplished works of authors hands abortive monstrous or unkindly mixed damned upon earth fleet thither play opera farce with all their trumpery there by the neighbouring moon by some not improperly supposed thy regent planet upon earth mayest thou not still be acting thy managerial pranks great disembodied lessee but lessee still and still a manager in green rooms impervious to mortal eye the muse beholds thee wielding posthumous empire thin ghosts of figurantes never plump on earth circle thee in endlessly and still their song is fie on sinful fantasy magnificent were thy capriccios on this globe of earth robert william elliston for as yet we know not thy new name in heaven it irks me to think that stripped of thy regalities thou shouldst ferry over a poor forked shade in crazy stygian wherry methinks i hear the old boatman paddling by the weedy wharf with raucous voice bawling scowls scowls to which with waving hand and majestic action thou deignest no reply other than in two curt monosyllables no oars but the laws of pluto's kingdom no small difference between king and cobbler manager and callboy and if haply your dates of life were conterminant you are quietly taking your passage cheek by cheek 
oh ignoble levelling of death with the shade of some recently departed candle snuffer but mercy what strippings what tearing off of histrionic robes and private vanities what denudations to the bone before the surly ferryman will admit you to set a foot within his battered lighter crowns sceptres shield sword and truncheon thy own coronation robes for thou hast brought the whole property man's wardrobe with thee enough to sink a navy the judge's ermine the coxcomb's wig the snuff-box a la foppington all must overboard he positively swears and that ancient mariner brooks no denial for since the tiresome monodram of the old thracian harper charon it is to be believed hath shown small taste for theatricals ay now tis done you are just boat weight pura et puta anima but bless me how little you look so shall we all look kings and caesars stripped for the last voyage but the murky rogue pushes off adieu pleasant and thrice pleasant shade with my parting thanks for many a heavy hour of life lightened by thy harmless extravaganzas public or domestic radamantus who tries the lighter causes below leaving to his two brethren the heavy calendars honest radamanth always partial to players weighing their party-coloured existence here upon earth making account of the few foibles that may have shaded thy real life as we call it though substantially scarcely less a vapour than thy idlest vagaries upon the boards of drury as but of so many echoes natural repercussions and results to be expected from the assumed extravagances of thy secondary or mock life nightly upon a stage after a lenient castigation with rods lighter than of those medusian ringlets but just enough to whip the offending adam out of thee shall courteously dismiss thee at the right-hand gate the o p side of hades that conducts to masks and merry-makings in the theatre royal of proserpine Essay five of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Alastoniana. My acquaintance with the pleasant creature whose loss we all deplore was but slight my first introduction to e which afterwards ripened into an acquaintance a little on this side of intimacy was over a counter of the lemington spa library then newly entered upon by a branch of his family e whom nothing misbecame to auspicate i suppose the filial concern and set it a-going with a lustre was serving in person two damsels fair who had come into the shop ostensibly to inquire for some new publication but in reality to have a sight of the illustrious shopman hoping some conference with what an air did he reach down the volume dispassionately giving his opinion upon the worth of the work in question and launching out 
into a dissertation on its comparative merits with those of certain publications of a similar stamp, its rivals, his enchanted customers fairly hanging on his lips, subdued to their authoritative sentence. So have I seen a gentleman in comedy acting the shopman, so loveless sold his gloves in King Street. I admired the histrionic art by which he contrived to carry clean away every notion of disgrace from the occupation he had so generously submitted to, and from that hour I judged him, with no after-repentance, to be a person with whom it would be a felicity to be more acquainted. To descant upon his merits as a comedian would be superfluous. With his blended private and professional habits alone I have to do. That harmonious fusion of the manners of the player into those of everyday life, which brought the stage boards into streets and dining parlours, and kept up the play when the play was ended. I like Wrench, a friend was saying to him one day, because he is the same natural easy creature on the stage that he is off. My case exactly, retorted Elliston, with a charming forgetfulness that the converse of a proposition does not always lead to the same conclusion. I am the same person off the stage that I am on. The inference at first sight seems identical, but examine it a little, and it confesses only that the one performer was never, and the other always, acting. And, in truth, this was the charm of Elliston's private deportment. You had a spirited performance always going on before your eyes, with nothing to pay, as where a monarch takes up his casual abode for a night, the poorest hovel which he honours by his sleeping in it becomes ipso facto for that time a palace. So wherever Elliston walked, sat, or stood still, there was the theatre. He carried about with him his pit, boxes, and galleries, and set up his portable playhouse at corners of streets and in the market-places. Upon flintiest pavements he trod the board still, and if his theme chanced to be passionate, the green baize carpet of tragedy spontaneously rose beneath his feet. Now this was hearty, and showed a love for his art. So Apollet's always painted in thought so g d always poetizes i hate a lukewarm artist i have known actors and some of them of elliston's own stamp who shall have agreeably been amusing you in the part of a rake or a coxcomb through the two or three hours of their dramatic existence but no sooner does the curtain fall with its leaden clatter but a spirit of lead seems to seize on all their faculties. They emerge sour, morose persons, intolerable to their families, servants, etc. Another shall have been expanding your heart with generous deeds and sentiments, till it even beats with yearnings of universal sympathy. You absolutely long to go home, and do some good action. The play seems tedious till you can get fairly out of the house and realise your laudable intentions. At length the final bell rings, and this cordial representative of all that is amiable in human breasts steps forth a miser. Elliston was more of a piece. Did he play, Ranger? 
and did ranger fill the general bosom of the town with satisfaction why should he not be ranger and diffuse the same cordial satisfaction among his private circles with his temperament his animal spirits his good nature his follies perchance could he do better than identify himself with his impersonation are we to like a pleasant rake or coxcomb on the stage and give ourselves airs of aversion for the identical character presented to us in actual life or what would the performer have gained by divesting himself of the impersonation could the man elliston have been essentially different from his part even if he had avoided to reflect to us studiously in private circles the airy briskness the forwardness and scapegoat trickeries of his prototype but there is something not natural in this everlasting acting we want the real man are you quite sure that it is not the man himself whom you cannot or will not see under some adventitious trappings which nevertheless sit not at all inconsistently upon him what if it is the nature of some men to be highly artificial the fault is least reprehensible in players Sibber was his own foppington with almost as much wit as vanborough could add to it my conceit of his person it is ben jonson speaking of lord bacon was never increased towards him by his place or honours but i have and do reverence him for the greatness that was only proper to himself in that he seemed to me ever one of the greatest men that had been in many ages in his adversity i ever prayed that heaven would give him strength for greatness he could not want the quality here commended was scarcely less conspicuous in the subject of these idle reminiscences than in my lord verulam those who have imagined that an unexpected elevation to the direction of a great london theatre affected the consequence of elliston or at all changed his nature knew not the essential greatness of the man whom they disparage it was my fortune to encounter him near st dunstan's church which with its punctual giants is now no more than dust and a shadow on the morning of his election to that high office grasping my hand with a look of significance he only uttered have you heard the news then with another look following up the blow he subjoined i am the future manager of drury lane theatre breathless as he saw me he stayed not for congratulation or reply but mutely stalked away leaving me to chew upon his new-blown dignities at leisure in fact nothing could be said to it expressive silence alone could muse his praise this was in his great style but was he less great be witness o ye powers of equanimity that supported in the ruins of carthage the consular exile and more recently transmuted for a more illustrious exile the barren constableship of elba into an image of imperial france when in melancholy after years again much near the same spot i met him when that sceptre had been wrested from his hand and his dominion was curtailed to the petty managership and part proprietorship of the small olympic 
his Elba. He still played nightly upon the boards of Drury, but in parts, alas, allotted to him, not magnificently distributed by him. Waving his great loss as nothing, and magnificently sinking the sense of fallen material grandeur in the more liberal resentment of depreciations done to his more lofty intellectual pretensions have you heard his customary exordium have you heard said he how they treat me they put me in comedy thought i but his finger on his lips forbade any verbal interruption where could they have put you better then after a pause where i formerly played romeo i now play mercutio and so again he stalked away neither staying nor caring for responses oh it was a rich scene but sir abraham cowley the best of story-tellers and surgeons who mends a lame narrative almost as well as he sets a fracture alone could do justice to it that i was witness to in the tarnished room that had once been green of that same little olympic there after his deposition from imperial drury he substituted a throne that olympic hill was his highest heaven himself jove in his chair there he sat in state while before him on complaint of prompter was brought for judgment how shall i describe her one of those little tawdry things that flirt at the tails of choruses a probationer for the town in either of its senses the pertest little drab a dirty fringe and appendage of the lamp's smoke who it seems on some disapprobation expressed by a highly respectable audience had precipitately quitted her station on the boards and withdrawn her small talents in disgust and how dare you said her manager assuming a censorial severity which would have crushed the confidence of a vestress and disarmed that beautiful rebel herself of her professional caprices i verily believe he thought her standing before him how dare you madam withdraw yourself without a notice from your theatrical duties i was hissed sir and you have the presumption to decide upon the taste of the town i don't know that sir but i will never stand to be hissed was the subjoinder of young confidence when gathering up his features into one significant mass of wonder pity and expostulatory indignation in a lesson never to have been lost upon a creature less forward than she who stood before him his words were these they have hissed me twas the identical argument a fortiori which the son of peleus uses to lycaon trembling under his lance to persuade him to take his destiny with a good grace i too am mortal and it is to be believed that in both cases the rhetoric missed of its application for want of a proper understanding with the faculties of the respective recipients quite an opera pit he said to me as he was courteously conducting me over the benches of his surrey theatre the last retreat and recess of his every-day waning grandeur those who knew elliston will know the manner in which he pronounced the latter sentence of the few words i am about to record one proud day to me 
he took his roast mutton with us in the temple, to which I had superadded a preliminary haddock. After a rather plentiful partaking of the meagre banquet, not unrefreshed with the humbler sort of liquors, I made a sort of apology for the humility of the fare, observing that for my own part I never ate but of one dish at dinner. I, too, never eat but one thing at dinner, was his reply. Then, after a pause, a reckoning fish as nothing. The manner was all. It was as if, by one peremptory sentence, he had decreed the annihilation of all the savoury esculents which the pleasant and nutritious food-giving ocean pours forth upon poor humans from her watery bosom. This was greatness, tempered with considerate tenderness to the feelings of his scanty but welcoming entertainer. Great wert thou in thy life, Robert William Elliston, and not lessened in thy death, if report speak truly, which says that thou didst direct that thy mortal remains should repose under no inscription but one of pure latinity. Classical was thy bringing up, and beautiful was the feeling on thy last bed, which, connecting the man with the boy, took thee back in thy latest exercise of imagination to the days when, undreaming of theatres and managerships, thou wert a scholar and an early ripe one, under the roofs builded by the munificent and pious Cole. For thee the Pauline muses weep, in elegies that shall silence this crude prose. Essay six of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Detached thoughts on books and reading. To mind the inside of a book is to entertain oneself with the forced product of another man's brain. Now, I think a man of quality and breeding may be much amused with the natural sprouts of his own. Lord Foppington in The Relapse an ingenious acquaintance of my own was so much struck with this bright sally of his lordship that he has left off reading altogether to the great improvement of his originality at the hazard of losing some credit on this head i must confess that i dedicate no inconsiderable portion of my time to other people's thoughts I dream away my life in other speculations. I love to lose myself in other men's minds. When I am not walking, I am reading. I cannot sit and think. Books think for me. I have no repugnances. Shaftesbury is not too genteel for me, nor Jonathan Wilde too low. I can read anything which I call a book. There are things in that shape which I cannot allow for such. In this catalogue of books which are no books, Biblia a Biblia, I reckon court calendars, directories, pocket-books, draught-boards, 
bound and lettered at the back, scientific treatises, almanacs, statutes at large, the works of Hume, Gibbon, Robertson, Beattie, Soame Jennings, and uh, generally all those volumes which no gentleman's library should be without the histories of flavius josephus that learned jew and paley's moral philosophy with these exceptions i can read almost anything i bless my stars for a taste so catholic so unexcluding i confess that it moves my spleen to see these things in books clothing perched upon shelves like false saints usurpers of true shrines intruders into the sanctuary thrusting out the legitimate occupants to reach down a well-bound semblance of a volume and hope it is some kind-hearted playbook then opening what seem its leaves to come bolt upon a withering population essay to expect a steel or a farqua and find adam smith to view a well-arranged assortment of block-headed encyclopedias anglicanas or metropolitanas set out in an array of russia or morocco when a tithe of that good leather would comfortably reclothe my shivering folios would renovate paracelsus himself and enable old raymond lully to look like himself again in the world i never see these impostors but i long to strip them to warm my ragged veterans in their spoils to be strong-backed and neat-bound is the desideratum of a volume magnificence comes after this when it can be afforded is not to be lavished upon all kinds of books indiscriminately i would not dress a set of magazines for instance in full suit the deshabille or half-binding with russia backs ever is our costume a shakespeare or a milton unless the first editions it were mere foppery to trick out in gay apparel the possession of them confers no distinction the exterior of them the things themselves being so common strange to say raises no sweet emotions no tickling sense of property in the owner thompson's seasons again looks best i maintain it a little torn and dog's eared how beautiful to a genuine lover of reading are the solid leaves and worn-out appearance nay the very odour beyond russia if we would not forget kind feelings in fastidiousness of an old circulating library tom jones or vicar of wakefield how they speak of the thousand thumbs that have turned over their pages with delight of the lone sumstress whom they may have cheered milliner or harder-working mantua-maker after her long day's needle toil running far into midnight when she has snatched an hour ill spared from sleep to steep her cares as in some lethean cup in spelling out their enchanting contents who would have them a whit less soiled what better condition could we desire to see them in in some respects the better a book is the less it demands from binding fielding smollett stern and all that class of 
perpetually self-reproductive volumes, great nature's stereotypes, we see them individually perish with less regret, because we know the copies of them to be etern. But where a book is at once both good and rare, where the individual is almost the species, and when that perishes, we know not where is that Promethean torch that can its light relumine. Such a book, for instance, as the life of the Duke of Newcastle by his Duchess. No casket is rich enough, no casing sufficiently durable, to honour and keep safe such a jewel. Not only rare volumes of this description, which seem hopeless ever to be reprinted, but old editions of writers such as Sir Philip Sidney, Bishop Taylor, Milton in his prose works, Fuller, of whom we have reprints, yet the books themselves, though they go about, and are talked of here and there, we know, have not endenizened themselves, nor possibly ever will, in the national heart, so as to become stock books. It is good to possess these endurable and costly covers. I do not care for a first folio of Shakespeare. I rather prefer the common editions of Rowe and Tonson, without notes, and with plates, which being so execrably bad, serve as maps, or modest remembrances to the text, and without pretending to any supposable emulation with it, are so much better than the Shakespeare gallery engravings which did. I have a community of feeling with my countrymen about his plays, and I like those editions of him best, which have been oftenest tumbled about and handled. On the contrary, I cannot read Beaumont and Fletcher, but in folio. The octavo editions are painful to look at. I have no sympathy with them. If they were as much read as the current editions of the other poet, I should prefer them in that shape to the older one. I do not know a more heartless sight than the reprint of the anatomy of melancholy. What need was there of unearthing the bones of that fantastic old great man to expose them in a winding-sheet of the newest fashion to modern censure? What hapless stationer could dream of Burton ever becoming popular. The wretched Malone could not do worse when he bribed the sexton of Stratford Church to let him whitewash the painted effigy of old Shakespeare, which stood there in rude but lively fashion, depicted to the very colour of the cheek, the eye, the eyebrow, hair, the very dress he used to wear, the only authentic testimony we had, however imperfect, of these curious parts and parcels of him. They covered him over with a coat of white paint. By God, if I had been a justice of peace for Warwickshire, I would have clapped both commentator and sexton fast in the stocks for a pair of meddling sacrilegious varlets. I think I see them at their work, these sapient troubled tombs. Shall I be thought fantastical if I confess that the names of some of our poets sound sweeter and have a finer relish to the ear, to mine at least, than that of Milton or of Shakespeare? It may be that the latter are more staled and rung upon in common discourse are the sweetest names, and which carry a perfume in the mention, are Kit Marlowe, Drayton, Drummond of Hawthornden, and Cowley. Much depends upon when and where you read a book. 
in the five or six impatient minutes before the dinner is quite ready, who would think of taking up the fairy queen for a stopgap, or a volume of Bishop Andrew's sermons? Milton almost requires a solemn service of music to be played before you enter upon him, but he brings his music, to which who listens had need bring docile thoughts and purged ears. Winter evenings, the world shut out, with less of ceremony, the gentle Shakespeare enters. At such a season, the tempest, or his own winter's tale. These two poets you cannot avoid reading aloud to yourself, or, as it chances, to some single person listening, more than one, and it degenerates into an audience. Books of quick interest, that hurry on for incidents, are for the eye to glide over only. It will not do to read them out. I could never listen to even the better kind of modern novels without extreme irksomeness. A newspaper read out is intolerable. In some of the bank offices it is the custom uh, to save so much individual time for one of the clerks who is the best scholar to commence upon the Times or the Chronicle and recite its entire contents aloud, pro bono publico with every advantage of lungs and elocution the effect is singularly vapid in barber shops and public houses a fellow will get up and spell out a paragraph which he communicates as some discovery another follows with his selection so the entire journal transpires at length by piecemeal Seldom readers are slow readers, and without this expedient, no one in the company would probably ever travel through the contents of a whole paper. Newspapers always excite curiosity. No one ever lays one down without a feeling of disappointment. What an eternal time! that gentleman in black at nando's keeps the paper i am sick of hearing the waiter bawling out incessantly the chronicle is in hand sir coming in to an inn at night having ordered your supper what can be more delightful than to find lying in the window-seat left there time out of mind by the carelessness of some former guest, two or three numbers of the old town and country magazine, with its amusing tete-a-tete -tete pictures, the royal lover and Lady Glendower, the melting platonic and the old bow, and such like antiquated scandal. Would you exchange it at that time and in that place? for a better book. Poor Tobin, who latterly fell blind, did not regret it so much for the weightier kinds of reading, the Paradise Lost or Comus he could have read to him, but he missed the pleasure of skimming over with his own eye a magazine or a light pamphlet. I should not care to be caught in the serious avenues of some cathedral alone, and reading Candide. I do not remember a more whimsical surprise than having been once detected by a familiar damsel, reclined at my ease upon the grass on Primrose Hill, her Cythero, reading Pamela. There was nothing in the book to make a man seriously ashamed of the exposure, but as she seated herself down by me, and seemed determined to read in company, I could have wished it had been any other book. 
we read on very sociably for a few pages, and not finding the author much to her taste, she got up and went away. Gentle casuist, I leave it to thee to conjecture whether the blush, for there was one between us, was the property of the nymph or the swain in this dilemma. From me you shall never get the secret. I am not much a friend to out-of-doors reading. I cannot settle my spirits to it. I knew a Unitarian minister who was generally to be seen upon Snow Hill, as yet Skinner Street was not, between the hours of ten and eleven in the morning, studying a volume of Lardner. I own this to have been a strain of abstraction beyond my reach. I used to admire how he sidled along, keeping clear of secular contact an illiterate encounter with a porter's knot or a bread-basket would have quickly put to flight all the theology I am master of, and have left me worse than indifferent to the five points. There is a class of street-readers whom I can never contemplate without affection, the poor gentry, who not having wherewithal to buy or hire a book, filch a little learning at the open stalls, the owner, with his hard eye, casting envious looks at them all the while, and thinking when they will have done, venturing tenderly page after page, expecting every moment when he shall interpose his interdict, and yet unable to deny themselves the gratification they snatch a fearful joy. Martin Beaumont, in this way, by daily fragments, got through two volumes of Clarissa, when the storekeeper damped his laudable ambition by asking him, it was in his younger days, whether he meant to purchase the work. M. declares that under no circumstances of his life did he ever peruse a book with half the satisfaction which he took in those uneasy snatches. A quaint poetess of our day has moralised upon this subject in two very touching but homely stanzas. I saw a boy with eager eye open a book upon a stall, and read as he'd devour it all, which when the stallman did espy, soon to the boy I heard him call, You, sir, you never buy a book, therefore in one you shall not look. The boy passed slowly on, and with a sigh, he wished he never had been taught to read, then of the old child's books he should have had no need. Of sufferings the poor have many, which never can the rich annoy. I soon perceived another boy, who looked as if he'd not had any food for that day at least enjoy the sight of cold meat in a tavern larder. This boy's case then thought I, is surely harder, thus hungry, longing, thus without a penny, beholding choice of dainty dressed meat, no wonder if he Essay 7 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Old Margate Hoy. I am fond of passing my vacations, I believe I have said so before, 
at one or other of the universities. Next to these my choice would fix me at some woody spot, such as the neighbourhood of Henley affords in abundance, upon the banks of my beloved Thames. But somehow or other my cousin contrives to wheedle me once in three or four seasons to a watering-place. Old attachments cling to her in spite of experience. We have been dull at Worthing one summer, duller at Brighton another, dullest at Eastbourne a third, and are at this moment doing dreary penance at Hastings, and all because we were happy many years ago for a brief week at Margate. That was our first seaside experiment, and many circumstances combined to make it the most agreeable holiday of my life. We had neither of us seen the sea, and we had never been from home so long together in company. Can I forget thee, thou old Margate Hoy, with thy weather-beaten sunburnt captain, and his rough accommodations, ill-exchanged for the foppery and fresh-water niceness of the modern steam-packet, to the winds and waves thou committest thy goodly freightage, and didst ask no aid of magic fumes and spells and boiling cauldrons. With the gales of heaven thou wentest swimmingly, or, when it was their pleasure, stoodest still with sailor-like patience. Thy course was natural, not forced, as in a hot-bed, nor didst thou go poisoning the breath of ocean with sulphurous smoke, a great sea chimera, chimneying and furnacing the deep, or liker to that fire-god parching up Scamander. Can I forget thy honest yet slender crew, with their coy reluctant responses, yet to the suppression of anything like contempt to the raw questions which we of the great city would be ever and anon putting to them as to the uses of this or that strange naval implement. Specially can I forget thee, thou happy medium, thou shade of refuge between us and them, conciliating interpreter of their skill to our simplicity, comfortable ambassador between sea and land, whose sailor trousers did not more convincingly assure thee to be an adopted denizen of the former than thy white cap and whiter apron over them, with thy neat-fingered practice in thy culinary vocation, bespoke thee to have been of inland nurture heretofore, a master-cook of East Cheap? How busily didst thou ply thy multifarious occupation, cook, mariner, attendant, chamberlain, here, there, like another aerial, flaming at once about all parts of the deck, yet with kindlier ministrations, not to assist the tempest, but as if touched with a kindred sense of our infirmities, to soothe the qualms which that untried motion might haply raise in our crude land fancies. And when the o'er-washing billows drove us below deck, for it was far gone in October, and we had stiff and blowing weather, how did thy officious ministerings, still catering for our comfort, with cards and cordials, and thy more cordial conversation, alleviate the closeness and the confinement of thy else, truth to say, not very savoury 
nor very inviting little cabin. With these aditaments to boot, we had on board a fellow passenger, whose discourse in verity might have beguiled a longer voyage than we meditated, and have made mirth and wonder abound as far as the Azores. He was a dark, Spanish-complexioned young man, remarkably handsome, with an officer-like assurance, and an insuppressible volubility of assertion. He was, in fact, the greatest liar I had met with then or since. He was none of your hesitating half-story-tellers, a most painful description of mortals, who go on sounding your belief, and only giving you as much as they see you can swallow at a time, the nibbling pickpockets of your patience, but one who committed downright daylight depredations upon his neighbour's faith. He did not stand shivering upon the brink, but was a hearty, thorough-paced liar, and plunged at once into the depths of your credulity. I partly believe he made pretty sure of his company. Not many rich, not many wise or learned, composed at that time the common stowage of a Margate packet. We were, I am afraid, a set of as unseasoned Londoners, let our enemies give it a worse name, as Aldermanbury or Watling Street at that time of day could have supplied. There might be an exception or two among us, but I scorn to make any invidious distinctions among such a jolly, companionable ship's company as those were whom I sailed with. Something, too, must be conceded to the genius loci. Had the confident fellow told us half the legends on land, which he favoured us with on the other element, I flatter myself the good sense of most of us would have revolted. But we were in a new world, with everything unfamiliar about us, and the time and place disposed us to the reception of any prodigious marvel whatsoever. Time has obliterated from my memory much of his wild fablings, and the rest would appear but dull as written, and to be read on shore. He had been aide-de-camp, among other rare accidents and fortunes, to a Persian prince, and at one blow had stricken off the head of the king of Caramania on horseback. He, of course, married the prince's daughter, I forget what unlucky turn in the politics of that court, combining with the loss of his consort, was the reason of his quitting Persia, but with the rapidity of a magician he transported himself, along with his hearers, back to England, where we still found him in the confidence of great ladies. There was some story of a princess, Elizabeth, if I remember, having entrusted to his care an extraordinary casket of jewels upon some extraordinary occasion, but, as I am not certain of the name or circumstance at this distance of time, I must leave it to the royal daughters of England to settle the honour among themselves in private. I cannot call to mind half his pleasant wonders, but I perfectly remember that in the course of his travels he had seen a phoenix, and he obligingly undeceived us of the vulgar error that there is but one of that species at a time, assuring us that they were not uncommon in some parts of Upper Egypt. Hitherto he had found the most implicit listeners. His dreaming fancies had transported us beyond the ignorant present, but when, still hardying more and more in his triumphs over our simplicity, he went on to affirm 
that he had actually sailed through the legs of the Colossus at Rhodes, it really became necessary to make a stand, and here I must do justice to the good sense and intrepidity of one of our party, a youth, that had hitherto been one of his most deferential auditors, who, from his recent reading, made bold to assure the gentleman that there must be some mistake, as the Colossus in question had been destroyed long since, to whose opinion, delivered with all modesty, our hero was obliging enough to concede thus much, that the figure was indeed a little damaged. This was the only opposition he met with, and it did not at all seem to stagger him, for he proceeded with his fables, which the same youth appeared to swallow with still more complacency than ever, confirmed, as it were, by the extreme candour of that concession. With these prodigies he wheedled us on till we came in sight of the Recovers, which one of our own company, having been the voyage before, immediately recognising and pointing out to us, was considered by us as no ordinary seaman. All this time sat upon the edge of the deck quite a different character. It was a lad, apparently very poor, very infirm, and very patient. His eye was ever on the sea with a smile, and if he caught now and then some snatches of these wild legends, it was by accident and they seemed not to concern him. The waves to him whispered more pleasant stories. He was as one being with us, but not of us. He heard the bell of dinner ring without stirring, and when some of us pulled out our private stores, our cold meat and our salads, he produced none, and seemed to want none. Only a solitary biscuit he had laid in, provision for the one or two days and nights to which these vessels then were oftentimes obliged to prolong their voyage. Upon a nearer acquaintance with him, which he seemed neither to court nor decline, we learned that he was going to Margate, with the hope of being admitted into the infirmary there for sea-bathing. His disease was a scrofula, which appeared to have eaten all over him. He expressed great hopes of a cure, and when we asked him whether he had any friends where he was going, he replied, he had no friends. These pleasant and some mournful passages, with the first sight of the sea, cooperating with youth, and a sense of holidays and out-of-door adventure, to me that had been pent up in populous cities for many months before, have left upon my mind the fragrance as of summer days gone by, bequeathing nothing but their remembrance for cold and wintry hours to chew upon. Will it be thought a digression, it may spare some unwelcome comparisons, if I endeavour to account for the dissatisfaction which I have heard so many persons confess to have felt, as I did myself feel in part on this occasion, at the sight of the sea for the first time. I think the reason usually given, referring to the incapacity of actual objects for satisfying our preconceptions of them, scarcely goes deep enough into the question. Let the same person see a lion, an elephant, a mountain, for the first time in his life, and he shall perhaps feel himself a little mortified, the things do not fill up that space which the idea of them 
seem to take up in his mind, but they have still a correspondency to his first notion, and in time grow up to it, so as to produce a very similar impression, enlarging themselves, if I may say so, upon familiarity. But the sea remains a disappointment. Is it not that, in the latter, we had expected to behold, absurdly, I grant, but I am afraid, by the law of imagination, unavoidably, not a definite object, as those wild beasts, or that mountain, compassable by the eye, but all the sea at once, the commensurate antagonist of the earth. I do not say we tell ourselves so much, but the craving of the mind is to be satisfied with nothing less. I will suppose the case of a young person of fifteen, as I then was, knowing nothing of the sea but from description. He comes to it for the first time, all that he has been reading of it all his life, and that the most enthusiastic part of life, all he has gathered from narratives of wandering seamen, what he has gained from true voyages, and what he cherishes as credulously from romance and poetry, crowding their images, and exacting strange tributes from expectation. He thinks of the great deep, and of those who go down unto it, of its thousand isles, and of the vast continents it washes, of its receiving the mighty Plata, or Orellana, into its bosom, without disturbance, or sense of augmentation, of Biscay swells, and the mariner, for many a day and many a dreadful night, incessant labouring round the stormy cape, of fatal rocks, and the still vexed Bermudes, of great whirlpools, and the water-spout, of sunken ships, and sumless treasures, swallowed up in the unrestoring depths, of fishes, and quaint monsters, to which all that is terrible on earth, be but as bugs to frighten babes with all, compared with the creatures in the sea's entrall, of naked savages and Juan Fernandez, of pearls and shells, of coral beds and of enchanted isles, of mermaids' grots. I do not assert that in sober earnest he expects to be shown all these wonders at once, but he is under the tyranny of a mighty faculty, which haunts him with confused hints and shadows of all these, and when the actual object opens first upon him, seen in tame weather too most likely, from our unromantic coasts, a speck, a slip of sea-water as it shows to him, what can it prove but a very unsatisfying and even diminutive entertainment, or if he has come to it from the mouth of a river, was it much more than the river widening, and even out of sight of land, what had he but a flat watery horizon about him, nothing comparable to the vast or curtaining sky, his familiar object, seen daily without dread or amazement, who, in similar circumstances, has not been tempted to exclaim with Charobe in the poem of Gebir, Is this the mighty ocean? Is this all? I love town or country, but this detestable sank port is neither. I hate these scrubbed shoots, thrusting out their starved foliage from between the horrid fissures of dusty, innutrious rocks, which the amateur calls verdure to the edge of the sea. I require woods, and they show me stunted coppices. I cry out for the water-brooks, and pant for fresh streams 
and inland murmurs i cannot stand all day on the naked beach watching the capricious hues of the sea shifting like the colours of a dying mullet i am tired of looking out at the windows of this island prison i would fain retire into the interior of my cage while i gaze upon the sea i want to be on it over it across it it binds me in with chains as of iron my thoughts are abroad i should not so feel in staffordshire there is no home for me here there is no sense of home at hastings it is a place of fugitive resort an heterogeneous assemblage of sea-mews and stockbrokers amphitrites of the town and misses that coquette with the ocean if it were what it was in its primitive shape and what it ought to have remained a fair honest fishing town and no more it was something with a few straggling fishermen's huts scattered about artless as its cliffs and with their materials filched from them it was something i could abide to dwell with meshech to assort with fisher swains and smugglers there are or i dream there are many of this latter occupation here their faces become the place i like a smuggler he is the only honest thief he robs nothing but the revenue an abstraction i never greatly cared about i could go out with them in their mackerel boats or about their less ostensible business with some satisfaction i can even tolerate those poor victims to monotony who from day to day pass along the beach in endless progress and recurrence to watch their illicit countrymen townsfolk or brethren perchance whistling to the sheathing and unsheathing of their cutlasses their only solace who under the mild name of preventive service keep up a legitimated civil warfare in the deplorable absence of a foreign one to show their detestation of rum hollands and zeal for old england but it is the visitants from town that come here to say that they have been here with no more relish of the sea than a pond perch or a dace might be supposed to have that are my aversion i feel like a foolish dace in these regions and have as little toleration for myself here as for them what can they want here if they had a true relish of the ocean why have they brought all this land luggage with them or why pitch their civilised tents in the desert what mean these scanty book-rooms marine libraries as they entitle them if the sea were as they would have us believe a book to read strange matter in what are their foolish concert-rooms if they come as they would fain be thought to do to listen to the music of the waves all is false and hollow pretension they come because it is the fashion and to spoil the nature of the place they are mostly as i have said stockbrokers but i have watched the better sort of them now and then an honest citizen of the old stamp in the simplicity of his heart shall bring down his wife and daughters to taste the sea breezes i always know the date of their arrival it is easy to see it in their countenance a day or two they go wandering on the shingles picking up cockle shells and thinking them great things but in a poor week imagination slackens they begin to discover that cockles produce no pearls and then oh then if i could interpret for the pretty creatures i know they have not the courage to confess it themselves how gladly would they exchange their seaside rambles for a sunday walk on the green sward of their accustomed twickenham meadows
I would ask of one of these sea-charmed emigrants, who think they truly love the sea, with its wild usages, what would their feelings be, if some of the unsophisticated aborigines of this place, encouraged by their courteous questionings here, should venture, on the faith of such assured sympathy between them, to return the visit, and come up to see London. I must imagine them with their fishing-tackle on their back, as we carry our town necessaries. What a sensation would it cause in Lothbury! What vehement laughter would it not excite among the daughters of Cheapside and wives of Lombard Street! I am sure that no town-bred or inland-born subjects can feel their true and natural nourishment at these sea-places. Nature, when she does not mean us for mariners and vagabonds, bids us stay at home. The salt foam seems to nourish a spleen. I am not half so good-natured as by the milder waters of my natural river. I would exchange these sea-gulls for swans, Essay eight of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The recording by Tony Addison. The Convalescent. A pretty severe fit of indisposition, which under the name of a nervous fever, has made a prisoner of me for some weeks past and is but slowly leaving me, has reduced me to an incapacity of reflecting upon any topic foreign to itself. Expect no healthy conclusions from me this month, reader. I can offer you only sick men's dreams. And, truly, the whole state of sickness is such for what else is it but a magnificent dream for a man to lie abed and draw daylight curtains about him, and shutting out the sun to induce a total oblivion of all the works which are going on under it, to become insensible to all the operations of life except the beatings of one feeble pulse. If there be a regal solitude, it is a sick-bed. How the patient lords it there! What caprices he acts without control! How king-like he sways his pillow, tumbling and tossing and shifting and lowering and thumping and flatting and moulding it to the ever-varying requisitions of his throbbing temples. He changes sides oftener than a politician. Now he lies full length, then half length, obliquely, transversely, head and feet quite across the bed, and none accuses him of tergiversation. Within the four curtains he is absolute. They are his mare clausum. How sickness enlarges the dimensions of a man's self to himself! He is his own exclusive object. Supreme selfishness is inculcated upon him as his only duty. Tis the two tables of the law to him. He has nothing to think of but how to get well. What passes out of doors or within them, so he hear not the jarring of them, affects him not. 
A little while ago he was greatly concerned in the event of a lawsuit, which was to be the making or the marring of his dearest friend. He was to be seen trudging about upon this man's errand to fifty quarters of the town at once, jogging this witness, refreshing that solicitor. The cause was to come on yesterday. He is absolutely as indifferent to the decision as if it were a question to be tried at Pekin. A peradventure from some whispering going on about the house, not intended for his hearing, he picks up enough to make him understand that things went cross-grained in the court yesterday, and his friend is ruined. But the word friend and the word ruin disturb him no more than so much jargon. He is not to think of anything but how to get better. What a world of foreign cares are merged in that absorbing consideration. He has put on the strong armour of sickness. He is wrapped in the callous hide of suffering. He keeps his sympathy like some curious vintage under trusty lock and key for his own use only. He lies pitying himself, honing and moaning to himself. He yearneth over himself. His bowels are even melted within him to think what he suffers. He is not ashamed to weep over himself. He is for ever plotting how to do some good to himself, studying little stratagems and artificial alleviations. He makes the most of himself, dividing himself by an allowable fiction into as many distinct individuals as he hath sore and sorrowing members. Sometimes he meditates, as of a thing apart from him, upon his poor aching head, and that dull pain which, dozing or waking, lay in it all the past night like a log, or palpable substance of pain, not to be removed without opening the very skull, as it seemed, to take it thence. Or he pities his long, clammy, attenuated fingers. He compassionates himself all over, and his bed is a very discipline of humanity and tender heart. He is his own sympathizer, and instinctively feels that none can so well perform that office for him. He cares for few spectators to his tragedy. Only that punctual face of the old nurse pleases him, that announces his broths and his cordials. He likes it because it is so unmoved, and because he can pour forth his feverish ejaculations before it as unreservedly as to his bedpost. To the world's business he is dead. He understands not what the callings and occupations of mortals are. Only he has a glimmering conceit of some such thing when the doctor makes his daily call, and even in the lines of that busy face he reads no multiplicity of patients but solely conceives of himself as the sick man. To what other uneasy couch the good man is hastening when he slips out of his chamber, folding up his thin douceur so carefully for fear of rustling, is no speculation which he can at present entertain. He thinks only of the regular return of the same phenomenon 
at the same hour to-morrow. Household rumours touch him not. Some faint murmur, indicative of life going on within the house, soothes him, while he knows not distinctly what it is. He is not to know anything, not to think of anything. Servants, gliding up or down the distant staircase, treading as upon velvet, gently keep his ear awake, so long as he troubles not himself further than with some feeble guess at their errands. Exacter knowledge would be a burthen to him. He can just endure the pressure of conjecture. He opens his eye faintly at the dull stroke of the muffled knocker, and closes it again without asking who was it? He is flattered by a general notion that inquiries are making after him, but he cares not to know the name of the inquirer. In the general stillness and awful hush of the house, he lies in state and feels his sovereignty. To be sick is to enjoy monarchal prerogatives. Compare the silent tread and quiet ministry, almost by the eye only, with which he is served, with the careless demeanour, the unceremonious goings in and out, slapping of doors or leaving them open, of the very same attendance when he is getting a little better. And you will confess that from the bed of sickness thrown, let me rather call it, to the elbow-chair of convalescence is a fall from dignity amounting to a deposition. How convalescence shrinks a man back to his pristine stature! Where is now the space which he occupied so lately in his own in the family's eye. The scene of his regalities, his sick-room, which was his presence-chamber, where he lay and acted his despotic fancies, how is it reduced to a common bedroom? The trimness of the very bed has something petty and unmeaning about it. It is made every day. How unlike to that wavy, many furrowed oceanic surface which it presented so short a time since when to make it was a service not to be thought of at oftener than three or four day revolutions when the patient was with pain and grief to be lifted for a little while out of it to submit to the encroachments of unwelcome neatness and decencies which his shaken frame deprecated, then to be lifted into it again for another three or four days' respite, to flounder it out of shape again, while every fresh furrow was a historical record of some shifting posture, some uneasy turning, some seeking for a little ease, and the shrunken skin scarce told a truer story than the crumpled coverlid. Hushed are those mysterious sighs, those groans, so much more awful, while we knew not from what caverns of vast hidden suffering they proceeded. The Lernian pangs are quenched, the riddle of sickness is solved, and Philoctetes is become an ordinary personage. Perhaps some relic of the sick man's dream of greatness survives in the still lingering visitations of the medical attendant. But how is he too changed with everything else? Can this be he, this man of news, of chat, 
of anecdote, of everything but physic, can this be he, who so lately came between the patient and his cruel enemy, as on some solemn embassy from nature, erecting herself into a high mediating party, pshaw to some old woman. Farewell with him, all that made sickness pompous, the spell that hushed the household, the desert-like stillness, felt throughout its inmost chambers, the mute attendance, the inquiry by looks, the still softer delicacies of self-attention, the sole and single eye of distemper, alonely fixed upon itself, world thoughts excluded, the man a world unto himself, his own theatre. What a speck is he dwindled into! In this flat swamp of convalescence, left by the ebb of sickness, yet far enough from the terra firma of established health, your note, dear editor, reached me, requesting an article. In articulo mortis, thought I, but it is something hard, and the quibble, wretched as it was, relieved me. The summons, unseasonable as it appeared, seemed to link me on again to the petty businesses of life, which I had lost sight of, a gentle call to activity, however trivial, a wholesome weaning from that preposterous dream of self-absorption, the puffy state of sickness, in which I confess to have lain so long insensible to the magazines and monarchies of the world alike to its laws and to its literature. The hypochondriac flatus is subsiding. The acres which in imagination I had spread over for the sick man swells in the sole contemplation of his single sufferings till he becomes a titius to himself, a wasting to a span, and for the giant of self-importance which I was so lately, you have me once again in my natural pretensions, the lean and meagre figure. Essay 9 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Sanity of True Genius. So far from the position holding true that great wit or genius in our modern way of speaking has a necessary alliance with insanity. The greatest wits, on the contrary, will ever be found to be the sanest writers. It is impossible for the mind to conceive of a mad Shakespeare. The greatness of wit, by which the poetic talent is here chiefly to be understood, manifests itself in the admirable balance of all the faculties. Madness is the disproportionate straining or excess of any one of them. So strong a wit, says Cowley, speaking of a poetical friend, did nature to him frame, as all things but his judgment overcame. His judgment, like the heavenly moon, did show, tempering that mighty sea below. The ground of the mistake is that men, finding in the raptures of the higher poetry a condition of exaltation 
to which they have no parallel in their own experience, besides the spurious resemblance of it in dreams and fevers, impute a state of dreaminess and fever to the poet. But the true poet dreams being awake, he is not possessed by his subject, but has dominion over it. In the groves of Eden he walks familiar as in his native paths. He ascends the Empyrean heaven and is not intoxicated. He treads the burning marl without dismay. He wins his flight without self-loss, through realms of chaos and old night. Or if, abandoning himself to that severer chaos of a human mind untuned, he is content a while to be mad with Lear, or to hate mankind, a sort of madness, with Timon. Neither is that madness nor this misanthropy so unchecked, but that, never letting the reins of reason wholly go, while most he seems to do so, he has his better genius still whispering at his ear, with the good servant Kent suggesting saner counsels, or with the honest steward Flavius, recommending kindlier resolutions. Where he seems most to recede from humanity, he will be found the truest to it. From beyond the scope of nature, if he summon possible existences, he subjugates them to the law of her consistency. He is beautifully loyal to that sovereign directress, even when he appears most to betray and desert her. His ideal tribes submit to policy. His very monsters are tamed to his hand, even as that wild sea-brood shepherded by Proteus. He tames, and he clothes them with attributes of flesh and blood, till they wonder at themselves, like Indian islanders, forced to submit to European vesture. Caliban, the witches, are as true to the laws of their own nature, ours with a difference, as Othello, Hamlet, and Macbeth. Herein the great and the little wits are differenced, that if the latter wander ever so little from nature or actual existence, they lose themselves and their readers. Their phantoms are lawless, their visions nightmares. They do not create, which implies shaping and consistency. Their imaginations are not active, for to be active is to call something into act and form, but passive, as men in sick dreams. For the supernatural, or something superadded to what we know of nature, they give you the plainly non-natural. And if this were all, and that these mental hallucinations were discoverable only in the treatment of subjects out of nature, or transcending it, the judgment might, with some plea, be pardoned if it ran riot, and a little wantonized. But even in the describing of real and everyday life, that which is before their eyes, one of these lesser wits shall more deviate from nature, show more of that inconsequence which has a natural alliance with frenzy, than a great genius in his maddest fits 
as withers somewhere calls them. We appeal to any one that is acquainted with the common run of Lane's novels, as they existed some twenty or thirty years back, those scanty intellectual viands of the whole female reading public, till a happier genius arose, and expelled for ever the innutritious phantoms, whether he has not found his brain more betossed, his memory more puzzled, his sense of when and where more confounded among the improbable events, the incoherent incidents, the inconsistent characters, or no characters, of some third-rate love intrigue, where the person shall be a Lord Glendamore and a Miss Rivers, and the scene only alternate between Bath and Bond Street, a more bewildering dreaminess induced upon him than he has felt wandering over all the fairy grounds of Spencer. In the productions we refer to, nothing but names and places is familiar. The persons are neither of this world nor of any other conceivable one. An endless string of activities without purpose, of purposes destitute of motive. We meet phantoms in our known walks, phantasks only christened. In the poet we have names which announce fiction, and we have absolutely no place at all for the things and persons of the fairy queen prate not of their whereabout, but in their inner nature and the law of their speech and actions we are at home and upon acquainted ground. The one turns life into a dream, the other to the wildest dreams gives the sobrieties of everyday occurrences. By what subtle art of tracing the mental processes it is affected, we are not philosophers enough to explain. But in that wonderful episode of the Cave of Mammon, in which the money-god appears first in the lowest form of a miser, is then a worker of metals, and becomes the god of all the treasures of the world, and has a daughter, Ambition, before whom all the world kneels for favours. With the Hesperian fruit, the waters of Tantalus, with Pilate washing his hands vainly but not impertinently in the same stream. That we should be at one moment in the cave of an old hoarder of treasures, at the next at the forge of the Cyclops, in a palace and yet in hell, all at once, with the shifting mutations of the most rambling dream, and our judgment yet all the time awake, and neither able nor willing to detect the fallacy, is a proof of that hidden sanity which still guides the poet in his widest seeming aberrations. It is not enough to say that the whole episode is a copy of the mind's conceptions in sleep. It is in some sort. But what a copy! Let the most romantic of us that has been entertained all night with the spectacle of some wild, and magnificent vision. Recombine it in the morning, and try it by his waking judgment. That which appeared so shifting, and yet so coherent, while that faculty was passive, when it comes under cool examination, shall appear so reasonless and so unlinked, that we are ashamed to have been so deluded 
and to have taken, though but in sleep, a monster for a god. But the transitions in this episode are every whit as violent as in the most extravagant dream. Essay 10 Of the Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison Captain Jackson Among the deaths in our obituary for this month, I observe with concern at his cottage on the Bath Road, Captain Jackson. The name and attribution are common enough, but a feeling like reproach persuades me that this could have been no other in fact than my dear old friend, who some five and twenty years ago rented a tenement which he was pleased to dignify with the appellation here used, about a mile from Westbourne Green. Alack, how good men and the good turns they do us slide out of memory, and are recalled but by the surprise of some such sad memento as that which now lies before us. He whom I mean was a retired half-pay officer with a wife and two grown-up daughters, whom he maintained with the port and notions of gentlewoman upon that slender professional allowance. Comely girls they were, too. And was I in danger of forgetting this man, his cheerful suppers, the noble tone of hospitality, when first you set your foot in the cottage, the anxious ministerings about you, where little or nothing, God knows, was to be ministered, Althea's horn in a poor platter, the power of self-enchantment by which, in his magnificent wishes to entertain you, he multiplied his means to bounties. You saw with your bodily eyes, indeed, or what seemed a bare scrag, cold savings from the foregone meal, remnant hardly sufficient to send a mendicant from the door contented. But in the copious will, the revelling imagination of your host, the mind, the mind, Master Shallow, whole beeves were spread before you, hecatombs, no end appeared to the profusion. It was the widow's crews, the lobes and fishes. Carving could not lessen, nor helping diminish it. The stamina were left, the elemental bone still flourished, divested of its accidents. Let us live while we can, methinks I hear the open-handed creature exclaim, while we have let us not want. Here is plenty left. Want for nothing. With many more such hospitable sayings, the spurs of appetite and old concomitants of smoking boards and feast-oppressed chargers. Then, sliding a slender ratio of single gluster upon his wife's plate or the daughter's, he would convey the remnant rind into his own, with a merry quirk of the nearer the bone, etc., and declaring that he universally preferred the outside. For we had our table distinctions, you are to know, and some of us, in a manner, sat above the salt. None but his guest or guests dreamed of tasting flesh luxuries at night. The fragments were vere 
hospilibus sacra. But of one thing or another there was always enough, and leavings. Only he would sometimes finish the remainder crust, to show that he wished no savings. Wine he had none, nor except on very rare occasions spirits. But the sensation of wine was there. Some thin kind of ale, I remember, British beverage, he would say. Push about, my boys, drink to your sweethearts, girls. At every meagre draught a toast must ensue, or a song. All the forms of good liquor were there, with none of the effects wanting. Shut your eyes, and you would swear a capacious bowl of punch was foaming in the centre, with beams of generous port or Madeira radiating to it from each of the table corners. You got flustered, without knowing whence, tipsy upon words, and reeled under the potency of his unperforming bacchanalian encouragements. We had our songs. Why, soldiers, why? And the British grenadiers, in which last we were all obliged to bear chorus. Both the daughters sang. Their proficiency was a knightly theme. The masters he had given them, the no expense which he spared to accomplish them in a science so necessary to young women. But then they could not sing without the instrument. Sacred and by me never to be violated secrets of poverty. Should I disclose your honest aims at grandeur, your makeshift efforts of magnificence? Sleep, sleep with all thy broken keys, if one of the bunch be extant, thrummed by a thousand ancestral thumbs, dear cracked spinet of dearer Louisa. Without mention of mine, be dumb, thou thin accompanier of her thinner warble. A veil be spread over the dear delighted face of the well-deluded father, who now, haply listening to cherubic notes, scarce feels sincerer pleasure than when she awakened thy time-shaken chords responsive to the twitterings of that slender image of a voice. We were not without our literary talk either. It did not extend far, but as far as it went it was good. It was bottomed well, had good grounds to go upon. In the cottage was a room which tradition authenticated to have been the same in which Glover, in his occasional retirements, had penned the greater part of his Leonidas. This circumstance was nightly quoted, though none of the present inmates that I could discover appeared ever to have met with the poem in question. But that was no matter. Glover had written there, and the anecdote was pressed into the account of the family importance. It diffused a learned air through the apartment, the little side casement of which, the poet's study window, opening upon a superb view as far as to the pretty spire of Harrow, over domains and patrimonial acres, not a rood nor a square yard whereof our host could call his own, he yet gave occasion to an immoderate expansion of vanity, shall I call it, in his bosom, as he showed them in a glowing summer evening. It was all his, he took it all in, and communicated rich portions of it to his guests. It was a part of his largesse, his hospitality. It was going over his grounds. He was lord for the time of showing them, and you the implicit lookers-up to his magnificence. 
He was a juggler, who threw mists before your eyes. You had no time to detect his fallacies. He would say, Hand me the silver sugar tongues, and before you could discover it was a single spoon, and that plated, he would disturb and captivate your imagination by a misnomer of the urn for a tea-kettle, or by calling a homely bench a sofa. Rich men direct you to their furniture, poor ones divert you from it. He neither did one nor the other, but by simply assuming that everything was handsome about him, you were positively at a demur what you did or did not see at the cottage. With nothing to live on, he seemed to live on everything. He had a stock of wealth in his mind, not that which is a properly termed content, for in truth he was not to be contained at all, but overflowed all bounds by the force of a magnificent self-delusion. Enthusiasm is catching, and even his wife, a sober native of North Britain, who generally saw things more as they were, was not proof against the continual collision of his credulity. Her daughters were rational and discreet young women, in the main, perhaps, not insensible to their true circumstances. I have seen them assume a thoughtful air at times. But such was the preponderating opulence of his fancy, that I am persuaded, not for any half-hour together, did they ever look their own prospects fairly in the face. There was no resisting the vortex of his temperament. His riotous imagination conjured up handsome settlements before their eyes, which kept them up in the eye of the world, too, and seem at last to have realised themselves, for they both have married since, I am told, more than respectably. It is long since, and my memory waxes dim on some subjects, or I should wish to convey some notion of the manner in which the pleasant creature described the circumstances of his own wedding-day. I faintly remember something of a chaise and four, in which he made his entry into Glasgow on that morning to fetch the bride home, or carry her thither, I forget which. It so completely made out the stanza of the old ballad. When we came down through Glasgow town, we were a comely sight to see. My love was clad in black velvet, and I myself in cramassy. I suppose it was the only occasion upon which his own actual splendour at all corresponded with the world's notions on that subject. In homely cart or travelling caravan, by whatever humble vehicle they chanced to be transported in less prosperous days, the ride through Glasgow came back upon his fancy, not as a humiliating contrast, but as a fair occasion for reverting to that one day state. It seemed an equipage etern, from which no power of fate or fortune once mounted, had power thereafter to dislodge him. There is some merit in putting a handsome face upon indigent circumstances, to bully and swagger away the sense of them before strangers, maybe not always discommendable. Tibbs and Bobadil, even when detected, have more of our admiration than contempt. But for a man to put the cheat upon himself, to play the Bobadil at home, and steeped in poverty up to the lips, to fancy himself all the while chin-deep in riches, is a strain of constitutional philosophy and a mastery over fortune, which was reserved for my Essay 11 
of the last essays of elia by charles lamb this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison the superannuated man sara tamen respectsit libertas virgil a clerk I was in London gay. O'Keefe If, peradventure reader, it has been thy lot to waste the golden years of thy life, thy shining youth, in the irksome confinement of an office, to have thy prison days prolonged through middle age down to decrepitude and silver hairs, without hope of release or respite, to have lived to forget that there are such things as holidays, or to remember them but as the prerogatives of childhood, then and then only will you be able to appreciate my deliverance. It is now six and thirty years since I took my seat at the desk in Mincing Lane. Melancholy was the transition at fourteen from the abundant playtime and the frequently intervening vacations of school days to the eight, nine, and sometimes ten hours a day attendance at a counting-house. But time partially reconciles us to anything. I gradually became content, doggedly contented, as wild animals in cages. It is true I had my Sundays to myself, but Sundays, admirable as the institution of them is for purposes of worship, are for that very reason the very worst adapted for days of unbending and recreation. In particular, there is a gloom for me attendant upon a city Sunday, a weight in the air. I miss the cheerful cries of London, the music and the ballad singers, the buzz and stirring murmur of the streets. Those eternal bells depress me. The closed shops repel me. Prints, pictures, all the glittering and endless succession of knacks and gewgaws and ostentatiously displayed wares of tradesmen which make a weekday saunter through the less busy parts of the metropolis so delightful are shut out no bookstalls deliciously to idle over no busy faces to recreate the idle man who contemplates them ever passing by the very face of business a charm by contrast to his temporary relaxation from it nothing to be seen but unhappy countenances or half happy at best of emancipated prentices and little tradesfolks with here and there a servant maid that has got leave to go out, who, slaving all the week, with the habit, has lost almost the capacity of enjoying a free hour, and livelily expressing the hollowness of a day's pleasuring. The very strollers in the fields on that day look anything but comfortable. But besides Sundays, I had a day at Easter, and a day at Christmas, with a full week in the summer, to go and air myself in my native fields of Hertfordshire. This last was a great indulgence, and the prospect of its recurrence, I believe, alone kept me up through the year, and made my durance tolerable. But when the week came round, did the glittering phantom of the distance keep touch with me? Or, rather, was it not a series of seven uneasy days, 
spent in restless pursuit of pleasure, and a wearisome anxiety to find out how to make the most of them. Where was the quiet? Where the promised rest? Before I had a taste of it, it was vanished. I was at the desk again, counting upon the fifty-one tedious weeks that must intervene before such another snatch would come. Still, the prospect of its coming threw something of an illumination upon the darker side of my captivity. Without it, as I have said, I could scarcely have sustained my thraldom. Independently of the rigours of attendance, I have ever been haunted with a sense, perhaps a mere caprice, of incapacity for business. This, during my latter years, had increased to such a degree that it was visible in all the lines of my countenance. My health and my good spirits flagged. I had perpetually a dread of some crisis to which I should be found unequal. Besides my daylight servitude, I served over again all night in my sleep, and would awake with terrors of imaginary false entries, errors in my accounts and the like. I was fifty years of age, and no prospect of emancipation presented itself. I had grown to my desk, as it were, and the wood had entered into my soul. My fellows in the office would sometimes rally me upon the trouble legible in my countenance, but I did not know that it had raised the suspicions of any of my employers, when, on the fifth of last month, a day ever to be remembered by me, Lamels, the junior partner in the firm, called me on one side, directly taxed me with my bad looks, and frankly inquired the cause of them. So taxed, I honestly made confession of my infirmity, and added that I was afraid I should eventually be obliged to resign his service. He spoke some words, of course, to hearten me, and there the matter rested. A whole week I remained labouring under the impression that I had acted imprudently in my disclosure, that I had foolishly given a handle against myself, and had been anticipating my own dismissal. A week passed in this manner the most anxious one I verily believe in my whole life, when, on the evening of the twelfth of April, just as I was about quitting my desk to go home, it might be about eight o'clock, I received an awful summons to attend the presence of the whole assembled firm in the formidable back parlour. I thought now my time is surely come, I have done for myself. I am going to be told that they have no longer occasion for me. Lamels, I could see, smiled at the terror I was in, which was a little relief to me, when, to my utter astonishment, Bosenke, the eldest partner, began a formal harangue to me on the length of my services my very meritorious conduct during the whole of the time. The deuce, thought I, how did he find out that? I protest I never had the confidence to think as much. He went on to descant on the expediency of retiring at a certain time of life, how my heart panted, and asking me a few questions as to the amount of my own property of which I have a little, ended with a proposal, to which his three partners nodded a grave assent, 
that I should accept from the house which I had served so well a pension for life to the amount of two-thirds of my accustomed salary. A magnificent offer. I do not know what I answered between surprise and gratitude, but it was understood that I accepted their proposal, and I was told that I was free from that hour to leave their service. I stammered out a bow, and at just ten minutes after eight I went home, for ever. This noble benefit, gratitude, forbids me to conceal their names. I owe to the kindness of the most munificent firm in the world, the house of Boldero, Merriweather, Bosenke, and Lacey. Esto perpetua. For the first day or two I felt stunned, overwhelmed. I could only apprehend my felicity. I was too confused to taste it sincerely. I wandered about, thinking I was happy, and knowing that I was not. I was in the condition of a prisoner in the old Bastille, suddenly let loose after a forty years' confinement. I could scarce trust myself with myself. It was like passing out of time into eternity, for it is a sort of eternity for a man to have his time all to himself. It seemed to me that I had more time on my hands than I could ever manage. From a poor man, poor in time, I was suddenly lifted up into a vast revenue. I could see no end of my possessions. I wanted some steward or judicious bailiff to manage my estates in time for me. And here, let me caution persons grown old in active business, not lightly, nor without weighing their own resources, to forego their customary employment all at once, for there may be danger in it. I feel it by myself, but I know that my resources are sufficient. And now that those first giddy raptures have subsided, I have a quiet home feeling of the blessedness of my condition. I am in no hurry. Having all holidays, I am as though I had none. If time hung heavy upon me, I could walk it away. But I do not walk all day long as I used to do, in those old transient holidays, thirty miles a day, to make the most of them. If time were troublesome, I could read it away, but I do not read in that violent measure, with which, having no time my own, but candlelight time, I used to weary out my head and eyesight in bygone winters. I walk, read, or scribble as now, just when the fit seizes me. I no longer hunt after pleasure. I let it come to me. I am like the man that's born and has his years come to him, in some green desert. Years, you will say. What is this superannuated simpleton calculating upon? He has already told us he is past fifty. I have, indeed, lived nominally fifty years, but deduct out of them 
the hours which I have lived to other people, and not to myself, and you will find me still a young fellow. For that is the only true time which a man can properly call his own, that which he has all to himself. The rest, though in some sense he may be said to live it, is other people's time, not his. The remnant of my poor days, long or short, is at least multiplied for me threefold. My ten next years, if I stretch so far, will be as long as any preceding thirty. Uh, Tis a fair rule of three sum. Among the strange fantasies which beset me at the commencement of my freedom, and of which all traces are not yet gone, one was that a vast tract of time had intervened since I quitted the counting-house. I could not conceive of it as an affair of yesterday. The partners and the clerks, with whom I had for so many years, and for so many hours in each day of the year, been closely associated, being suddenly removed from them, they seemed as dead to me. There is a fine passage which may serve to illustrate this fancy in a tragedy by Sir Robert Howard, speaking of a friend's death. "'Twas but just now he went away. I have not since had time to shed a tear. And yet the distance does the same appear as if he had been a thousand years from me. Time takes no measure in eternity. To dissipate the awkward feeling, I have been fain to go among them once or twice since, to visit my old desk-fellows, my co-brethren of the quill, that I had left below in the state militant. Not all the kindness with which they received me could quite restore to me that pleasant familiarity which I had heretofore enjoyed among them. We cracked some of our old jokes, but methought they went off but faintly. My old desk, the peg where I hung my hat, were appropriated to another. I knew it must be, but I could not take it kindly. Devil take me, if I did not feel some remorse, beast if I had not, at quitting my old compeers, the faithful partners of my toils for six and thirty years, that smoothed for me with their jokes and conundrums, the ruggedness of my professional road. Had it been so rugged then, after all? Or was I a coward, simply? Well, it is too late to repent, and I also know that these suggestions are a common fallacy of the mind on such occasions. But my heart smote me, I had violently broken the bands betwixt us. It was at least not courteous. I shall be some time before I get quite reconciled to the separation. Farewell, old cronies. Yet not for long, for again and again I will come among ye, if I shall have your leave. Farewell, chaplain, dry, sarcastic, and friendly, Doberman, mild, slow to move, and gentlemanly, Plimsoll, 
officious to do and to volunteer good services and thou thou dreary pile fit mansion for a gresham or a whittington of old stately house of merchants with thy labyrinthine passages and light excluding pent-up offices where candles for one half the year supplied the place of the sun's light unhealthy contributor to my wheel stern fosterer of my living farewell in thee remain and not in the obscure collection of some wandering bookseller my works there let them rest as i do from my labours piled on thy massy shelves more manuscripts in folio than ever aquinas left and full as useful my mantle i bequeath among ye a fortnight has passed since the date of my first communication at that period i was approaching to tranquillity but had not reached it i boasted of a calm indeed but it was comparative only something of the first flutter was left an unsettling sense of novelty the dazzle to weak eyes of unaccustomed light i missed my old chains forsooth as if they had been some necessary part of my apparel i was a poor carthusian from strict cellular discipline suddenly by some revolution returned upon the world i am now as if i had never been other than my own master it is natural to me to go where i please to do what i please i find myself at eleven o'clock in the day in bond street and it seems to me that i have been sauntering there at that very hour for years past i digress into soho to explore a bookstore methinks i have been thirty years a collector there is nothing strange nor new in it i find myself before a fine picture in a morning was it ever otherwise what is become of fish street hill where is fenchurch street stones of old mincing lane which i have worn with my daily pilgrimage for six and thirty years to the footsteps of what toil-worn clerk are your everlasting flints now vocal i indent the gayer flags of pall mall it is change time and i am strangely among the elgin marbles it was no hyperbole when i ventured to compare the change in my condition to a passing into another world time stands still in a manner to me i have lost all distinction of season i do not know the day of the week or of the month each day used to be individually felt by me in its reference to the foreign post days in its distance from or propinquity to the next sunday i had my wednesday feelings my saturday night sensations the genius of each day was upon me distinctly during the whole of it affecting my appetite spirits etc the phantom of the next day with the dreary five to follow sat as a load upon my poor sabbath recreations what charm 
has washed that Ethiop white. What is gone of Black Monday? All days are the same. Sunday itself, that unfortunate failure of a holiday, as it too often proved, what with my sense of its fugitiveness, and over-care to get the greatest quantity of pleasure out of it, is melted down into a weekday. I can spare to go to church now, without grudging the huge cantle which it used to seem to cut out of the holiday. I have time for everything. I can visit a sick friend. I can interrupt the man of much occupation when he is busiest. I can insult over him with an invitation to take a day's pleasure with me to Windsor this fine May morning. It is Lucretian pleasure to behold the poor drudges whom I have left behind in the world, carking and caring, like horses in a mill, drudging on in the same eternal round. And what is it all for? A man can never have too much time to himself, nor too little to do. Had I a little son, I would christen him nothing to do. He should do nothing. Man, I verily believe, is out of his element as long as he is operative. I am altogether for the life contemplative. Will no kindly earthquake come, and swallow up those accursed cotton mills? Take me that lumber of a desk there, and bowl it down, as low as to the fiends. I am no longer Addison, clerk to the firm of etc i am a retired leisure i am to be met with in trim gardens i am already come to be known by my vacant face and careless gesture perambulating at no fixed pace nor with any settled purpose i walk about not to and from they tell me a certain cum dignitate air that has been buried so long with my other good parts has begun to shoot forth in my person. I grow into gentility perceptibly. When I take up a newspaper, it is to read the state of the opera. Opus operatum est. I have done all that I came into this world to do. I have worked task work. Essay 12 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison The Genteel Style in Writing It is an ordinary criticism that my Lord Shaftesbury and Sir William Temple are models of the genteel style in writing. We should prefer saying of the lordly and the gentlemanly. Nothing can be more unlike than the inflated finical rhapsodies of Shaftesbury and the plain natural chit-chat of Temple. The man of rank is discernible in both writers, but in the one 
it is only insinuated gracefully. In the other it stands out offensively. The peer seems to have written with his coronet on, and his earl's mantle before him. The commoner in his elbow chair and undress. What can be more pleasant than the way in which the retired statesman peeps out in the essays, penned by the latter in his delightful retreat at Sheen? They scent of Nimiguan and the Hague. Scarce an authority is quoted under an ambassador. Don Francisco de Melo, a Portugal envoy in England, tells him it was frequent in his country for men spent with age or other decays, so as they could not hope for above a year or two of life, to ship themselves away in a Brazil fleet, and after their arrival there, to go on a great length, sometimes of twenty or thirty years or more, by the force of that vigour they recovered with that remove. Whether such an effect, Temple beautifully adds, might grow from the air, or the fruits of that climate, or by approaching nearer the sun, which is the fountain of light and heat, when their natural heat was so far decayed, or whether the piecing out of an old man's life were worth the pains, I cannot tell. Perhaps the play is not worth the candle. Monsieur Pompon, French ambassador in his Sir William's time at the Hague, certifies him that in his life he had never heard of any man in France that arrived at a hundred years of age, a limitation of life which the old gentleman imputes to the excellence of their climate, giving them such a liveliness of temper and humour as disposes them to more pleasures of all kinds than in other countries, and moralises upon the matter very sensibly. The late Robert, Earl of Leicester, furnishes him with a story of a Countess of Desmond, married out of England in Edward the Fourth's time, and who lived far in King James's reign. The same noble person gives him an account how such a year in the same reign there went about the country a set of Morris dancers, composed of ten men who danced a maid Marian and a tabor and pipe, and how these twelve, one with another, made up twelve hundred years. It was not so much, says Temple, that so many in one small county, Herefordshire, should live to that age, as that they should be in vigour and in humour to travel and to dance. Monsieur Zuleikem, one of his colleagues at The Hague, informs him of a cure for the gout, which is confirmed by another envoy, Monsieur Serinchamp, in that town, who had tried it. Old Prince Maurice of Nassau recommends to him the use of hammocks in that complaint, having been allured to sleep while suffering under it himself by the constant motion or swinging of those airy beds. Count Egmont and the Rhinegrave, 
who was killed last summer before Maestricht, impart to him their experiences. But the rank of the writer is never more innocently disclosed than where he takes for granted the compliments paid by foreigners to his fruit-trees. For the taste and perfection of what we esteem the best, he can truly say that the French, who have eaten his peaches and grapes at Sheen in no very ill year, have generally concluded that the last are as good as any they have eaten in France, on this side Fontainebleau, and the first as good as any they have eat in Gascony. Italians have agreed his white figs to be as good as any of that sort in Italy, which is the earlier kind of white fig there, for in the latter kind and the blue we cannot come near the warm climates, no more than in the Frontignac or Muscat grape. His orange trees, too, are as large as any he saw when he was young in France, except those of Fontainebleau, or what he has seen since in the Low Countries, except some very old ones, of the Prince of Oranges. Of grapes, he had the honour of bringing over four sorts into England, which he enumerates, and supposes that they are all by this time a pretty common among some gardeners in his neighbourhood, as well as several persons of quality. For he ever thought all things of this kind the commoner they are made, the better. The garden pedantry, with which he asserts that tis to little purpose to plant any of the best fruits, as peaches or grapes, hardly, he doubts, beyond Northamptonshire at the furthest northwards, and praises the Bishop of Munster at Kosovalt, for attempting nothing beyond cherries in that cold climate, is equally pleasant and in character. I may perhaps, he thus ends his sweet garden essay, with a passage worthy of Cowley, be allowed to know something of this trade, since I have so long allowed myself to be good for nothing else, which few men will do, or enjoy their gardens, without often looking abroad to see how other matters play, what motions in the state, and what invitations they may hope for into other scenes. For my own part, as the country life, and this part of it more particularly, for the inclination of my youth itself, so they are the pleasure of my age, and I can truly say that, among many great employments that have fallen to my share, I have never asked or sought for any of them, but have often endeavoured to escape from them into the ease and freedom of a private scene, where a man may go his own way and his own pace, in the common paths and circles of life. The measure of choosing well is whether a man likes what he has chosen, which I thank God has befallen me. And though among the follies of my life the building and planting have not been the least, and have cost me more than I have the confidence to own, yet they have been fully recompensed by the sweetness and satisfaction of this retreat, where, since my resolution taken of never entering again into any public employments, I have passed five years without ever once going to town, though I am almost in sight of it, 
and have a house there, always ready to receive me. Nor has this been any sort of affectation, as some have thought it, but a mere want of desire or humour to make so small a remove. For when I am in this corner, I can truly say with Horace, May quotiers reficit, etc. Me, when the cold digentian stream revives, what does my friend believe, I think, or ask? Let me yet less possess, so I may live, whate'er of life remains unto myself. May I have books enough, and one year's store, not to depend upon each doubtful hour. This is enough of mighty Jove to pray, who, as he pleases, gives and takes away. The writings of Temple are, in general, after this easy copy. On one occasion, indeed, his wit, which was mostly subordinate to nature and tenderness, has seduced him into a string of felicitous antitheses, which, it is obvious to remark, have been a model to Addison and succeeding essayists. Who or would not be covetous, and with reason, he says, if help could be purchased with gold? Who not ambitious, if it were at the command of power, or restored by honour? But alas, a white staff will not help gouty feet to walk better than a common cane, nor a blue riband bind up a wound so well as a fillet. The glitter of gold or of diamonds will but hurt sore eyes instead of curing them, and an aching head will be no more eased by wearing a crown than a common nightcap. In a far better style, and more accordant with his own humour of plainness, are the concluding sentences of his discourse upon poetry. Temple took a part in the controversy about the ancient and the modern learning, and with that partiality so natural and so graceful in an old man, whose state engagements had left him little leisure to look into modern productions, while his retirement gave him occasion to look back upon the classic studies of his youth decided in favour of the latter. Certain it is, he says, that whether the fierceness of the Gothic humours, or noise of their perpetual wars frighted it away, or that the unequal mixture of the modern languages would not bear it, the great heights and excellency, both of poetry and music, fell with the Roman learning and empire and have never since recovered the admiration and applauses that before attended them. Yet such as they are amongst us, they must be confessed to be the softest and sweetest, the most general and most innocent amusements of common time and life. They still find room in the courts of princes and the cottages of shepherds. They serve to revive and animate the dead calm of poor and idle lives, and to allay or divert the violent passions and perturbations of the greatest and the busiest men. And both these effects are of equal use to human life, for the mind of man is like the sea, which is neither agreeable to the beholder nor the voyager, in a calm or in a storm, but is so to both, when a little agitated by gentle gales. And so the mind, when moved by soft and easy passions or affections. I know very well 
are that many who pretend to be wise by the forms of being grave are apt to despise both poetry and music as toys and trifles too light for the use or entertainment of serious men but whoever find themselves wholly insensible to their charms would i think do well to keep their own counsel for fear of reproaching their own temper and bringing the goodness of their natures if not of their understandings into question while this world lasts i doubt not but the pleasure and request of these two entertainments will do so too and happy those that content themselves with these or any other so easy and so innocent and do not trouble the world or other men because they cannot be quiet themselves though nobody hurts them when all is done he concludes human life is at the greatest and the best but like a froward child that must be played with and humoured a little to keep it quiet till it falls Essay 13 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison Barbara Shaw On the noon of the 14th of November, seventeen forty three or four i forget which it was just as the clock had struck one barbara shaw with her accustomed punctuality ascended the long rambling staircase with awkward interposed landing-places which led to the office or rather a sort of box with a desk in it whereat sat the then treasurer of what few of our readers may remember the old bath theatre all over the island it was the custom and remains so i believe to this day for the players to receive their weekly stipend on the saturday it was not much that barbara had to claim this little maid had just entered her eleventh year but her important station at the theatre as it seemed to her with the benefits which she felt to accrue from her pious application of her small earnings had given an air of womanhood to her steps and to her behaviour you would have taken her to have been at least five years older till latterly she had merely been employed in choruses or where children were wanted to fill up the scene but the manager observing a diligence and adroitness in her above her age had for some few months past entrusted to her the performance of whole parts you may guess the self-consequence of the promoted barbara she had already drawn tears in young arthur had rallied richard with infantine petulance in the duke of york and in her turn had rebuked that petulance when she was prince of wales she would have done the elder child in morton's pathetic afterpiece to the life but as yet the children in the wood was not 
Long after this little girl was grown an aged woman, I have seen some of these small parts, each making two or three pages at most, copied out in the rudest hand of the then prompter, who doubtless transcribed a little more carefully and fairly for the grown-up tragedy ladies of the establishment, but such as they were blotted and scrawled as for a child's use, she kept them all, and in the zenith of her after-reputation it was a delightful sight to behold them bound up in costliest Morocco, each single, each small part making a book, with fine clasps, gilt splashed, etc. She had conscientiously kept them as they had been delivered to her. Not a blot had been effaced or tampered with. They were precious to her for their affecting remembrancings. They were her principia, her rudiments, the elementary atoms, the little steps by which she pressed forward to perfection. What, she would say, could Indian rubber or a pumice-stone have done for these darlings? I am in no hurry to begin my story. Indeed, I have little or none to tell. So I will just mention an observation of hers, connected with that interesting time. Not long before she died, I had been discoursing with her on the quantity of real present emotion which a great tragic performer experiences during acting. I venture to think that though in the first instance such players must have possessed the feelings which they so powerfully called up in others, yet by frequent repetition those feelings must become deadened in great measure, and the performer trust to the memory of past emotion rather than express a present one. She indignantly repelled the notion that with a truly great tragedian the operation by which such effects were produced upon an audience could ever degrade itself into what was purely mechanical. With a much delicacy, avoiding to instance in her self-experience, she told me that so long ago as when she used to play the part of the little son to Mrs. Porter's Isabella, I think it was, when that impressive actress has been bending over her in some heart-rending colloquy, she has felt real hot tears come trickling from her, which, to use her powerful expression, have perfectly scalded her back. I am not quite so sure that it was Mrs. Porter, but it was some great actress of that day. The name is indifferent, but the fact of the scalding tears I most distinctly remember. I was always fond of the society of players, and am not sure that an impediment in my speech, which certainly kept me out of the pulpit, even more than certain personal disqualifications, which are often got over in that profession, 
did not prevent me at one time of life from adopting it. I have had the honour, I must ever call it, once to have been admitted to the tea-table of Miss Kelly. I have played at serious whist with Mr. Lisson. I have chatted with ever-good-humoured Mrs. Charles Campbell. I have conversed as friend to friend with her accomplished husband. I have been indulged with a classical conference with Macready, and with a sight of the player picture gallery at Mrs. Matthews, when the kind owner to remunerate me for my love of the old actors, whom he loves so much, went over it with me, supplying to his capital collection what alone the artist could not give them, voice and their living motion. Old tones half faded of Dodd and Parsons and Baddeley have lived again for me at his bidding. Only Edwin he could not restore to me. I have supped with, but I am growing a coxcomb. As I was about to say, at the desk of the then treasurer of the old Bath Theatre, not diamonds, presented herself the little Barbara Shaw. The parents of Barbara had been in reputable circumstances. The father had practised, I believe, as an apothecary in the town, but his practice, from causes which I feel my own infirmity too sensibly that way to arraign, or perhaps from that pure infelicity which accompanies some people in their walk through life, and which it is impossible to lay at the door of imprudence, was now reduced to nothing. They were, in fact, in the very teeth of starvation, when the manager, who knew and respected them in better days, took the little Barbara into his company. At the period I commenced with, her slender earnings were the sole support of the family, including two younger sisters. I must throw a veil over some mortifying circumstances. Enough to say that her Saturday's pittance was the only chance of a Sunday's, generally the only, meal of meat. One thing I will only mention, that in some child's part, where in her theatrical character she was to sup off a roast fowl, O oh joy to Barbara, some comic actor, who was a for the night caterer for the dainty, in the misguided humour of his part, threw over the dish such a quantity of salt, O oh, grief and pain of heart to Barbara, that when he crammed a portion of it into her mouth, she was obliged sputteringly to reject it, and what with shame of her ill-acted part, and pain of real appetite at missing such a dainty, her little heart sobbed almost to breaking, till a flood of tears, which the well-fed spectators were totally unable to comprehend, mercifully relieved her. This was the little starved, meritorious maid 
who stood before old Ravenscroft, the treasurer, for her Saturday's payment. Ravenscroft was a man I have heard many old theatrical people besides herself say of all men least calculated for a treasurer. He had no head for accounts, paid away at random, kept scarce any books, and summing up at the week's end, if he found himself a pound or so deficient, blessed himself that it was no worse. Now Barbara's weekly stipend was a bare half-guinea. By mistake he popped into her hand a whole one. Barbara tripped away. She was entirely unconscious at first of the mistake. God knows Ravenscroft would never have discovered it. But when she had got down to the first of those uncouth landing-places, she became sensible of an unusual weight of metal pressing her little hand. Now mark the dilemma. She was by nature a good child. From her parents and those about her, she had imbibed no contrary influence. But then they had taught her nothing. Poor men's smoky cabins are not always porticos of moral philosophy. This little maid had no instinct to evil, but then she might be said to have no fixed principle. She had heard honesty commended, but never dreamed of its application to herself. She thought of it as something which concerned grown-up people, men and women. She had never known temptation, or thought of preparing resistance against it. Her first impulse was to go back to the old treasurer, and explain to him his blunder. He was already so confused with age, besides a natural want of punctuality, that she would have had some difficulty in making him understand it. She saw that in an instant. And then it was such a bit of money, and then the image of a larger allowance of butcher's meat on their table next day came across her, till her little eyes glistened and her mouth moistened. But then Mr. Ravenscroft had always been so good-natured, had stood her friend behind the scenes, and even recommended her promotion to some of her little parts. But again the old man was reputed to be worth a world of money. He was supposed to have fifty pounds a year clear of the theatre, and then came staring upon her the figures of her little stockingless and shoeless sisters, and when she looked at her own neat white cotton stockings, which her situation at the theatre had made it indispensable for her mother to provide for her, with hard straining and pinching from the family stock, and thought how glad she should be to cover their poor feet with the same, and how then they could accompany her to rehearsals, which they had hitherto been precluded from doing by reason of their unfashionable attire. In these thoughts she reached the second landing-place 
the second I mean from the top, for there was still another left to traverse. Now virtue support Barbara. And that never-failing friend did step in, for at that moment a strength not her own, I have heard her say, was revealed to her, a reason above reasoning, and without her own agency, as it seemed, for she never felt her feet to move, she found herself transported back to the individual desk she had just quitted, and her hand in the old hand of Ravenscroft, who in silence took back the refunded treasure, and who had been sitting, good man, insensible to the lapse of minutes, which to her were anxious ages, and from that moment a deep peace fell upon her heart, and she knew the quality of honesty. A year or two's unrepining application to her profession brightened up the feet and the prospects of her little sisters, set the whole family upon their legs again, and released her from the difficulty of discussing moral dogmas upon a landing-place. I have heard her say that it was a surprise, and not much short of mortification to her, to see the coolness with which the old man pocketed the difference, which had caused her such mortal throes. This anecdote of herself I had in the year 1800, from the mouth of the late Mrs. Crawford, then sixty-seven years of age. She died soon after. A footnote. The maiden name of this lady was Street, which she changed by successive marriages, for those of Dancer, Barry, and Crawford. She was Mrs. Crawford, and a third time a widow, when I knew her. And to her struggles upon this childish occasion, I have sometimes ventured to think her indebted for that power of rending the heart in the representation of conflicting emotions for which in after years she was considered as little inferior, if at all so, in the part of Lady Randolph, even Essay 14 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison The Tombs in the Abbey In a Letter to Robert Stevenson, Esquire. Though in some points of doctrine, and perhaps of discipline, I am diffident of lending a perfect assent to that church which you have so worthily historified, yet may the ill time never come to me when, with a chilled heart, or a portion of irreverent sentiment, I shall enter her beautiful and time-hallowed edifices. Judge then of my mortification when, after attending the choral anthems of last Wednesday at Westminster, and being desirous of renewing my acquaintance after lapsed years with the tombs and antiquities there, 
I found myself excluded, turned out like a dog, or some profane person, into the common street, with feelings not very congenial to the place, or to the solemn service which I had been listening to. It was a jar after that music. You had your education at Westminster, and doubtless among those dim aisles and cloisters you must have gathered much of that devotional feeling in those young years on which your purest mind feeds still, and may it feed. The antiquarian spirit strong in you, and gracefully blending ever with the religious, may have been sown in you among those wrecks of splendid mortality. You owe it to the place of your education. You owe it to your learned fondness for the architecture of your ancestors. You owe it to the venerableness of your ecclesiastical establishment, which is daily lessened and called in question through these practices, to speak aloud your sense of them, never to desist raising your voice against them, till they be totally done away with and abolished, till the doors of Westminster Abbey be no longer closed against the decent, though low in purse, enthusiast, or blameless devotee, who must commit an injury against his family economy, if he would be indulged with a bare admission within its walls. You owe it to the decencies which you wish to see maintained in its impressive services, that our cathedral be no longer an object of inspection to the poor at those times only, in which they must rob from their attendance on the worship every minute which they can bestow upon the fabric. In vain the public prints have taken up this subject, in vain such poor nameless writers as myself express their indignation. A word from you, sir, a hint in your journal, would be sufficient to fling open the doors of the beautiful temple again, as we can remember them when we were boys. At that time of life, what would the imaginative faculty such as it is in both of us have suffered, if the entrance to so much reflection had been obstructed by the demand of so much silver? if we had scraped it up to gain an occasional admission, as we certainly should have done, would the sight of those old tombs have been as impressive to us, while we had been weighing anxiously prudence against sentiment, as when the gates stood open as those of the adjacent park, when we could walk in at any time, as the mood brought us, for a shorter or longer time, as that lasted. Is the being shown over a place, the same as silently for ourselves, detecting the genius of it? In no part of our beloved abbey now can a person find entrance, out of service time, under the sum of two shillings, the rich and the great, or smile at the anticlimax, presume to lie in these two short words. But you can tell them, sir, how much quiet worth, how much capacity for enlarged feeling, how much taste and genius may coexist, especially in youth, with a purse incompetent to this demand. A respected friend of ours, during his late visit to the metropolis, presented himself for admission to St. Paul's. At the same time, a decently clothed man, with as decent a wife and child, were bargaining for the same indulgence. 
the price was only twopence each person. The poor but decent man hesitated, desirous to go in, but there were three of them, and he turned away reluctantly. Perhaps he wished to have seen the tomb of Nelson. Perhaps the interior of the cathedral was his object. But in the state of his finances, even sixpence might reasonably seem too much. Tell the aristocracy of the country no man can do it more impressively. Instruct them of what value these insignificant pieces of money these minims to their sight may be to their humbler brethren shame these sellers out of the temple stifle not the suggestions of your better nature with the pretext that an indiscriminate admission would expose the tombs to violation remember your boy days did you ever see or hear of a mob in the abbey while it was free to all. Do the rabble come there, or trouble their heads about such speculations? Tis all that you can do to drive them into your churches. They do not voluntarily offer themselves. They have, alas, no passion for antiquities, for tomb of king or prelate, sage or poet. If they had, they would be no longer the rabble. For forty years that I have known the fabric, the only well-attested charge of violation adduced has been a ridiculous dismemberment committed upon the effigy of that amiable spy, Major André. And is it for this, the wanton mischief of some schoolboy, fired perhaps with raw notions of transatlantic freedom, or the remote possibility of such a mischief occurring again so easily to be prevented by stationing a constable within the walls if the vergers are incompetent to the duty? Is it upon such wretched pretences that the people of England are made to pay a new Peter's pence so long abrogated, or must content themselves with contemplating the ragged exterior of their cathedral. The mischief was done about the time that you were a scholar there. Essay 15 of the last essays of elia by charles lamb this librivox recording is in the public domain a recording by tony addison amicus redivivus where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep Closed o'er the head of your loved Lycidas. I do not know when I have experienced a stranger sensation than on seeing my old friend G. D., who had been paying me a morning visit a few Sundays back at my cottage at Islington, upon taking leave instead of turning down the right-hand path by which he had entered with staff in hand and at noon day deliberately march right forwards into the midst of the stream that runs by us and totally disappear a spectacle like this at dusk would have been appalling enough but in the broad open daylight to witness such an unreserved notion towards self-destruction in a valued friend took from me all power of speculation how i found my feet i know not consciousness was quite gone some spirit not my own 
whirled me to the spot. I remember nothing but the silvery apparition of a good white head emerging, nigh which a staff, the hand unseen that wielded it, pointed upwards, as feeling for the skies. In a moment, if time was in that time, he was on my shoulders, and I, freighted with a load more precious than his who bore Anchises. And here I cannot but do justice to the officious zeal of sundry passers-by, who, albeit arriving a little too late to participate in the honour of the rescue, in philanthropic shoals came thronging to communicate their advice as to the recovery, prescribing variously the application or non-application of salt, etc., to the person of the patient. Life, meantime, was ebbing fast away, amidst the stifle of conflicting judgments, when one more sagacious than the rest by a bright thought proposed sending for the doctor trite as the counsel was and impossible as one should think to be missed on shall i confess in this emergency it was to me as if an angel had spoken great previous exertions and mine had not been inconsiderable are commonly followed by a debility of purpose. This was a moment of irresolution. Monoculus, for so, in default of catching his true name, I choose to designate the medical gentleman who now appeared, is a grave middle-aged person, who, without having studied at the college, or truckle to the pedantry of a diploma, hath employed a great portion of his valuable time in experimental processes upon the bodies of unfortunate fellow-creatures, in whom the vital spark to mere vulgar thinking would seem extinct and lost for ever. He omitteth no occasion of obtruding his services, from a case of common surfeit suffocation to the ignobler obstructions, sometimes induced by a too wilful application of the plant cannabis outwardly. But though he declineth not altogether these drier extinctions, his occupation attendeth for the most part to water practice, for the convenience of which he hath judiciously fixed his quarters near the grand repository of the stream mentioned, where, day and night, from his little watch-tower at the Middleton's head, he listeneth to detect the wrecks of drowned mortality, partly, as he saith, to be upon the spot, and partly because the liquids which he useth to prescribe to himself and his patients on these distressing occasions are ordinarily more conveniently to be found at these common hostelries than in the shops and files of the apothecaries. His ear hath arrived to such finesse by practice that it is reported he can distinguish a plunge at a half furlong distance, and can tell if it be casual or deliberate. He weareth a medal suspended over a suit originally of a sad brown, but which, by time and frequency of nightly divings, has been dinged into a true professional sable. He passeth by the name of Doctor, and is remarkable for wanting his left eye, 
His remedy, after a sufficient application of warm blankets, friction, etc., is a simple tumbler or more of the purest cognac with water made as hot as the convalescent can bear it. Where he findeth, as in the case of my friend, a squeamish subject, he condescendeth to be the taster, and showeth by his own example the innocuous nature of the prescription. Nothing can be more kind or encouraging than this procedure. It addeth confidence to the patient to see his medical adviser go hand in hand with himself in the remedy. When the doctor swalloweth his own draught, what peevish invalid can refuse to pledge him in the potion? In fine, a monoculus is a humane, sensible man, who, for a slender pittance, scarce enough to sustain life, is content to wear it out in the endeavour to save the lives of others. His pretensions so moderate, that with difficulty I could press a crown upon him, for the price of restoring the existence of such an invaluable creature to society as G. D. It was pleasant to observe the effect of the subsiding alarm upon the nerves of the dear absentee. It seemed to have given a shake to memory, calling up notice after notice of all the providential deliverances he had experienced in the course of his long and innocent life. Sitting up in my couch, my couch which, naked and void of furniture hitherto, for the salutary repose which it administered, shall be honoured with costly valence at some price, and henceforth be a state bed at Colebrook. He discoursed of marvellous escapes, by carelessness of nurses, by pails of jellied and kettles of the boiling element in infancy, by orchard pranks, and snapping twigs in schoolboy frolics, by descent of tiles at Trumpington, and of heavier tomes at Pembroke, by studious watchings inducing frightful vigilance, by want and the fear of want, and all the sore throbbings of the learned head. Anon he would burst out into little fragments of chanting, of songs long ago, ends of deliverance hymns, not remembered before since childhood, but coming up now, when his heart was made tender as a child's, for the tremor cordis, in the retrospect of a recent deliverance, as in a case of impending danger, acting upon an innocent heart, will produce a self-tenderness which we should do ill to christen cowardice, and Shakespeare, in the latter crisis, has made his good Sir Hugh to remember the sitting by Babylon, and to mutter of shallow rivers. Waters of Sir Hugh Middleton what a spark you are like to have extinguished for ever! Your salubrious streams to this city, for now near two centuries, would hardly have atoned for what you were in a moment washing away. Mockery of a river, liquid artifice, wretched conduit, henceforth rank with canals and sluggish aqueducts. Was it for this that, smit in boyhood, with the explorations of that Abyssinian traveller, I paced the vales of Amwell to explore your tributary springs, to trace your salutary waters, sparkling through green Hertfordshire and cultured Enfield parks? 
ye have no swans no naiads no river god or did the benevolent hoary aspect of my friend tempt you to suck him in that ye also might have the tutelary genius of your waters had he been drowned in cam there would have been some consonancy in it but what willows had ye to wave and rustle over his moist sepulchre or having no name besides that unmeaning assumption of eternal novity did ye think to get one by the noble prize and henceforth to be termed the stream diarian and could such spacious virtue find a grave beneath the imposthumed bubble of a wave i protest george you shall not venture out again no not by daylight without a sufficient pair of spectacles in your musing moods especially your absence of mind we have borne till your presence of body came to be called in question by it you shall not go wandering into Euripus with aristotle if we can help it fine man to turn dipper at your years after your many tracts in favour of sprinkling only i have nothing but water in my head o nights since this frightful accident sometimes i am with clarence in his dream at others i behold christian beginning to sink and crying out to his good brother hopeful that is to me i sink in deep waters the billows go over my head all the waves go over me Sela. then i have before me palinurus just letting go the steerage i cry out too late to save next follow a mournful procession suicidal faces saved against their wills from drowning dolefully trailing a length of reluctant gratefulness with ropey weeds pendant from locks of watchet hue constrained lazari pluto's half-subjects stolen fees from the grave bilking sharon of his fair at their head orion or is it g d in his singing garments marcheth singly with harp in hand and votive garland which machaon or dr hawes snatcheth straight intending to suspend it to the stern god of sea then follow dismal streams of lethe in which the half drenched on earth are constrained to drown downright by wharfs where ophelia twice acts her muddy death and doubtless there is some notice in that invisible world when one of us approacheth as my friend did so lately to their inexorable precincts when a soul knocks once twice at death's door the sensation aroused within the palace must be considerable and the grim feature by modern science so often dispossessed of his prey must have learned by this time to pity tantalus a pulse assuredly was felt along the line of the elysian shades when the near arrival of g d was announced by no equivocal indications from their seats of asphodel arose the gentler and the graver ghost's poet or historian of grecian or of roman law to crown with unfading chaplets the half-finished love labours of their unwearied scholias him markland expected him tyrwhit hoped to encounter him the sweet lyrist of peter house whom he had barely seen upon earth 
with newest airs prepared to greet. Footnote. Graham, tantum, vidit. And a patron of the gentle Christ's boy, who should have been his patron through life, the mild askew, with longing aspirations, leaned foremost from his venerable Esculapian chair to welcome into that happy company the matured virtues of the man whose tender scions in the boy he himself upon earth had so pro Essay sixteen of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison. Some sonnets of Sir Philip Sidney. Sidney's sonnets, I speak of the best of them are among the very best of their sort. They fall below the plain moral dignity, the sanctity, and high yet modest spirit of self-approval of Milton in his compositions of a similar structure. They are in truth what Milton, censuring the Arcadia, says of that work, to which they are a sort of after tune or application vain and amatorious enough yet the things in their kind as he confesses to be true of the romance may be full of worth and wit they savour of the courtier it must be allowed and not of the commonwealth's man but Milton was a courtier when he wrote the mask at Ludlow Castle, and still more a courtier when he composed the arcades. When the national struggle was to begin, he becomingly cast these vanities behind him, and if the order of time had thrown Sir Philip Sidney upon the crisis which preceded the revolution, there is no reason why he should not have acted the same part in that emergency, which has glorified the name of a later Sidney. He did not want for plainness or boldness of spirit. His letter on the French map may testify he could speak his mind freely to princes the times did not call him to the scaffold the sonnets which we oftenest call to mind of milton were the compositions of his maturest years those of sydney which i am about to produce were written in the very heyday of his blood. They are stuck full of amorous fancies, far-fetched conceits befitting his occupation, for true love thinks no labour to send out thoughts upon the vast and more than Indian voyages, to bring home rich pearls, outlandish wealth, gums, jewels, spicery, to sacrifice in self-depreciating similitudes as shadows of true amiabilities in the beloved. We must be lovers, or at least the cooling touch of time, the circum cordia frigus, must not have so damped our faculties as to take away our recollection that we were once so, 
before we can duly appreciate the glorious vanities and graceful hyperboles of the passion the images which lie before our feet though by some accounted the only natural are least natural for the high sydneyan love to express its fancies by they may serve for the loves of tibullus or the dear author of the schoolmistress for passions that creep and whine in elegies and pastoral ballads i am sure milton never loved at this rate i am afraid some of his addresses ad leonoram i mean have rather erred on the farther side and that the poet came not much short of a religious indecorum when he could thus apostrophize a singing girl angelus unicui quesuus sic credite gentes obtigit etheriis ales ab ordinibus quid mirum leonora tibi si gloria maior nam tua presentem vox sonat ipsa deum out deus out vacui certe mens tertia coeli per tua secreta gutara serpit agens serpit agens facilisque docet mortalia corda sensim immortali asuescare posse sono quod si cuncta quidem deus est per cuncta que fusus in te una loquitur sectora mutus habet this is loving in a strange fashion and it requires some candour of construction besides the slight darkening of a dead language to cast a veil over the ugly appearance of something very like blasphemy in the last two verses i think the lover would have been staggered if he had gone about to express the same thought in english i am sure sydney has no nights like this his extravaganzas do not strike at the sky though he takes leave to adopt the pale diane into a fellowship with his mortal passions one with how sad steps o moon thou climbst the skies how silently and with how wan a face what may it be that even in heavenly place that busy archer his sharp arrows tries sure if that long with love acquainted eyes can judge of love thou feel'st a lover's case i read it in thy looks thy languish grace to me that feel the like thy state descries then even of fellowship o moon tell me is constant love deemed there but want of wit are beauties there as proud as here they be do they above love to be loved and yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess do they call virtue there ungratefulness the last line of this poem is a little obscured by transposition he means do they call ungratefulness there a virtue two come sleep o oh sleep the certain knot of peace 
the baiting place of wit, the balm of woe, the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and low, with shield of proof, shield me from out the press, of those fierce darts despair at me doth throw. O oh, make in me those civil wars to cease. I will good tribute pay if thou do so. Take thou of me sweet pillows, sweetest bed, a chamber deaf to noise and blind to light, a rosy garland and a weary head, and if these things, as being thine by right, move not thy heavy grace, thou shalt in me, livelier than elsewhere, Stella's image see. 3. The curious wits, seeing dull pensiveness, bewray itself in my long-settled eyes, whence those same fumes of melancholy rise, with idle pains and missing aim do guess some that know how my spring I did address, deem that my muse some fruit of knowledge plies, others, because the prince my service tries, think that I think state errors to redress, but Harder judges judge ambition's rage, Scourge of itself, still climbing slippery place, Holds my young brain captived in golden cage. O oh, fools or overwise, Alas, the race of all my thoughts Hath neither stop nor start, But only Stella's eyes and Stella's heart. 4. Because I oft in dark abstracted guise seem most alone in greatest company with dearth of words or answers quite awry to them that would make speech of speech arise they deem and of their doom the rumour flies that poison foul of bubbling pride doth lie so in my swelling breast that only i fawn on myself and others do despise yet pride i think doth not my soul possess which looks too oft in his unflattering glass but one worse fault, ambition, I confess, that makes me oft my best friends overpass, unseen, unheard, while thought to highest place bends all his powers, even unto Stella's grace. 5. Having this day my horse, my hand, my lance, Guided so well that I obtained the prize, Both by the judgment of the English eyes, And of some scent from that sweet enemy France, Horsemen my skill in horsemanship advance, Townsfolk my strength, a daintier judge applies his praise to slight, which from good use doth rise. Some lucky wits imputed but to chance, others because of both sides I do take my blood from them who did excel in this, think nature me a man of arms did make. How far they shot awry, the true cause is, Stella looked on, and from her heavenly face sent forth the beams which made so fair my race. 6. In martial sports I had my cunning tried, 
and yet to break more staves did me address while with the people's shouts i must confess youth luck and praise even filled my veins with pride when cupid having me his slave descried in mars's livery prancing in the press what now sir fool said he i would no less look here i say i looked and stella spied who hard by made a window send forth light my heart then quaked then dazzled were mine eyes one hand forgot to rule the other to fight nor trumpet sound i heard nor friendly cries my foe came on and beat the air for me till that her blush made me my shame to see seven no more my dear no more these counsels try oh give my passions leave to run their race let fortune lay on me her worst disgrace let folk o'ercharged with brain against me cry let clouds bedim my face break in mine eye let me no steps but of lost labour trace let all the earth with scorn recount my case but do not will me from my love to fly i do not envy aristotle's wit nor do aspire to caesar's bleeding fame nor aught do care though some above me sit nor hope nor wish another course to frame but that which once may win thy cruel heart thou art my wit and thou my virtue art eight love still a boy and oft a wanton is schooled only by his mother's tender eye what wonder then if he his lesson miss when for so soft a rod dear play he try and yet my star because a sugared kiss in sport i sucked while she asleep did lie doth lower nay chide nay threat for only this sweet it was saucy love not humble i but no excuse serves she makes her wrath appear in beauty's throne see now who dares come near those scarlet judges threatening bloody pain o oh, heavenly fool thy most kiss-worthy face anger invests with such a lovely grace that anger's self i needs must kiss again nine i never drank of agonippi well nor ever did in shade of tempe sit and muses scorn with vulgar brains to dwell poor layman i for sacred rites unfit some do i hear of poet's fury tell but god what what not what they mean by it and this i swear by blackest brook of hell i am no pick-purse of another's wit how falls it then that with so smooth an ease my thoughts i speak and what i speak doth flow in verse and that my verse best wits doth please guess me the cause what is it thus fine no or so much less how then sure thus it is my lips are sweet inspired with stella's kiss ten of all the kings that ever here did reign 
Edward named forth, as first in praise I name, not for his fair outside, nor well-lined brain, although less gifts imp feathers oft on fame, nor that he could, young, wise, wise, valiant, frame his sire's revenge, joined with a kingdom's gain, and gained by Mars, could yet mad Mars so tame, that balance weighed what sword did late obtain, nor that he made the fleur de luce so frayed, though strongly hedged of bloody lion's paws, that witty Lewis to him a tribute paid, nor this, nor that, nor any such small cause, but only for this worthy knight durst prove to lose his crown rather than fail his love. 11. O oh, happy Thames, that didst my Stella bear, I saw thyself with many a smiling lime upon thy cheerful face joy's livery wear, while those fair planets on thy streams did shine, the boat for joy could not to dance forbear, while wanton winds with beauty so divine ravished stayed not till in her golden hair they did themselves, O oh, sweetest prison, twine and fain those aeol's youth there would their stay have made but forced by nature still to fly first did with puffing kiss those locks display she so dishevelled blushed from window eye with sight thereof cried out o oh, fair disgrace let honour's self to thee grant highest place Twelve, highway since you my chief parnassus be and that my muse to some ears not unsweet tempers her words to trampling horses feet more soft than to a chamber melody now blessed you bear onward blessed me to her where i my heart safe left shall meet my muse and i must you of duty greet with thanks and wishes wishing thankfully be you still fair honoured by public heed by no encroachment wronged nor time forgot nor blamed for blood nor shamed for sinful deed and that you know I envy you no lot of highest wish. I wish you so much bliss. Hundreds of years you Stella's feet may kiss. Of the foregoing, the first, the second, and the last sonnet are my favourites but the general beauty of them all is that they are so perfectly characteristical. The spirit of learning and of chivalry, of which union Spencer has entitled Sidney to have been the president, shines through them. I confess I can see nothing of the jejun or frigid in them, much less of the stiff and cumbrous which i have sometimes heard objected to the arcadia the verse runs off swiftly and gallantly it might have been tuned to the trumpet or tempered as himself expresses it to trampling horses feet they abound in felicitous phrases o oh, heavenly fool thy most kiss-worthy face eighth sonnet sweet pillows sweetest bed a chamber deaf to noise and blind to light 
a rosy garland and a weary head second sonnet that sweet enemy france fifth sonnet but they are not rich in words only in vague and unlocalized feelings the failing too much of some poetry of the present day they are full material and circumstantiated time and place appropriates every one of them it is not a fever of passion wasting itself upon a thin diet of dainty words but a transcendent passion pervading and illuminating action pursuits studies feats of arms the opinions of contemporaries and his judgment of them an historical thread runs through them which almost affixes a date to them marks the when and where they were written i have dwelt the longer upon what i conceive the merit of these poems because i have been hurt by the wantonness i wish i could treat it by a gentler name with which w h takes every occasion of insulting the memory of sir philip sidney but the decisions of the author of table talk etc most profound and subtle where they are as for the most part just are more safely to be relied upon on subjects and authors he has a partiality for than on such as he has conceived an accidental prejudice against milton wrote sonnets and was a king hater and it was congenial perhaps to sacrifice a courtier to a patriot but i was unwilling to lose a fine idea from my mind the noble images passions sentiments and poetical delicacies of character scattered all over the arcadia spite of some stiffness and encumberment justify to me the character which his contemporaries have left us of the writer i cannot think with the critic that sir philip sidney was that opprobrious thing which a foolish nobleman in his insolent hostility chose to term him i call to mind the epitaph made on him to guide me to juster thoughts of him and i repose upon the beautiful lines in the friend's passion for his astrophel printed with the elegies of spenser and others you knew who knew not astrophel that i should live to say i knew and have not in possession still things known permit me to renew of him you know his merit such i cannot say you hear too much within these woods of arcady he chief delight and pleasure took and on the mountain parthony upon the crystal liquid brook the muses met him every day that taught him sing to write and say when he descended down the mount his personage seemed most divine a thousand graces one might count upon his lively cheerful eyne to hear him speak and sweetly smile you were in paradise the while a sweet attractive kind of grace a full assurance given by looks continual comfort in a face the lineaments of gospel books i trow that countenance cannot lie whose thoughts are legible in the eye above all others this is he which erst approved in his song that love and honour might agree and that pure love will do no wrong sweet saints it is no sin or blame to love a man of virtuous name did never love so sweetly breathe in any mortal breast before did never muse inspire beneath 
a poet's brain with finer store he wrote of love with high conceit and beauty reared above her height or let any one read the deeper sorrows grief running into rage in the poem the last in the collection accompanying the above which from internal testimony i believe to be lord brooks beginning with silence augmenteth grief and then seriously ask himself whether the subject of such absorbing and confounding regrets could have been that thing Essay 17 of the Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison Newspapers Thirty-five Years Ago Dan Stewart once told us that he did not remember that he ever deliberately walked into the exhibition at Somerset House in his life. He might occasionally have escorted a party of ladies across the way that were going in, but he never went in of his own head. Yet the office of the Morning Post newspaper stood then just where it does now. We are carrying you back, reader, some thirty years or more with its gilt globe topped front facing that emporium of our artist's grand annual exposure we sometimes wish that we had observed the same abstinence with daniel a word or two of d s he ever appeared to us one of the finest tempered of editors perry of the morning chronicle was equally pleasant, with a dash, no slight one either, of the courtier. S. was frank, plain, and English all over. We have worked for both these gentlemen. It is soothing to contemplate the head of the Ganges, to trace the first little bubblings of a mighty river, with holy reverence to approach the rocks whence glide the streams renowned in ancient song fired with a perusal of the abyssinian pilgrims exploratory ramblings after the cradle of the infant nilus we well remember on one fine summer holiday a whole day's leave we called it at christ's hospital sallying forth at rise of sun not very well provisioned either for such an undertaking to trace the current of the new river middletonian stream to its scatcherient source as we had read in meadows by fair amwell gallantly did we commence our solitary quest for it was essential to the dignity of a discovery that no eye of schoolboy save our own should beam on the detection by flowery spots and verdant lanes skirting hornsey hope trained us on in many a baffling turn endless hopeless meanders as it seemed or as if the jealous waters had dodged us reluctant to have the humble spot of their nativity revealed till spent and nigh famished before set of the same sun we set down somewhere by bow's farm near tottenham with a tithe of our proposed labours only yet accomplished sorely convinced in spirit that that brucian enterprise was as yet too arduous for our young shoulders not more refreshing 
to the thirsty curiosity of the traveller is the tracing of some mighty waters up to their shallow fontlet than it is to a pleased and candid reader to go back to the inexperienced essays, the first callow flights in authorship of some established name in literature, from the gnat which preluded to the Aeneid, to the duck which Samuel Johnson trod on. In those days, every morning paper, as an essential retainer to its establishment, kept an author who was bound to furnish daily a quantum of witty paragraphs. Sixpence a joke, and it was thought pretty high, too, was Dan Stewart's settled remuneration in these cases. The chat of the day, scandal, but above all dress, furnished the material. The length of no paragraph was to exceed seven lines. Shorter they might be, but they must be poignant. A fashion of flesh, or rather pink-coloured hose for the ladies, luckily coming up at the juncture when we were on our probation for the place of chief jester at S's paper, established our reputation in that line. We were pronounced a capital hand. Oh, the conceits which we varied upon red in all its prismatic differences, from the trite and obvious flower of Cytherea to the flaming costume of the lady that has her sitting upon many waters. Then there was the collateral topic of ankles. What an occasion to a truly chaste writer like ourself, of touching that nice brink and yet never tumbling over it, of a seemingly ever approximating something not quite proper, while, like a skilful posture-master, balancing betwixt decorums and their opposites, he keeps the line from which a hair-breadth's deviation is distraction, hovering in the confines of light and darkness, or where both seem either a hazy, uncertain delicacy, or Tolocus like in the play, still putting off his expectant auditory with, Whoop! Do me no harm, good man! But, above all, that conceit arided us most at that time, and still tickles a midriff to remember where, elusively to the flight of Astraea, Ultima Celestum, Terras Reliquit, we pronounced, in reference to the stocking still, that modesty, taking her final leave of mortals, her last blush was visible in her ascent to the heavens by the tract of the glowing instep. This might be called the crowning conceit, and was esteemed tolerable writing in those days. But the fashion of jokes with all other things passes away, as did the transient mode which had so favoured us. The ankles of our fair friends in a few weeks began to reassume their whiteness, and left us scarce a leg to stand upon. Other female whims followed, but none, methought, so pregnant, so invitatory of shrewd conceits, and more than single meanings. Somebody has said that to swallow six cross buns daily, consecutively for a fortnight, would surfeit the stoutest digestion. 
but to have to furnish as many jokes daily, and that not for a fortnight, but for a long twelve-month, as we were constrained to do, was a little harder execution. Man goeth forth to his work until the evening. From a reasonable hour in the morning, we presume it was meant. Now, as our main occupation took us up from eight to five every day in the city, and as our evening hours at that time of life had generally to do with anything rather than business, it follows that the only time we could spare for this manufactory of jokes, our supplementary livelihood, that supplied us in every want beyond mere bread and cheese, was exactly that part of the day which, as we have heard of no man's land, may be fitly denominated no man's time, that is, no time in which a man ought to be up and awake in. To speak more plainly, it is that time of an hour or an hour and a half's duration, in which a man, whose occasions call him up so preposterously, has to wait for his breakfast. Oh, those headaches at dawn of day, when at five or half-past five in summer, and not much later in the dark seasons, we were compelled to rise having been perhaps not above four hours in bed, for we were no go-to-beds with the lambs, though we anticipated the lark oft-times in her rising. We liked a parting cup at midnight, as all young men did before these effeminate times, and to have our friends about us. We were not constellated under Aquarius, that watery sign, and therefore incapable of Bacchus, cold, washy, bloodless. We were none of your Basilian water-sponges, nor had taken our degrees at Mount Ague. We were right toping Capulets, jolly companions, we and they. But to have to get up, as we said before, curtailed of half our fair sleep, fasting, with only a dim vista of refreshing bohea in the distance, to be necessitated to rouse ourselves at the detestable rap of an old hag of a domestic, who seemed to take a diabolical pleasure in her announcement that it was time to rise, and whose chappy knuckles we have often yearned to amputate and string them up at our chamber door, to be a terror to all such unseasonable rust-breakers in future. Facile and sweet, as Virgil sings, had been the descending of the overnight, balmy the first sinking of the heavy head upon the pillow, but to get up, as he goes on to say, Revocare gradus, superasque evadare ad auras and to get up, moreover, to make jokes with malice prepended. There was the labour, there the work. No Egyptian taskmaster ever devised a slavery like to that our slavery. No fractious operants ever turned out for half the tyranny which this necessity exercised upon us. Half a dozen jests in a day, baiting Sundays too. Why, it seems nothing. We make twice the number every day in our lives, as a matter of course, and claim no sabbatical exemptions. But then they come into our head. But when the head has to go out to them, when the mountain must go to Mohammed. Reader, try it for once, only for one short. Twelve month. It was not every week that a fashion of pink stockings came up, but mostly, instead of it, 
some rugged, untractable subject, some topic impossible to be contorted into the risible, some feature upon which no smile could play, some flint from which no process of ingenuity could procure a distillation. There they lay, there your appointed tale of brick-making was set before you, which you must finish, with or without straw, as it happened. The craving dragon, the public, like him in Bell's temple, must be fed. It expected its daily rations, and Daniel and ourselves, to do us justice, did the best we could on this side bursting him while we were wringing our coy sprightlinesses for the post and writhing under the toil of what is called easy writing bob allen our quondam schoolfellow was tapping his impracticable brains in a like service for the oracle not that robert troubled himself much about wit if his paragraphs had a sprightly air about them it was sufficient he carried this nonchalance so far at last that a matter of intelligence and that no very important one was not seldom palmed upon his employers for a good jest for example sake walking yesterday morning casually down snow hill who should we meet but mr deputy humphreys we rejoice to add that the worthy deputy appeared to enjoy a good state of health we do not remember ever to have seen him look better this gentleman so surprisingly met upon snow hill from some peculiarities in gait or gesture, was a constant butt for mirth to the small paragraph-mongers of the day, and our friend thought that he might have his fling at him with the rest. We met A. in Holborn shortly after this extraordinary rencounter, which he told with tears of satisfaction in his eyes, and chuckling at the anticipated effects of its announcement next day in the paper. We did not quite comprehend where the wit of it lay at the time, nor was it easy to be detected when the thing came out, advantaged by type and letterpress. He had better have met anything that morning than a common council man. His services were shortly after dispensed with, on the plea that his paragraphs of late had been deficient in point. The one in question, it must be owned, had an air, in the opening especially, a proper to awaken curiosity, and the sentiment or moral wears the aspect of humanity and good neighbourly feeling. But somehow the conclusion was not judged altogether to answer to the magnificent promise of the premises. We traced our friend's pen afterwards in the true Britain, the star, the traveller, from all which he was successively dismissed, the proprietors having no further occasion for his services. Nothing was easier than to detect him, when wit failed or topics ran low there constantly appeared the following it is not generally known that the three blue balls at the pawnbroker's shops are the ancient arms of lombardy the lombards were the first money brokers in europe bob has done more to set the public right on this important point of blazonry than the whole college of heralds the appointment of a regular wit has long ceased to be a part of the economy of a morning paper editors find their own jokes or do as well without them 
Parson Est and Topham brought up the set custom of witty paragraphs first in the world. Bowden was a reigning paragraphist in his day, and succeeded poor Allen in the oracle. But as we said, the fashion of jokes passes away, and it would be difficult to discover in the biographer of Mrs. Siddons any traces of that vivacity and fancy which charmed the whole town at the commencement of the present century. Even the prelusive delicacies of the present writer, the curt Astraean allusion, would be thought pedantic and out of date in these days. From the office of the Morning Post, for we may as well exhaust our newspaper reminiscences at once, by change of property in the paper, we were transferred, mortifying exchange, to the office of the Albion newspaper, late Rackstrow's Museum in Fleet Street. What a transition from a handsome apartment, from rosewood desks and silver inkstands, to an office, no office but a den, rather, but just redeemed from the occupation of dead monsters, of which it seemed redolent, from the centre of loyalty and fashion to a focus of vulgarity and sedition. Here, in murky closet, inadequate from its square contents to the receipt of the two bodies of editor and humble paragraph-maker, together at one time sat in the discharge of his new editorial functions the bygod of elia the redoubted john fenwick f without a guinea in his pocket and having left not many in the pockets of his friends whom he might command had purchased on tick doubtless the whole and sole editorship proprietorship with all the rights and titles such as they were worth of the albion from one lovell of whom we know nothing save that he had stood in the pillory for a libel on the prince of wales with this hopeless concern for it had been sinking ever since its commencement and could now reckon upon not more than a hundred subscribers f resolutely determined upon pulling down the government in the first instance and making both our fortunes by way of corollary for seven weeks and more did this infatuated democrat go about borrowing seven shilling pieces and lesser coin to meet the daily demands of the stamp office which allowed no credit to publications of that side in politics. An outcast from politer bread, we attached our small talents to the forlorn fortunes of our friend. Our occupation now was to write treason. Recollections of feelings, which were all that now remained from our first boyish heats, kindled by the french revolution when if we were misled we erred in the company of some who are accounted very good men now rather than any tendency at this time to republican doctrines assisted us in assuming a style of writing while the paper lasted consonant in no very undertone to the right earnest fanaticism of F. Our cue was now to insinuate, rather than recommend, possible abdications. Blocks, axes, Whitehall tribunals were covered with flowers of so cunning a periphrasis, as Mr. Bay says, never naming the thing directly that the keen eye of an attorney-general was insufficient to detect the lurking snake among them. There were times, indeed, 
when we sighed for our more gentlemanlike occupation under Stuart. But with change of masters, it is ever change of service. Already one paragraph and another, as we learned afterwards from a gentleman at the Treasury, had begun to be marked at that office, with a view of its being submitted at least to the attention of the proper law officers, when an unlucky or rather lucky epigram from our pen aimed at Sir J. M., who was on the eve of departing for India to reap the fruits of his apostasy, as F. pronounced it, it is hardly worth particularising. Happening to offend the nice sense of Lord, or as he then delighted to be called, Citizen Stanhope, deprived F. at once of the last hopes of a guinea from the last patron that had stuck by us, and breaking up our establishment, left us to the safe but somewhat mortifying neglect of the crown lawyers. It was about this time, or a little earlier, that Dan Stewart made that curious confession to us, that he had never deliberately walked into an exhibition. Essay 18 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Barrenness of the Imaginative Faculty in the Productions of Modern Art. Hogarth accepted. Can we produce any one painter within the last fifty years, or since the humour of exhibiting began, that has treated a story imaginatively? By this we mean upon whom his subject has so acted that it has seemed to direct him, and not to be arranged by him. Any upon whom its leading or collateral points have impressed themselves so tyrannically that he dared not treat it otherwise, lest he should falsify a revelation. Any that has imparted to his compositions not merely so much truth as is enough to convey a story with clearness, but that individualizing property which should keep the subject so treated distinct in feature from every other subject however similar and to common apprehensions almost identical so as that we might say this and this part could have found an appropriate place in no other picture in the world but this is there anything in modern art we will not demand that it should be equal, but in any way analogous to what Titian has affected in that wonderful bringing together of two times in the Ariadne in the National Gallery. Precipitous, with his reeling satyr rout about him, re-peopling and re-illuming suddenly the waste places drunk with a new fury beyond the grape bacchus born in fire fire-like flings himself at the cretan this is the time present with this telling of the story an artist and no ordinary one might remain richly proud guido in his harmonious version of it saw no further but from the depths of the imaginative spirit Titian has recalled past time and laid it contributory with the present to one simultaneous effect. 
with the desert all ringing with the mad symbols of his followers, made lucid with the presence and new offers of a god, as if unconscious of Bacchus, or but idly casting her eyes as upon some unconcerning pageant, a soul undistracted from Theseus. Ariadne is still pacing the solitary shore, in as much heart silence, and in almost the same local solitude, with which she awoke at daybreak, to catch the forlorn last glances of the sail that bore away the Athenian. Here are two points miraculously co-uniting. Fierce society, with the feeling of solitude still absolute, noonday revelations, with the accidents of the dull grey dawn unquenched and lingering, the present Bacchus with the past Ariadne, two stories with double time, separate and harmonising. Had the artist made the woman one shade less indifferent to the god, still more had she expressed a rapture at his advent, where would have been the story of the mighty desolation of the heart previous, merged in the insipid accident of a flattering offer met with a welcome acceptance? The broken heart for Theseus was not likely to be pieced up by a god. We have before us a fine rough print from a picture by Raphael in the Vatican. It is the presentation of the newborn Eve to Adam by the Almighty. A fairer mother of mankind we might imagine, and a goodlier sire perhaps of men since born. But these are matters subordinate to the conception of the situation displayed in this extraordinary production. A tolerably modern artist would have been satisfied with tempering certain raptures of connubial anticipation with a suitable acknowledgment to the giver of the blessing in the countenance of the first bridegroom something like the divided attention of the child adam was here a child man between the given toy and the mother who had just blessed it with the bauble this is the obvious the first sight view the superficial an artist of a higher grade considering the awful presence they were in would have taken care to subtract something from the expression of the more human passion, and to heighten the more spiritual one. This would be as much as an exhibition-goer, from the opening of Somerset House to last year's show, has been encouraged to look for. It is obvious to hint at a lower expression, yet in a picture that for respects of drawing and colouring might be deemed not wholly inadmissible within these art-bustering walls in which the rapture should be as ninety-nine the gratitude as one or perhaps zero by neither the one passion nor the other has raphael expounded the situation of adam singly upon his brow sits the absorbing sense of wonder at the created miracle the moment is seized by the intuitive artist perhaps not self-conscious of his art in which neither of the conflicting emotions a moment how abstracted have had time to spring up or to battle for indecorous mastery. 
we have seen a landscape of a justly admired neoteric in which he aimed at delineating a fiction one of the most severely beautiful in antiquity the gardens of the hesperides to do mr justice he had painted a laudable orchard with fitting seclusion and a veritable dragon of which a polypheme by poussin is somehow a facsimile for the situation looking over into the world shut out backwards so that none but a still climbing hercules could hope to catch a peep at the admired ternary of recluses no conventual porter could keep his keys better than this custos with the lidless eyes he not only sees that none do intrude into that privacy but as clear as daylight that none but hercules out diabolus by any manner of means can so far all is well we have absolute solitude here or nowhere ab extra the damsels are snug enough but here the artist's courage seems to have failed him he began to pity his pretty charge and to comfort the irksomeness has peopled their solitude with a bevy of fair attendants maids of honour or ladies of the bedchamber according to the approved etiquette at a court of the nineteenth century giving to the whole scene the air of a fete champetre if we will but excuse the absence of the gentleman this is well and watteauish but what is become of the solitary mystery the daughters three that sing around the golden tree this is not the way in which poussin would have treated this subject the paintings or rather the stupendous architectural designs of a modern artist have been urged as objections to the theory of our motto they are of a character we confess to stagger it his towered structures are of the highest order of the material sublime whether they were dreams or transcripts of some elder workmanship assyrian ruins old restored by this mighty artist they satisfy our most stretched and craving conceptions of the glories of the antique world it is a pity that they were ever peopled on that side the imagination of the artist halts and appears defective let us examine the point of the story in the belshazzar's feast we will introduce it by an apposite anecdote the court historians of the day record that at the first dinner given by the late king then prince regent at the pavilion the following characteristic frolic was played off the guests were select and admiring the banquet profuse and admirable the light lustrous and oriental the eye was perfectly dazzled with the display of plate among which the great gold salt cellar brought from the regalia in the tower for this especial purpose itself a tower stood conspicuous for its magnitude and now the reverend the then admired court chaplain was proceeding with the grace when at a signal given the lights were suddenly overcast and a huge transparency was discovered 
in which glittered in golden letters brighton earthquake swallow up alive imagine the confusion of the guests the georges and garters jewels bracelets moulted upon the occasion the fans dropped and picked up the next morning by the sly court pages mrs fitz what's her name fainting and the countess of pembroke holding the smelling bottle till the good-humoured prince caused harmony to be restored by calling in fresh candles and declaring that the whole was nothing but a pantomime hoax got up by the ingenious mr farley of covent garden from hints which his royal highness himself had furnished then imagine the infinite applause that followed the mutual rallyings the declarations that they were not much frightened of the assembled galaxy the point of time in the picture exactly answers to the appearance of the transparency in the anecdote the huddle the flutter the bustle the escape the alarm and the mock alarm the prettinesses heightened by consternation the courtier's fear which was flattery and the lady's which was affectation all that we may conceive to have taken place in a mob of brighton courtiers sympathizing with the well-acted surprise of their sovereign all this and no more is exhibited by the well-dressed lords and ladies in the hall of belus just this sort of consternation we have seen among a flock of disquieted wild geese at the report only of a gun having gone off but is this vulgar fright this mere animal anxiety for the preservation of their persons such as we have witnessed at a theatre when a slight alarm of fire has been given an adequate exponent of a supernatural terror the way in which the finger of god writing judgments would have been met by the withered conscience there is a human fear and a divine fear the one is disturbed restless and bent upon escape the other is bowed down effortless passive when the spirit appeared before eliphaz in the visions of the night and the hair of his flesh stood up was it in the thoughts of the tamanite to ring the bell of his chamber or to call up the servants but let us see in the text what there is to justify all this huddle of vulgar consternation from the words of daniel it appears that belshazzar had made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand the golden and silver vessels are gorgeously enumerated with the princes the king's concubines and his wives then follows in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosened and his knees smote one against another this is the plain text by no hint can it be otherwise inferred but that the appearance was solely confined to the fancy of belshazzar that his single brain was troubled 
not a word is spoken of its being seen by any else there present, not even by the Queen herself, who merely undertakes for the interpretation of the phenomenon as related to her, doubtless, by her husband. The lords are simply said to be astonished, i.e., at the trouble and the change of countenance in their sovereign. Even the prophet does not appear to have seen the scroll which the king saw. He recalls it only, as Joseph did the dream to the king of Egypt. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, the Lord, and this writing was written. He speaks of the phantasm as past. Then what becomes of this needless multiplication of the miracle, this message to a royal conscience singly expressed, for it was said, Thy kingdom is divided, simultaneously impressed upon the fancies of a thousand courtiers, who were implied in it neither directly nor grammatically. But admitting the artist's own version of the story, and that the sight was seen also by the thousand courtiers, let it have been visible to all Babylon, as the knees of Belshazzar were shaken, and his countenance troubled, even so would the knees of every man in Babylon, and their countenances as of an individual man, been troubled bowed, bent down, so would they have remained, stupefixed, with no thought of struggling with that inevitable judgment. Not all that is optically possible to be seen is to be shown in every picture. The eye delightedly dwells upon the brilliant individualities in a marriage at Cana by Veronese, or Titian, to the very texture and colour of the wedding garments, the ring glittering upon the bride's fingers, the metal and fashion of the wine-pots, for at such seasons there is leisure and luxury to be curious. But in a day of judgment, or in the day of lesser horrors yet divine, as at the impious feast of Belshazzar, the eye should see, as the actual eye of an agent or patient in the immediate scene would see, only in masses and in distinction. Not only the female attire and jewellery exposed to the critical eye of the fashion as minutely as the dresses in a lady's magazine in the criticised picture, but perhaps the curiosities of anatomical science and studied diversities of posture in the falling angels and sinners of Michelangelo have no business in their great subjects. There was no leisure of them. By a wise falsification, the great masters of painting got at their true conclusions by not showing the actual appearances, that is, all that was to be seen at any given moment by an indifferent eye, but only what the eye might be supposed to see in the doing or suffering of some portentous action. Suppose the moment of the swallowing up of Pompeii. There they were to be seen, houses, columns, architectural proportions, differences of public and private buildings, men and women at their standing occupations, the diversified thousand postures, attitudes, dresses, in some confusion, truly, but physically they were visible but what eye saw them 
at that eclipsing moment which reduces confusion to a kind of unity and when the senses are upturned from their proprieties when sight and hearing are a feeling only a thousand years have passed and we are at leisure to contemplate the weaver fixed standing at his shuttle the baker at his oven and to turn over with antiquarian coolness the pots and pans of pompey son stand thou still upon gibeah and thou moon in the valley of ajalon who in reading this magnificent hebraism in his conception sees aught but the heroic son of nun with the outstretched arm and the greater and lesser light obsequious doubtless there were to be seen hill and dale and chariots and horsemen on open plain or winding by secret defiles and all the circumstances and stratagems of war but whose eyes would have been conscious of this array of the interposition of the synchronic miracle yet in the picture of this subject by the artist of the belshazzar's feast no ignoble work either the marshalling and landscape of the war is everything the miracle sinks into an anecdote of the day and the eye may dart through rank and file traverse for some minutes before it shall discover among his armed followers which is joshua not modern art alone but ancient where only it is to be found if anywhere can be detected erring from defect of this imaginative faculty the world has nothing to show of the preternatural in painting transcending the figure of lazarus bursting his grave clothes in the great picture at angerstein's it seems a thing between two beings a ghastly horror at itself struggles with newly apprehending gratitude at second life bestowed it cannot forget that it was a ghost it has hardly felt that it is a body it has to tell of the world of spirits was it from a feeling that the crowd of half impassioned bystanders and the still more irrelevant herd of passers-by at a distance who have not heard or but faintly have been told of the passing miracle admirable as they are in design and hue for it is a glorified work do not respond adequately to the action that the single figure of the lazarus has been attributed to michael angelo and the mighty sebastian unfairly robbed of the fame of the greater half of the interest now that there were not indifferent passers-by within actual scope of the eyes of those present at the miracle to whom the sound of it had but faintly or not at all reached it would be hardihood to deny but would they see them or can the mind in the conception of it admit of such unconcerning objects can it think of them at all or what associating league to the imagination can there be between the seers and the seers not of a presential miracle were an artist to paint upon demand a picture of a dryad we will ask whether in the present low state of expectation the patron would not or ought not to be fully satisfied with a beautiful naked figure recumbent under wide-stretched oaks deceit those woods and place the same figure 
among fountains and falls of pellucid water, and you have a naiad. Not so in a rough print we have seen after Giulio Romano, we think, for it is long since, there, by no process, with mere change of scene, could the figure have reciprocated characters, long, grotesque, fantastic, yet with a grace of her own, beautiful in convolution and distortion, linked to her connatural tree, co-twisting with its limbs her own, till both seemed either these animated branches, those disanimated members, yet the animal and vegetable lives sufficiently kept distinct. His dryad lay, an approximation of two natures which to conceive it must be seen, analogous to, and not the same with, the delicacies of Ovidian transformations. To the lowest subjects, and to a superficial comprehension, the most barren, the great masters gave loftiness and fruitfulness. The large eye of genius saw in the meanness of present objects their capabilities of treatment from their relations to some grand past or future. How has a Raphael, we must still linger about the Vatican, treated the humble craft of the shipbuilder in his building of the ark? It is in that scriptural series to which we have referred, and which, judging from some fine, rough, old graphic sketches of them which we possess, seem to be of a higher and more poetic grade than even the cartoons. The dim of sight are the timid and the shrinking. There is a cowardice in modern art. As the Frenchman, of whom Coleridge's friend made the prophetic guess at Rome from the beard and horns of the Moses of Michelangelo, collected no inferences beyond that of a he-goat and a cornuto. So, from this subject, of mere mechanic promise, it would instinctively turn away, as from one incapable of investiture with any grandeur. The dockyards at Woolwich would object derogatory associations. The depot at Chatham would be the moat and the beam in its intellectual eye, but not to the nautical preparations in the shipyards of Sibita Vecchia did Raphael look for instructions, when he imagined the building of the vessel that was to be conservatory of the wrecks of the species of drowned mankind. In the intensity of the action he keeps ever out of sight the meanness of the operation. There is the patriarch in calm forethought and with holy prescience giving directions, and there are his agents, the solitary but sufficient three, hewing, soaring every one with the might and earnestness of a demiurgus, under some instinctive rather than technical guidance, giant-muscled, every one a Hercules, or liker to those Vulcanian three that in sounding caverns under Mungi Bello wrought in fire, Brontes, and Black Steropes, and Pirachmon. So work the workman that should repair a world. Artists again err in the confounding of poetic with pictorial subjects. In the latter, the exterior accidents are nearly everything, 
the unseen qualities as nothing. Othello's colour, the infirmities and corpulence of a Sir John Falstaff, do they haunt us perpetually in the reading? or are they obtruded upon our conceptions one time for ninety-nine that we are lost in admiration at the respective moral or intellectual attributes of the character but in a picture othello is always a blackamoor and the other only plump jack deeply corporealized and enchained hopelessly in the grovelling fetters of externality must be the mind to which in its better moments the image of the high-souled high-intelligenced quixote the errant star of knighthood made more tender by eclipse has never presented itself divested from the unhallowed accompaniment of a Sancho, or a rabblement, at the heels of a Rosinante. That man has read his book by halves. He has laughed, mistaking his author's purport, which was tears. The artist that pictures Quixote, and it is in this degrading point, that he is every season held up at our exhibitions, in the shallow hope of exciting mirth, would have joined the rabble at the heels of his starved steed. We wish not to see that counterfeited, which we would not have wished to see in the reality. Conscious of the heroic inside of the noble Quixote, who, on hearing that his withered person was passing would have stepped over his threshold to gaze upon his forlorn habiliments and the strange bedfellows which misery brings a man acquainted with shade of cervantes who in thy second part could put into the mouth of thy quixote those high aspirations of a super-chivalrous gallantry, where he replies to one of the shepherdesses, apprehensive that he would spoil their pretty networks, and inviting him to be a guest with them, in accents like these. Truly, fairest lady, Acteon was not more astonished when he saw Diana bathing herself at the fountain than I have been in beholding your beauty. I commend the manner of your pastime, and thank you for your kind offers, and if I may serve you, so I may be sure you will be obeyed, you may command me. For my profession is this, to show myself thankful, and a doer of good to all sorts of people, especially of the rank that your person shows you to be, and if those nets, as they take up but a little piece of ground, should take up the whole world, I would seek out new worlds to pass through, rather than break them. And, he adds, that you may give credit to this my exaggeration, behold at least he that promiseth you this is don quixote de la mancha if haply this name hath come to your hearing illustrious romancer were the fine frenzies which possessed the brain of thy own quixote a fit subject as in this second part to be exposed to the jeers of duennas and serving men, to be monstered and shown up at the heartless banquets of great men, was that pitiable infirmity which in thy first part misleads him, always from within, into half ludicrous but more than half compassionable and admirable errors not infliction enough from heaven 
that men by studied artifices must devise and practice upon the humour to inflame where they should soothe it why goneril would have blushed to practice upon the abdicated king at this rate and the she-wolf regan not have endured to play the pranks upon his fled wits which thou hast made thy quixote suffer in duchess's halls and at the hands of that unworthy nobleman footnote yet from this second part our cried up pictures are mostly selected the waiting women with beards etc in the first adventures even it needed all the art of the most consummate artist in the book way that the world hath yet seen to keep up in the mind of the reader the heroic attributes of the character without relaxing so as absolutely that they shall suffer no alloy from the debasing fellowship of the clown if it ever obtrudes itself as a disharmony are we inclined to laugh or not rather to indulge a contrary emotion cervantes stung perchance by the relish with which his reading public had received the fooleries of the man more to their palates than the generosities of the master in the sequel let his pen run riot lost the harmony and the balance and sacrificed a great idea to the taste of his contemporaries we know that in the present day the knight has fewer admirers than the squire anticipating what did actually happen to him as afterwards it did to his scarce inferior follower the author of guzman de alfarash that some less knowing hand would prevent him by a spurious second part and judging that it would be easier for his competitor to outbid him in the comicalities than in the romance of his work he abandoned his knight and has fairly set up the squire for his hero for what else has he unsealed the eyes of sancho and instead of that twilight state of semi-insanity the madness at second hand the contagion caught from a stronger mind infected that war between native cunning and hereditary deference with which he has hitherto accompanied his master two for a pair almost does he substitute a downright knave with open eyes for his own ends only following a confessed madman and offering at one time to lay if not actually laying hands upon him from the moment that sancho loses his reverence don quixote is become a treatable lunatic our artists handle him accordingly essay nineteen of the last essays of elia by charles lamb this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Tony Addison Rejoicings upon the New Year's coming of age The old year being dead, and the New Year coming of age, which he does by calendar law, as soon as the breath is out of the old gentleman's body, nothing would serve the young spark, but he must give a dinner upon the occasion, to which all the days in the year were invited. The festivals, whom he deputed as his stewards, 
were mightily taken with the notion. They had been engaged time out of mind, they said, in providing mirth and good cheer for mortals below, and it was time they should have a taste of their own bounty. It was stiff the debated among them whether the fasts should be admitted. Some said the appearance of such lean, starved guests with their mortified faces would pervert the ends of the meeting. But the objection was overruled by Christmas Day, who had a design upon Ash Wednesday, as you shall hear, and a mighty desire to see how the old Domine would behave himself in his cups. Only the vigils were requested to come with their lanterns to light the gentlefolks home at night. All the days came to their day. Covers were provided for three hundred and sixty-five guests at the principal table, with an occasional knife and fork at the sideboard for the twenty-ninth of February. I should have told you that cards of invitation had been issued. The carriers were the hours, twelve little merry whirligig foot-pages, as you should desire to see, that went all round and found out the persons invited well enough, with the exception of Easter Day, Shrove Tuesday, and a few such movables who had lately shifted their quarters. Well, they all met at last, foul days, fine days, all sorts of days, and a rare din they made of it. There was nothing but hail, fellow day, well met, brother day, sister day, only lady day kept a little on the aloof and seemed somewhat scornful. Yet some said twelfth day cut her out and out, for she came in a Tiffany suit, white and gold, like a queen on a frost-cake, all royal, glittering, and epiphanous. The rest came, some in green, some in white, but old Lent and his family were not yet out of mourning. Rainy days came in dripping, and sunshiny days helped them to change their stockings. Wedding day was there in his marriage finery, a little the worse for wear. Pay day came late, as he always does, and Doom's day sent word he might be expected. April Fool, as my young lord's jester, took upon himself to marshal the guests, and wild work he made with it. It would have posed old Era Pater to have found out any given day in the year to erect a scheme upon. Good days, bad days, were so shuffled together to the confounding of all sober horoscopy. He had stuck the 21st of June next to the 22nd of December, and the former looked like a maypole, siding a marrow-bone. Ash Wednesday got wedged in, as was concerted, betwixt Christmas and Lord Mayor's days. Lord! How he laid about him! Nothing but barons of beef and turkeys would go down with him, to the great greasing and detriment of his new sackcloth bib and tucker and still Christmas Day was at his elbow, plying him the wassail bowl till he roared and hiccuped and protested there was no faith in dried ling, but commended it to the devil for a sour, windy, acrimonious, censorious, hypocritical mess, and no dish for a gentleman. Then he dipped his fist into the middle of the great custard that stood before his left-hand neighbour, and daubed his hungry beard all over with it, till you would have taken him for the last day in December. It so hung in icicles. At another part of the table, 
Shrove Tuesday was helping the second of September to some cock broth, which courtesy the latter returned with the delicate thigh of a hen pheasant, so there was no love lost for that matter. The last of Lent was sponging upon Shrove Tide's pancakes, which April Fool perceiving, told him he did well, for pancakes were proper to a good fry day. <laughs> In another part, a hubbub arose about the 30th of January, who, it seems, being a sour puritanic character, that thought nobody's meat good or sanctified enough for him, had smuggled into the room a calf's head, which he had had cooked at home for that purpose, thinking to feast thereon incontinently. But as it lay in the dish, March Manyweathers, who is a very fine lady, and subject to the megrims, screamed out, There was a human head in the platter, and raved about Herodias' daughter to that degree that the obnoxious viand was obliged to be removed. Nor did she recover her stomach till she had gulped down a restorative, confected of oak apple, which the merry twenty-ninth of May always carries about with him for that purpose. The king's health, the late king, being called for after this, a notable dispute arose between the twelfth of August, a zealous old Whig gentlewoman, and the twenty-third of April, a new-fangled lady of the Tory stamp, as to which of them should have the honour to propose it. August grew hot upon the matter, affirming time out of mind the prescriptive right to have lain with her till her rival had basely supplanted her, whom she represented as little better than a kept mistress, who went about in fine clothes, while she, the legitimate birthday, had scarcely a rag, etc., April Fool, being made mediator, confirmed the right in the strongest form of words to the appellant, but decided for peace sake that the exercise of it should remain with the present possessor. At the same time, he slyly rounded the first lady in the ear that an action might lie against the crown for bigany. It beginning to grow a little duskish, a candle mass, a lustily bawled out for lights, which was opposed by all the days, who protested against burning daylight. Then fair water was handed round in silver ewers, and the same lady was observed to take an unusual time in washing herself. May Day with that sweetness which is peculiar to her, in a neat speech proposing the health of the founder, crowned her goblet, and by her example the rest of the company, with garlands. This being done, the lordly new year, from the upper end of the table, in a cordial but somewhat lofty tone, returned thanks. He felt proud, on an occasion of meeting so many of his worthy father's late tenants, promised to improve their farms, and at the same time to abate, if anything was found unreasonable, in their rents. At the mention of this, the four quarter-days involuntarily looked at each other and smiled. April Fool, whistled to an old tune of new brooms, and a surly old rebel at the farther end of the table, who was discovered to be no other than the fifth of November, muttered out distinctly enough to be heard by the whole company words to this effect, that when the old one is gone, he is a fool that looks for a better. Which rudeness of his the guests resenting, unanimously voted his expulsion, and the malcontent 
was thrust out neck and heels into the cellar, as the properest place for such a boot for and firebrand as he had shown himself to be. Order being restored, the young lord, who, uh, to say truth, had been a little ruffled and put beside his oratory, in as few and yet as obliging words as possible, assured them of entire welcome, and, with a graceful turn, singling out poor twenty-ninth of February, that had sat all this while mum chance at the sideboard, begged to couple his health with that of the good company before him, which he drank accordingly, observing that he had not seen his honest face any time in these four years, with a number of endearing expressions besides. At the same time, removing the solitary day from the forlorn seat which had been assigned him, he stationed him at his own board, somewhere between the Greek calends and a latter Lamus. Ash a Wednesday, a being now called upon for a song, with his eyes fast stuck in his head, and as well as the canary he had swallowed would give him leave, struck up a carol, which Christmas Day had taught him for the nonce, and was followed by the latter, who gave miserere in fine style, hitting off the mumping notes and lengthened drawl of old mortification with infinite humour. April Fool swore they had exchanged conditions, but Good Friday was observed to look extremely grave, and Sunday held her fan before her face, that she might not be seen to smile. Shrovetide, Lord Mayor's Day, and April Fool next joined in a glee, which is the properest day to drink, in which all the days chiming in made a merry burden. They next fell to quibbles and conundrums, the question being proposed, who had the greatest number of followers? The quarter day said there could be no question as to that, for they had all the creditors in the world dogging their heels, but April Fool gave it in favour of the forty days before Easter, because the debtors in all cases outnumbered the creditors, and they kept Lent all the year. All this while, Valentine's Day kept courting pretty May, who sat next him, slipping amorous billet doux under the table, till the dog-days, who were naturally of a warm constitution, began to be jealous, and to bark and rage exceedingly. April Fool, who likes a bit of sport above measure, and had some pretensions to the lady besides, as being but a cousin once removed, clapped and hallooed them on, and as fast as their indignation cooled, those mad wags, the ember days, were at it with their bellows to blow it into a flame, and all was in a ferment, till old Madame Septuagesima, who boasts herself the mother of the days, wisely diverted the conversation with a tedious tale of the lovers which she could reckon when she was young, and of one Master Rogation Day in particular, who was for ever putting the question to her, but she kept him at a distance, as the chronicle would tell, by which I apprehend she meant the almanac. Then she rambled on to the days that were gone, the good old days, and so to the days before the flood, which plainly showed her old head to be little better than crazed and doited. Day being ended, the days called for their cloaks and greatcoats, and took their leaves. Lord Mayor's Day went off in a mist, as usual, shortest day in a deep black fog that wrapped the little gentleman all round like a hedgehog. Two vigils, so watchmen are called in heaven, saw Christmas Day safe home. They had been used to the business before. Another vigil, 
a stout, sturdy patrole, called the Eve of St. Christopher, seeing Ash Wednesday in a condition a little better than he should be, e'en whipped him over his shoulders pick-a-back fashion, and old mortification went floating home, singing, On the bat's back do I fly, and a number of old snatches besides, between drunk and sober, but very few aves or penitentiaries, you may believe me, were among them. Longest day set off westward in beautiful crimson and gold, the rest some in one fashion, some in another, but Valentine and Pretty May took their departure together in one of the prettiest silvery twilights. Essay twenty of the last essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Wedding. I do not know when I have been better pleased than at being invited last week to be present at the wedding of a friend's daughter. I like to make one of these ceremonies, which to us old people give back our youth in a manner, and restore our gayest season, in the remembrance of our own success, or the regrets, scarcely less tender, of our own youthful disappointments in this point of a settlement. On these occasions I am sure to be in good humour for a week or two after, and enjoy a reflected honeymoon. Being without a family, I am flattered with these temporary adoptions into a friend's family. I feel a sort of cousinhood or uncleship for the season. I am inducted into degrees of affinity, and in the participated socialities of the little community I lay down for a brief while my solitary bachelorship. I carry this humour so far that I take it unkindly to be left out, even when a funeral is going on in the house of a dear friend. But uh, to my subject. The union itself had been long settled, but its celebration had been hitherto deferred to an almost unreasonable state of suspense in the lovers by some invincible prejudices which the bride's father had unhappily contracted upon the subject of the two early marriages of females. He has been lecturing any time these five years, for to that length the courtship has been protracted, upon the propriety of putting off the solemnity till the lady should have completed her five-and-twentieth year. We all began to be afraid that a suit which, as yet, had abated of none of its ardours, might at last be lingered on till passion had time to cool and love go out in the experiment. But a little wheedling on the part of his wife, who was by no means a party to these overstrained notions, joined to some serious expostulations on that of his friends, who, from the growing infirmities of the old gentleman, could not promise ourselves many years' enjoyment of his company, and were anxious to bring matters to a conclusion during his lifetime, at length prevailed. And on Monday last the daughter of my old friend, Admiral Croft, 
having attained the womanly age of nineteen, was conducted to the church by her pleasant cousin John, who told some few years older. Before the youthful part of my female readers express their indignation at the abominable loss of time occasioned to the lovers by the preposterous notions of my old friend, they will do well to consider the reluctance which a fond parent naturally feels at parting with his child. To this unwillingness, I believe, in most cases, may be traced the difference of opinion on this point between child and parent, whatever pretenses of interest or prudence may be held out to cover it. The hard-heartedness of fathers is a fine theme for romance writers, a sure and moving topic, but is there not something untender to say no more of it, in the hurry which a beloved child is sometimes in, to tear herself from the parental stock, and commit herself to strange graftings? The case is heightened, where the lady, as in the present instance, happens to be an only child. I do not understand these matters experimentally, but I can make a shrewd guess at the wounded pride of a parent upon these occasions. It is no new observation, I believe, that a lover in most cases has no rival so much to be feared as the father. Certainly, there is a jealousy in unparalleled subjects, which is little less heart-rending than the passion which we more strictly christen by that name. Mothers' scruples are more easily got over, for this reason, I suppose, that the protection transferred to a husband is less a derogation and a loss to their authority than to the paternal. Mothers, besides, have a trembling foresight which paints the inconveniences impossible to be conceived in the same degree by the other parent of a life of forlorn celibacy, which the refusal of a tolerable match may entail upon their child. Mother's instinct is a surer guide here than the cold reasonings of a father on such a topic. To this instinct may be imputed, and by it alone may be excused, the unbeseeming artifices by which some wives push on the matrimonial projects of their daughters, which the husband, however approving, shall entertain with comparative indifference. A little shamelessness on this head is pardonable, with this explanation, a forwardness becomes a grace, and maternal importunity receives the name of a virtue. But the parson stays, while I preposterously assume his office. I am preaching, while the bride is on the threshold. Uh, nor let any of my female readers suppose that the sage reflections which have just escaped me have the obliquest tendency of application to the young lady, who, it will be seen, is about to venture upon a change in her condition at a mature and competent age, and not without the fullest approbation of all parties. I only deprecate very hasty marriages. It had been fixed that the ceremony should be gone through at an early hour, to give time for a little déjeuner afterwards, to which a select party of friends had been invited. We were in church a little before the clock struck eight. Nothing could be more judicious or graceful than the dress of the bridesmaids, the three charming Miss Foresters on this morning. 
to give the bride an opportunity of shining singly. They had come habited all in green. I am ill at describing female apparel, but while she stood at the altar, investments white and candid as her thoughts, a sacrificial whiteness, they assisted in robes such as might become Diana's nymphs, foresters indeed, as such who had not yet come to the resolution of putting off cold virginity. These young maids, not being so blessed as to have a mother living, I am told, keep single for their father's sake, and live altogether so happy with their remaining parent, that the hearts of their lovers are ever broken with the prospect, so inauspicious to their hopes, of such uninterrupted and provoking home comfort. Gallant girls, each a victim worthy of Iphigenia. I do not know what business I have to be present in solemn places. I cannot divest me of an unseasonable disposition to levity upon the most awful occasions. I was never cut out for a public functionary. Ceremony and I have long shaken hands but I could not resist the importunities of the young lady's father, whose gout unhappily confined him at home, to act as parent on this occasion, and give away the bride. Something ludicrous occurred to me at this most serious of all moments, a sense of my unfitness to have the disposal even in imagination of the sweet young creature beside me. I fear I was betrayed to some likeness, for the awful eye of the parson, and the rector's eye of St. Mildred's in the poultry, is no trifle of a rebuke, was upon me in an instant, souring my incipient jest to the trustful severities of a funeral. This was the only misbehaviour which I can plead to upon this solemn occasion, unless what was objected to me after the ceremony by one of the handsome Miss Tilneys be accounted a solecism. She was pleased to say that she had never seen a gentleman before me give away a bride in black. Now black has been my ordinary apparel so long. Indeed, I take it to be the proper costume of an author, the stage sanctions it, that to have appeared in some lighter colour would have raised more mirth at my expense than the anomaly had created censure. But I could perceive that the bride's mother and some elder ladies present God bless them, would have been well content if I had come in any other colour than that. But I got over the omen by a lucky apologue, which I remembered out of Pilpe, or some Indian author, of all the birds being invited to the linnet's wedding, at which, when all the rest came in their gayest feathers, the raven alone apologised for his cloak, because he had no other. This tolerably reconciled the elders, but with the young people all was merriment, and shakings of hands, and congratulations, and kissing away the bride's tears, and kissings from her in return, till a young lady, who assumed some experience in these matters, having worn the nuptial band some four or five weeks longer than her friend, rescued her, archly observing, with half an eye upon the bridegroom, that at this rate she would have none left. My friend the Admiral was in fine wig and buckle on this occasion, a striking contrast to his usual neglect of personal appearance. He did not once shove up his borrowed locks. 
his custom ever at his morning studies, to betray the few grey stragglers of his own beneath them. He wore an aspect of thoughtful satisfaction. I trembled for the hour which at length approached, when, after a protracted breakfast of three hours, if stores of cold fowls, tongs, hams, botargos, dried fruits, wines, cordials, etc., can deserve so meagre an appellation. The coach was announced, which was come to carry off the bride and bridegroom for a season, as custom has sensibly ordained, into the country, upon which design, wishing them a felicitous journey, let us return to the assembled guests. As when a well-graced actor leaves the stage, the eyes of men are idly bent on him that enters next. So idly did we bend our eyes upon one another when the chief performers in the morning's pageant had vanished. None told his tale, none sipped her glass. The poor admiral made an effort. It was not much. I had anticipated so far. Even the infinity of full satisfaction that had betrayed itself through the prim looks and quiet deportment of his lady began to wane into something of misgiving. No one knew whether to take their leaves or stay. We seemed assembled upon a silly occasion. In this crisis, betwixt a tarrying and departure, I must do justice to a foolish talent of mine, which had otherwise liked to have brought me into disgrace in the forepart of the day. I mean a power in any emergency, of thinking and giving vent to all manner of strange nonsense. In this awkward dilemma I found it sovereign. I rattled off some of my most excellent absurdities. All were willing to be relieved, at any expense of reason, from the pressure of the intolerable vacuum which had succeeded to the morning bustle. By this means I was fortunate in keeping together the better part of the company to a late hour, and a rubber of whist, the admiral's favourite game, with some rare strokes of chance as well as skill, which came opportunely on his side, lengthened out till midnight, dismissed the old gentleman at last to his bed with comparatively easy spirits. I have been at my old friend's various times since. I do not know a visiting place where every guest is so perfectly at his ease, nowhere where harmony is so strangely the result of confusion. Everybody is at cross-purposes, yet the effect is so much better than uniformity. Contradictory orders, servants pulling one way, master and mistress driving some other, yet both diverse, visitors huddled up in corners, chairs unsymmetrized, candles disposed by chance, meals at odd hours, tea and supper at once, or the latter preceding the former the host and the guest conferring, yet each upon a different topic, each understanding himself, neither trying to understand or hear the other. Drafts and politics, chess and political economy, cards and conversation on nautical matters going on at once, without the hope or indeed the wish of distinguishing them make it altogether the most perfect concordia discourse you shall meet with. Yet somehow the old house is not quite what it should be. The admiral still enjoys his pipe, but he has no Miss Emily to fill it for him. The instrument stands where it stood, but she is gone whose delicate touch could sometimes, for a short minute, appease the warring elements. He has learnt, as Marvel expresses it, to make 
his destiny his choice. He bears bravely up, but he does not come out with his flashes of wild wit so thick as formerly. His sea-songs seldomer escape him. His wife, too, looks as if she wanted some younger body to scold and set to rights. We all miss a junior presence. It is wonderful how one young maiden freshens up and keeps green the paternal roof. Old and young seem to have an interest in her, so long as she is not absolutely disposed of. The youthfulness of the Essay 21 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Child Angel. A Dream. I chanced upon the prettiest, oddest, fantastical thing of a dream the other night that you shall hear of. I had been reading The Loves of the Angels, and went to bed with my head full of speculations suggested by that extraordinary legend. It had given birth to innumerable conjectures, and I remember the last waking thought which I gave expression to on my pillow was a sort of wonder what could come of it. I was suddenly transported, how or whither I could scarcely make out, but to some celestial region. It was not the real heavens, neither, not the downright Bible heaven, but a kind of fairyland heaven, about which a poor human fancy may have leave to sport and air itself, I will hope, without presumption. Methought what wild things dreams are i was present at what would you imagine at an angel's gossiping whence it came or how it came or who bid it come or whether it came purely of its own head neither you nor i know but there lay sure enough wrapped in its little cloudy swaddling bands a child angel sun threads filmy beams ran through the celestial napery of what seemed its princely cradle all the winged orders hovered round watching when the new-born should open its yet closed eyes which when it did first one and then the other with a solicitude and apprehension yet not such as stained with fear dims the expanding eyelids of mortal infants but as if to explore its path in those its unhereditary palaces what an inextinguishable titter that time spared not celestial visages nor wanted there to my seeming oh the inexplicable simpleness of dreams bowls of that cheering nectar which mortals caudle call below nor were wanting faces of female ministrants stricken in years as it might seem so dexterous were those heavenly attendants to counterfeit kindly similitudes of earth to greet with terrestrial child rites the young present which earth hath made to heaven then were celestial harpings heard not in full symphony as those by which the spheres are tutored but 
as loudest instruments on earth speak, oftentimes muffled, so to accommodate their sound the better to the weak ears of the imperfect born. And with the noise of those subdued soundings, the angelette sprang forth, fluttering its rudiments of pinions, but forthwith flagged, and was recovered into the arms of those full-winged angels. And a wonder it was to see how, as years went round in heaven, a year in dreams is as a day, continually its white shoulders put forth buds of wings, but wanting the perfect angelic nutriment, anon was shorn of its aspiring, and fell fluttering, still caught by angel hands, for ever to put forth shoots, and to fall fluttering, because its birth was not of the unmixed vigour of heaven. And a name was given to the babe angel, and it was to be called Gay Urania, because its production was of earth and heaven. And it could not taste of death, by reason of its adoption into immortal palaces, but it was to no weakness and reliance and the shadow of human imbecility, and it went with a lame gait, but in its goings it exceeded all mortal children in grace and swiftness. Then pity first sprang up in angelic bosoms, and yearnings like the human touched them at the sight of the immortal lame one. And with pain did then first those intuitive essences with pain and strife to their natures, not grief, put back their bright intelligences and reduce their ethereal minds schooling them to degrees and slower processes, so to adapt their lessons to the gradual illumination, as must needs be, of the half-earth born, and what intuitive notices they could not repel, by reason that their nature is to know all things at once, the half heavenly novice, by the better part of its nature, aspired to receive into its understanding, so that humility and aspiration went on even paced in the instruction of the glorious amphibium. But by reason that mature humanity is too gross to breathe the air of that super-subtle region, its portion was, and is, to be a child for ever. And because the human part of it might not press into the heart and inwards of the palace of its adoption, those full-natured angels tended it by turns in the purlieus of the palace, where were shady groves and rivulets like this green earth from which it came, so love, with voluntary humility, waited upon the entertainment of the new adopted. And myriads of years rolled round, in dreams time is nothing, and still it kept and is to keep perpetual childhood, and is the tutor a genius of childhood upon earth, and still goes lame and lovely. By the banks of the river Pison is seen, lone sitting by the grave of the terrestrial Adar, whom the angel Nadia loved, a child, 
but not the same which I saw in heaven. A mournful hue overcasts its lineaments. Nevertheless, a correspondency is between the child by the grave and that celestial orphan whom I saw above. And the dimness of the grief upon the heavenly is as a shadow or emblem of that which stains the beauty of the terrestrial. And this correspondency is not to be understood but by dreams. And in the archives of heaven I had grace to read how that once the angel Nadir, being exiled from his place for mortal passion, upspringing on the wings of parental love, such power had parental love for a moment to suspend the else irrevocable law, appeared for a brief instant in his station, and, depositing a wondrous birth, straightway disappeared, and the palaces knew him no more. And this charge was the self-same babe who goeth lame and lovely. But Adar Essay 22 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison A Deathbed In a letter to R. H. Esquire of B. I called upon you this morning, and found that you were gone to visit a dying friend. I had been upon a like errand. Poor N. R. has lain dying now for almost a week. Such is the penalty we pay for having enjoyed through life a strong constitution. Whether he knew me or not, I know not or whether he saw me through his poor glazed eyes. But the group I saw about him I shall not forget. Upon the bed or about it were assembled his wife, their two daughters, and poor deaf Robert, looking doubly stupefied. There they were, and seemed to have been sitting all the week, I could only reach out a hand to Mrs. R. Speaking was impossible in that mute chamber. By this time it must be all over with him. In him I have a loss the world cannot make up. He was my friend, and my father's friend, for all the life that I can remember. I seem to have made foolish friendships since. Those are the friendships which outlast a second generation. Old as I am getting, in his eyes I was still the child he knew me. To the last he called me Jemmy. I have none to call me Jemmy now. He was the last link that bound me to be. You are but of yesterday. In him I seem to have lost the old plainness of manners and singleness of heart. A lettered he was not. His reading scarcely exceeded the obituary of the old gentleman's magazine, to which he has never failed of having recourse for these last fifty years. Yet there was the pride of literature about him from that slender perusal, and, moreover, from his office of archive-keeper to your ancient city, in which he must needs pick up some equivocal Latin, which, among his less literary friends, 
assume the air of a very pleasant pedantry? Can I forget the erudite look with which, having tried to puzzle out the text of a black-lettered Chaucer in your corporation library, to which he was a sort of librarian, he gave it up with this consolatory reflection. Jemmy, said he, I do not know what you find in these very old books, but I observe there is a deal of very indifferent spelling in them. His jokes, for he had some, are ended, but they were old perennials, staple, and always as good as new. He had one song that spake of the flat bottoms of our foes coming over in darkness, and alluded to a threatened invasion many years since blown over. This he reserved to be sung on Christmas night, which we always passed with him, and he sung it with the freshness of an impending event. How his eyes would sparkle when he came to the passage. We'll still make em run, and we'll still make em sweat, in spite of the devil and Brussels Gazette. What is the Brussels Gazette now, I cry, while I indict these trifles? His poor girls, who are, I believe, compact of solid goodness, will have to receive their afflicted mother at an unsuccessful home in a petty village in Wiltshire, where for years they have been struggling to raise a girl's school with no effect. Poor deaf Robert, and the less hopeful for being so, is thrown upon a deaf world without the comfort to his father on his deathbed of knowing him provided for. They are left almost provisionless. Some life assurance there is, but, I fear, not exceeding so much. Their hopes must be from your corporation, which their father has served for fifty years, who or what are your leading members now, I know not. Is there any to whom, without impertinence, you can represent the true circumstances of the family? You cannot say good enough of poor R. and his poor wife. Oblige me. Essay 23 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Old China. I have an almost feminine partiality for old China. When I go to see any great house, I inquire for the china closet, and next for the picture gallery. I cannot defend the order of preference, but by saying that we have all some taste or other of too ancient a date to admit of our remembering distinctly that it was an acquired one. I can call to mind the first play and the first exhibition that I was taken to, but I am not conscious of a time when china jars and saucers were introduced into my imagination. I had no repugnance then, but why should I now have, to those little lawless, azure, tinctured grotesques, that under the notion of men and women float about, uncircumscribed by any element, in that world before perspective, a china teacup. 
I like to see my old friends, whom distance cannot diminish, figuring up in the air, so they appear to our optics, yet on terror firmer still, for so we must in courtesy interpret that speck of deeper blue which the decorous artist, to prevent absurdity, has made to spring up beneath their sandals. I love the men with women's faces, and the women, if possible, with still more womanish expressions. Here is a young and courtly mandarin, handing tea to a lady from a salver two miles off. See how distance seems to set off respect, and here the same lady or another, for likeness is identity on teacups, is stepping into a little fairy boat moored on the hither side of this calm garden river, with a dainty mincing foot, which in a right angle of incidence, as angles go in our world, must infallibly land her in the midst of a flowery mead, a furlong off, on the other side of the same strange stream. Farther on, if far or near, can be predicated of their world, see horses, trees, pagodas, dancing the haze. Here a cow and a rabbit couchant and coextensive, so objects show, seen through the lucid atmosphere of fine Cathay. I was pointing out to my cousin last evening, over our hyson, a which we are old-fashioned enough to drink unmixed still of an afternoon, some of these speciosa mericula, upon a set of extraordinary old blue china, a recent purchase, which we were now for the first time using, and could not help remarking how favourable circumstances had been to us of late years, that we could afford to please the eye sometimes with trifles of this sort, when a passing sentiment seemed to overshade the brows of my companion. I am quick at detecting these summer clouds in Bridget. I wish the good old times would come again, she said, when we were not quite so rich. I do not mean that I want to be poor, but there was a middle state, so she was pleased to ramble on, in which I am sure we were a great deal happier. A purchase is but a purchase, now that you have money enough and to spare. Formerly it used to be a triumph, when we coveted a cheap luxury, and oh, how much ado I had to get you to consent in those times. We were used to have a debate two or three days before, and to weigh the for and against, and think what we might spare it out of, and what saving we could hit upon that should be an equivalent. A thing was worth buying then when we felt the money that we paid for it. Do you remember the brown suit which you made to hang upon you, till all your friends cried shame upon you, it grew so threadbare, and all because of that folio Beaumont and Fletcher which you dragged home late at night from Barker's in Covent Garden? Do you remember how we eyed it for weeks, before we could make up our minds to the purchase, and had not come to a determination till it was near ten o'clock of the Saturday night when you set off from Islington, fearing you should be too late, and when the old bookseller, with some grumbling, opened his shop, and by the twinkling taper, for he was setting bedwards, lighted out the relic from his dusty treasures, and when you lugged it home, wishing it were twice as cumbersome, and when you presented it to me, and when we were exploring the perfectness of it, collating, you called it, 
and while I was repairing some of the loose leaves with paste, which your impatience would not suffer to be left till daybreak, was there no pleasure in being a poor man? Or can those neat black clothes which you wear now, and are so careful to keep brushed, since we have become rich and finical, give you half the honest vanity with which you flaunted it about in that overworn suit your old corbeau for four or five weeks longer than you should have done to pacify your conscience for the mighty sum of fifteen or sixteen shillings was it a great affair we thought it then which you had lavished on the old folio now you can afford to buy any book that pleases you but i do not see that you ever bring me home any nice old purchases now when you come home with twenty apologies for laying out a less number of shillings upon that print after leonardo which we christened the lady blanche when you looked at the purchase and thought of the money and thought of the money and looked again at the picture was there no pleasure in being a poor man now you have nothing to do but to walk into Kalnagi's and buy a wilderness of leonardo's yet do you then do you remember our pleasant walks to enfield and potter's bar and waltham when we had a holiday holidays and all other fun are gone now we are rich and the little hand-basket in which i used to deposit our day's fare of savoury cold lamb and salad and how you would pry about at noontide for some decent house where we might go in and produce our store only paying for the ale that you must call for and speculate upon the looks of the landlady and whether she was likely to allow us a tablecloth and wish for such another honest hostess as isaac walton has described many a one on the pleasant bank of the lee when he went a-fishing and sometimes they would prove obliging enough and sometimes they would look grudgingly upon us but we had cheerful looks still for one another and would eat our plain food savourily, scarcely grudging Piscator his trout hall. Now, when we go out a day's pleasuring, which is seldom, moreover, we ride part of the way, and go into a fine inn, and order the best of dinners, never debating the expense, which, after all, never has half the relish of those chance country snaps when we were at the mercy of uncertain usage and a precarious welcome you are too proud to see a play anywhere now but in the pit do you remember where it was we used to sit when we saw the battle of hexham and the surrender of calais and bannister and mrs bland in the children in the wood when we squeezed out our shillings apiece to sit three or four times in a season in the one shilling gallery where you felt all the time that you ought not to have brought me and more strongly i felt obligation to you for having brought me and the pleasure was the better for a little shame and when the curtain drew up what cared we for our place in the house or what mattered it where we were sitting when our thoughts were with rosalind in arden or with viola at the court of illyria you used to say that the gallery was the best place of all for enjoying a place socially that the relish of such exhibitions must be in proportion to the infrequency of going that the company we met there not being in general readers of plays were obliged to attend the more and did attend to what was going on on the stage because a word lost would have been a chasm which it was impossible for them to fill up 
with such reflections we consoled our pride then and i appeal to you whether as a woman i met generally with less attention and accommodation than i have done since in more expensive situations in the house the getting in indeed and the crowding up those inconvenient staircases was bad enough but there was still a law of civility to women recognized to quite as great an extent as we ever found in the other passages and how a little difficulty overcome heightened the snug seat and the play afterwards now we can only pay our money and walk in you cannot see you say in the galleries now i am sure we saw and heard too well enough then but sight and all i think is gone with our poverty there was pleasure in eating strawberries before they became quite common in the first dish of peas while they were yet dear to have them for a nice supper a treat what treat can we have now if we were to treat ourselves now that is to have dainties a little above our means it would be selfish and wicked it is the very little more that we allow ourselves beyond what the actual poor can get at that makes what i call a treat when two people living together as we have done now and then indulge themselves in a cheap luxury which both like while each apologizes and is willing to take both halves of the blame to his single share i see no harm in people making much of themselves in that sense of the word it may give them a hint how to make much of others but now what i mean by the word we never do make much of ourselves none but the poor can do it i do not mean the veriest poor of all but persons as we were just above poverty i know what you were going to say that it is mighty pleasant at the end of the year to make all meet and much ado we used to have every thirty-first night of december to account for our exceedings many a long face did you make over your puzzled accounts and in contriving to make it out how we had spent so much or that we had not spent so much or that it was impossible we should spend so much next year and still we found our slender capital decreasing but then betwixt ways and projects and compromises of one sort or another and talk of curtailing this charge and doing without that for the future and the hope that youth brings and laughing spirits in which you were never poor till now we pocketed up our loss and in conclusion with lusty brimmers as you used to quote it out of hearty cheerful mr cotton as you called him we used to welcome in the coming guest now we have no reckoning at all at the end of the old year no flattering promises about the new year doing better for us bridget is so sparing of her speech on most occasions that when she gets into a rhetorical vein i am careful how i interrupt it i could not help however smiling at the phantom of wealth which her dear imagination had conjured up out of a clear income of poor so many hundred pounds a year it is true we were happier when we were poorer but we were also younger my cousin i am afraid we must put up with the excess for if we were to shake the superflux into the sea we should not much mend ourselves that we had much to struggle with as we grew up together we have reason to be most thankful it strengthened and knit our compact closer we could never have been what we have been to each other if we had always had the sufficiency which you now complain of the resisting power 
those natural dilations of the youthful spirit which circumstances cannot straighten with us are long since passed away competence to age is supplementary youth a sorry supplement indeed but i fear the best that is to be had we must ride where we formerly walked live better and lie softer and shall be wise to do so than we had means to do in those good old days you speak of yet could those days return could you and i once more walk out thirty miles a day could bannister and mrs bland again be young and you and i be young to see them could the good old one shilling gallery days return they are dreams my cousin now but could you and i at this moment instead of this quiet argument by our well carpeted fireside sitting on this luxurious sofa be once more struggling up those inconvenient staircases pushed about and squeezed and elbowed by the poorest rabble of poor gallery scramblers could i once more hear those anxious shrieks of yours and the delicious thank god we are safe which always followed when the topmost stair conquered let in the first light of the whole cheerful theatre down beneath us i know not the fathom line that ever touched a descent so deep as i would be willing to bury more wealth in than croesus had or the great jew rothschild is supposed to have to purchase it and now do just look at that merry little chinese waiter holding an umbrella big enough for a bed tester over the head of that pretty insipid half madonna ish Essay twenty four, part one of the last essays of a liar by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A recording by Tony Addison. Popular Fallacies One That a bully is always a coward this axiom contains a principle of compensation which disposes us to admit the truth of it but there is no safe trusting to dictionaries and definitions we should more willingly fall in with this popular language if we did not find brutality sometimes awkwardly coupled with valour in the same vocabulary the comic writers with their poetical justice have contributed not a little to mislead us upon this point to see a hectoring fellow exposed and beaten upon the stage has something in it wonderfully diverting some people's share of animal spirits is notoriously low and defective it has not strength to raise a vapour or furnish out the wind of a tolerable bluster these love to be told that huffing is no part of valour the truest courage with them is that which is the least noisy and obtrusive but confront one of these silent heroes with the swaggerer of real life, and his confidence in the theory quickly vanishes. Pretensions do not uniformly bespeak non-performance. A modest, inoffensive deportment does not necessarily imply valour. Neither does the absence of it 
justify us in denying that quality. Hickman wanted modesty. We do not mean him of Clarissa, but who ever doubted his courage? Even the poets, upon whom this equitable distribution of qualities should be most binding, have thought it agreeable to nature to depart from the rule upon occasion. Harapha, in the Agonistes, is indeed a bully upon the received notions. Milton has made him at once a blusterer, a giant, and a dastard. But Almanzor, in Dryden, talks of driving armies singly before him, and does it. Tom Brown had a shrewder insight into this kind of character than either of his predecessors. He divides the palm more equably, and allows his hero a sort of demidiate pre-eminence. Bully Dawson, kicked by half the town, and half the town kicked by Bully Dawson, this was true distributive justice. 2. That ill-gotten gain never prospers. The weakest part of mankind have this saying commonest in their mouth. It is the trite consolation administered to the easy dupe when he has been tricked out of his money or estate, that the acquisition of it will do the owner no good. But the rogues of this world, the prudenter part of them at least, know better. And if the observation had been as true as it is old, would not have failed by this time to have discovered it. They have pretty sharp distinctions of the fluctuating and the permanent. A lightly come, a lightly go, is a proverb which they can very well afford to leave, when they leave little else, to the losers. They do not always find manners, got by a rapine or chicanery, insensibly to melt away, as the poets will have it, or that all gold glides like thawing snow from the thief's hand that grasps it. Church land, alienated to lay uses, was formerly denounced to have this slippery quality. But some portions of it somehow always stuck so fast that the denunciators have been vain to postpone the prophecy of refundment to a late posterity. 3. That a man must not laugh at his own jest. The severest exaction surely ever invented upon the self-denial of poor human nature. This is to expect a gentleman to give a treat without partaking of it, to sit exuriant at his own table, and commend the flavour of his venison upon the absurd strength of his never touching it himself. On the contrary, we love to see a wag taste his own joke to his party, to watch a quirk or a merry conceit flickering upon the lips some seconds before the tongue is delivered of it, if it be good, fresh, and racy, begotten of the occasion, if he that utters it never thought it before, he is naturally the first to be tickled with it and any suppression of such complacence we hold to be churlish and insulting. What does it seem to imply 
but that your company is weak or foolish enough to be moved by an image or a fancy that shall stay you not at all or but faintly this is exactly the humour of the fine gentleman in mandeville who while he dazzles his guests with the display of some costly toy affects himself to see nothing considerable in it four that such a one shows his breeding that it is easy to perceive he is no gentleman a speech from the poorer sort of people which always indicates that the party vituperated is a gentleman the very fact which they deny is that which galls and exasperates them to use this language the forbearance with which it is usually received is a proof what interpretation the bystander sets upon it of akin to this and still less politic are the phrases with which in their street rhetoric they ply one another more grossly he is a poor creature he has not a rag to cover etc though this last we confess is more frequently applied by females to females they do not perceive that the satire glances upon themselves a poor man of all things in the world should not upbraid an antagonist with poverty are there no other topics as to tell him his father was hanged his sister etc without exposing a secret which should be kept snug between them and doing an affront to the order to which they have the honour equally to belong all this while they do not see how the wealthier man stands by and laughs in his sleeve at both five that the poor copy the vices of the rich a smooth text to the latter and preached from the pulpit is sure of a docile audience from the pews lined with satin it is twice sitting upon velvet to a foolish squire to be told that he and not perverse nature as the homilies would make us imagine is the true cause of all the irregularities in his parish this is striking at the root of free will indeed and denying the originality of sin in any sense but men are not such implicit sheep as this comes to if the abstinence from evil on the part of the upper classes is to derive itself from no higher principle than the apprehension of setting ill patterns to the lower we beg leave to discharge them from all squeamishness on that score they may even take their fill of pleasures where they can find them the genius of poverty hampered and straitened as it is is not so barren of invention but it can trade upon the staple of its own vice without drawing upon their capital the poor are not quite such servile imitators as they take them for some of them are very clever artists in their way here and there we find an original who taught the poor to steal to pilfer they did not go to the great for schoolmasters in these faculties surely it is well if in some vices they allow us to be no copyists in no other sense is it true that the poor copy them than as servants may be said to take after their masters and mistresses when they succeed to their reversionary cold meats 
if the master, from indisposition or some other cause, neglect his food, the servant dines notwithstanding. Oh, but some will say, the force of example is great. We knew a lady who was so scrupulous on this head that she would put up with the calls of the most impertinent visitor rather than let her servant say she was not at home for fear of teaching her maid to tell an untruth and this in the very face of the fact which she knew well enough that the wench was one of the greatest liars upon the earth without teaching so much so that her mistress possibly never heard two words of consecutive truth from her in her life but nature must go for nothing example must be everything this liar in grain who never opened her mouth without a lie must be guarded against a remote inference which she pretty casuist might possibly draw from a form of words literally false but essentially deceiving no one that under some circumstances a fib might not be so exceedingly sinful a fiction too not at all in her own way or one that she could be suspected of adopting for few servant wenches care to be denied to visitors this word example reminds us of another fine word which is in use upon these occasions encouragement people in our sphere must not be thought to give encouragement to such proceedings to such a frantic height is this principle capable of being carried that we have known individuals who have thought it within the scope of their influence to sanction despair and give eclat to suicide a domestic in the family of a county member lately deceased for love or some unknown cause cut his throat but not successfully the poor fellow was otherwise much loved and respected and great interest was used in his behalf upon his recovery that he might be permitted to retain his place his word being first pledged not without some substantial sponsors to promise for him that the like should never happen again his master was inclinable to keep him but his mistress thought otherwise and john in the end was dismissed her ladyship declaring that she could not think of encouraging any such doings in the county six that enough is as good as a feast not a man woman or child in ten miles round guildhall who really believes this saying the inventor of it did not believe it himself it was made in revenge by somebody who was disappointed of a regale it is a vile cold scrag of mutton sophism a lie palmed upon the palate which knows better things if nothing else could be said for a feast this is sufficient that from the superflux there is usually something left for the next day morally interpreted it belongs to a class of proverbs which have a tendency to make us undervalue money of this cast are those notable observations that money is not health riches cannot purchase everything the metaphor which makes gold to be mere muck with the morality which traces fine clothing to the sheep's back and denounces pearl as the unhandsome excretion of an oyster hence too 
the phrase which imputes dirt to acres, a sophistry so barefaced that even the literal sense of it is true only in a wet season. This, and abundance of similar sage sores, assuming to inculcate content, we verily believe to have been the invention of some cunning borrower, who had designs upon the purse of his wealthier neighbour, which he could only hope to carry by force of these verbal jugglings. Translate any one of these sayings out of the artful metonyme which envelops it, and the trick is apparent. Goodly legs and shoulders of mutton, exhilarating cordials, books, pictures, the opportunities of seeing foreign countries, independence, heart's ease, a man's own time to himself, are not muck. However, we may be pleased to scandalise with that appellation, the faithful metal that provides them for us. 7. Of two disputants, the warmest is generally in the wrong. Our experience would lead us to quite an opposite conclusion. Temper, indeed, is no test of truth, but warmth and earnestness are a proof at least of a man's own conviction of the rectitude of that which he maintains. Coolness is as often the result of an unprincipled indifference to truth or falsehood, as of a sober confidence in a man's own side in the dispute. Nothing is more insulting sometimes than the appearance of this philosophic temper. There is little Titubus, the stammering law-stationer in Lincoln's Inn. We have seldom known this shrewd little fellow engaged in an argument where we were not convinced he had the best of it, if his tongue would but fairly have seconded him. When he has been spluttering excellent broken sense for an hour together, writhing and labouring to be delivered of the point of dispute, the very gist of the controversy knocking at his teeth, which, like some obstinate iron grating, still obstructed its deliverance, his puny frame convulsed, and face reddening all over at an unfairness in the logic which he wanted articulation to expose, it has moved our goal to see a smooth, portly fellow of an adversary that cared not a button for the merits of the question by merely laying his hand upon the head of the stationer and desiring him to be calm. Your tall disputants have always the advantage. With a provoking sneer, carry the argument clean from him in the opinion of all the bystanders who have gone away clearly convinced that Titubus must have been in the wrong because he was in a passion and that mr blank meaning his opponent is one of the fairest and at the same time one of the most dispassionate arguers breathing Eight. That verbal allusions are not wit, because they will not bear a translation. The same might be said of the wittiest local allusions. A custom is sometimes as difficult to explain to a foreigner as a pun. What would become of a great part of the wit of the last age, if it were tried by this test, how would certain topics, as aldermanity, 
cuckold tree have sounded to a Terentian auditory, though Terence himself had been alive to translate them. Senator Urbanus, with Coruca to boot for a synonym, would but faintly have done the business. Words involving notions are hard enough to render. It is too much to expect us to translate a sound, and give an elegant version to a jingle. The Virgilian harmony is not translatable, but by substituting harmonious sounds in another language for it. To Latinize a pun, we must seek a pun in Latin that will answer to it, as to give an idea of the double endings in Hudibras, we must have recourse to a similar practice in the old monkish doggerel. Dennis, the fiercest oppugner of puns in ancient or modern times, professes himself highly tickled with the astic, chiming to ecclesiastic. Yet what is this? but a species of pun of essay twenty four part two of the last essays of Elia by charles lamb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Popular Fallacies. Nine. That the worst puns are the best. If by worst be only meant the most far fetched and startling, we agree to it. A pun is not bound by the laws which limit nicer wit. It is a pistol let off at the ear, not a feather to tickle the intellect. It is an antic which does not stand upon manners, but comes bounding into the presence, and does not show the less comic for being dragged in sometimes by the head and shoulders what though it limp a little or prove defective in one leg all the better a pun may easily be too curious and artificial who has not at one time or other been at a party of professors himself perhaps an old offender in that line where after ringing a round of the most ingenious conceits every man contributing his shot and some there the most expert shooters of the day after making a poor word run the gauntlet till it is ready to drop after hunting and winding it through all the possible ambages of similar sounds after squeezing and hauling and tugging at it till the very milk of it will not yield a drop further. Suddenly, some obscure, unthought-of fellow in a corner, who was never apprenticed to the trade, whom the company for very pity passed over, as we do by a known poor man, when a money subscription is going round, no one calling upon him for his quota, has all at once come out with something so whimsical, yet so pertinent, so brazen in its pretensions, yet so impossible to be denied, so exquisitely good, and so deplorably bad at the same time, that it has proved a Robin Hood shot. Anything ulterior to that is despaired of, and the party breaks up, unanimously voting it to be the very worst, that is, best, pun of the evening. 
This species of wit is the better for not being perfect in all its parts. What it gains in completeness it loses in naturalness. The more exactly it satisfies the critical, the less hold it has upon some other faculties. The puns which are most entertaining are those which will least bear an analysis. Of this kind is the following, recorded with a sort of stigma in one of Swift's miscellanies. An Oxford scholar, meeting a porter, who was carrying a hare through the streets, accosts him with this extraordinary question. Prithee, friend, is that thy own hair, or a wig? There is no excusing this, and no resisting it. A man might blur ten sides of paper in attempting a defence of it against a critic who should be laughed to proof. The quibble in itself is not considerable. It is only a new turn given by a little false pronunciation to a very common, though not very courteous, inquiry. Put by one gentleman to another at a dinner-party, it would have been vapid. To the mistress of the house, it would have shown much less wit than rudeness. We must take in the totality of time, place, and person, the pert look of the inquiring scholar, the desponding look of the puzzled porter, the one stopping at leisure, the other hurrying on with his burthen. The innocent, though rather abrupt, tendency of the first member of the question, with the utter and inextricable irrelevancy of the second, the place a public street, not favourable to frivolous investigations, the affrontive quality of the primitive inquiry, the common question, invidiously transferred to the derivative, the new turn given to it, in the implied satire, namely, that few of that tribe are expected to eat of the good things which they carry, they being, in most countries, considered rather as the temporary trustees than owners of such dainties, which the fellow was beginning to understand, but then the wig again comes in, and he can make nothing of it. All put together uh, constitute a picture. Hogarth could have made it intelligible on canvas. Yet nine out of ten critics will pronounce this a very bad pun, because of the defectiveness in the concluding member, which is its very beauty, and constitutes the surprise. The same persons shall cry up for admirable the cold quibble from Virgil about the broken Cremona. Footnote. Swift because it is made out in all its parts, and leaves nothing to the imagination. We venture to call it cold, because of thousands who have admired it, it will be difficult to find one who has heartily chuckled at it, as appealing to the judgment merely, setting the risible faculty aside, we must pronounce it a monument of curious felicity. But as some stories are said to be too good to be true, it may with equal truth be asserted of this bi-verbal allusion that it is too good to be natural. One cannot help suspecting that the incident was invented to fit the line. It would have been better had it been less perfect like some Virgilian hemistitches, it has suffered by filling up. The nimium vicina was enough in conscience. The cremona afterwards loads it. It is, in fact, a double pun, 
and we have always observed that a superfetation in this sort of wit is dangerous. When a man has said a good thing, it is seldom politic to follow it up. We do not care to be cheated a second time, or perhaps the mind of man, with reverence be it spoken, is not capacious enough to lodge two puns at a time. The impression to be forcible must be simultaneous and undivided. 10. That handsome is, that handsome does. Those who use this proverb can never have seen Mrs. Conrady. The soul, if we may believe Plotinus, is a ray from the celestial beauty. As she partakes more or less of this heavenly light, she informs with corresponding characters the fleshly tenement which she chooses, and frames to herself a suitable mansion. All which only proves that the soul of Mrs. Conrady, in her pre-existent state, was no great judge of architecture. To the same effect, in a hymn in honour of beauty, divine Spencer, platonizing, sings, Every spirit, as it is more pure, and hath in it the more of heavenly light, so it the fairer body doth procure to have it in, and it more fairly dight, with cheerful grace and amiable sight. For of the soul the body form doth take, for soul is form, and doth the body make. But Spencer, it is clear, and never saw Mrs. Conrady. These poets, we find, are no safe guides in philosophy, for here, in his very next stanza but one, is a saving clause, which throws us all out again, and leaves us as much to seek as ever. Yet, oft it falls that many a gentle mind dwells in deformed tabernacle drowned either by chance against the course of kind or through an aptness in the substance found which it assumed of some stubborn ground that will not yield unto her form's direction but is performed with some foul imperfection, from which it would follow that Spencer had seen somebody like Mrs. Conrady. The spirit of this good lady, her previous anima, must have stumbled upon one of these untoward tabernacles which he speaks of. A more rebellious commodity of clay for a ground as the poet calls it no gentle mind and sure hers is one of the gentlest ever had to deal with pondering upon her inexplicable visage inexplicable we mean but by this modification of the theory we have come to a conclusion that if one must be plain it is better to be plain all over than amidst a tolerable residue of features to hang out one that shall be exceptionable. No one can say of Mrs. Conrady's countenance that it would be better if she had but a nose. It is impossible to pull her to pieces in this manner. We have seen the most malicious beauties of her own sex baffled in the attempt at a selection. The tout ensemble defies particularizing. It is too complete, too consistent, as we may say, 
to admit of these invidious reservations. It is not as if some Apelles had picked out here a lip and there a chin out of the collected ugliness of Greece to frame a model by. It is a symmetrical whole. We challenge the minutest connoisseur to cavil at any part or parcel of the countenance in question, to say that this or that is improperly placed. We are convinced that true ugliness, no less than is affirmed of true beauty, is the result of harmony. Like that, too, it reigns without a competitor. No one ever saw Mrs. Conrady without pronouncing her to be the plainest woman that he ever met with in the course of his life. The first time that you are indulged with a sight of her face is an era in your existence ever after. You are glad to have seen it, like Stonehenge. No one can pretend to forget it. No one ever apologized to her for meeting her in the street on such a day and not knowing her. The pretext would be too bare. Nobody can mistake her for another. Nobody can say of her, I think I have seen that face somewhere, but I cannot call to mind where. You must remember that in such a parlour it first struck you, like a bust. You wondered where the owner of the house had picked it up. You wondered more when it began to move its lips, so mildly too. No one ever thought of asking her to sit for her picture lockets are for remembrance, and it would be clearly superfluous to hang an image at your heart which, once seen, can never be out of it. It is not a mean face, either. Its entire originality precludes that. Neither is it of that order of plain faces which improve upon acquaintance. Some very good but ordinary people by an unwearied perseverance in good offices, put a cheat upon our eyes, juggle our senses out of their natural impressions, and set us upon discovering good indications in a countenance which at first sight promised nothing less. We detect gentleness which had escaped us, lurking about an underlip. But when Mrs. Conrady has done you a service, her face remains the same. When she has done you a thousand, and you know that she is ready to double the number, still it is that individual face. Neither can you say of it that it would be a good face if it was not marked by the smallpox, a compliment which is always more admissive than excusatory. For either Mrs. Conrady never had the smallpox, or, as we say, took it kindly. No, it stands upon its own merits fairly. There it is. It is her mark, her token. That which she is known by. 11. THAT WE MUST NOT LOOK A GIFT HORSE IN THE MOUTH, NOR A LADY'S AGE IN THE PARISH REGISTER. WE HOPE WE HAVE MORE DELICACY THAN TO DO EITHER, BUT SOME FACES SPARE US THE TROUBLE OF THESE DENTAL inquirers. AND WHAT IF THE BEAST, WHICH MY FRIEND WOULD FORCE UPON MY ACCEPTANCE, APPROVE upon the face of it, a sorry Rosinante, a lean, ill-favoured jade, whom no gentleman could think of setting up in his stables. Must I, rather than not be obliged to my friend, make her a companion to Eclipse, or Lightfoot, a horse-giver no more than a horse-seller, has a right to palm his spavined article upon us for good wear. An equivalent is expected in either case, 
and with my own good will I would no more be cheated out of my thanks than out of my money. Some people have a knack of putting upon you gifts of no real value, to engage you to substantial gratitude. We thank them for nothing. Our friend Metis carries this humour of never refusing a present to the very point of absurdity. If it were possible to couple the ridiculous with so much mistaken delicacy and real good nature. Not an apartment in his fine house, and he has a true taste in household decorations, but is stuffed up with some preposterous print or mirror, the worst adapted to his panels that may be, the presence of his friends that know his weakness, while his noble Van Dykes are displaced to make room for a set of daubs, the work of some wretched artist of his acquaintance, who, having had them returned upon his hands for bad likenesses, finds his account in bestowing them here gratis. The good creature has not the heart to mortify the painter at the expense of an honest refusal. It is pleasant, if it did not vex one at the same time, to see him sitting in his dining parlour, surrounded with obscure aunts and cousins to God knows whom, while the true Lady Marys and Lady Bettys of his own honourable family, in favour to these adopted frights, are consigned to the staircase and the lumber-room. In like manner his goodly shelves are one by one stripped of his favourite old authors, to give place to a collection of presentation copies, the flower and bran of modern poetry. A presentation copy, reader, if, haply, you are yet innocent of such favours, is a copy of a book which does not sell, sent you by the author, with his foolish autograph at the beginning of it, for which, if a stranger, he only demands your friendship. If a brother author, he expects from you a book of yours, which does sell in return. We can speak to experience, having by us a tolerable assortment of these gift-horses. And not to ride a metaphor to death, we are willing to acknowledge that in some gifts there is sense. A duplicate out of a friend's library, where he has more than one copy of a rare author, is intelligible. There are favours, short of the pecuniary, a thing not fit to be hinted at among gentlemen, which confer as much grace upon the acceptor as the offerer, the kind, we confess, which is most to our palate, is of those little conciliatory missives, which, for their vehicle, generally choose a hamper, little odd presents of game, fruit, perhaps wine, though it is essential to the delicacy of the latter that it be home-made. We love to have our friend in the country sitting thus at our table by proxy, to apprehend his presence, though a hundred miles may be between us, by a turkey whose goodly aspect reflects to us his plump corpusculum to taste him in grouse or woodcock, to feel him gliding down in the toast peculiar to the latter, to concorporate him in a slice of Canterbury brawn. This is indeed to have him with ourselves, to know him intimately. Such participation is, methinks, unitive as the old theologians phrase it. For these considerations, we should be sorry if certain restrictive regulations, which are thought to bear 
hard upon the peasantry of this country were entirely done away with a hare as the law now stands makes many friends caius conciliates titius knowing his gout with a leash of partridges titius suspecting his partiality for them passes them to lucius who in his turn preferring his friend's relish to his own and makes them over to marcius till in their ever widening progress and round of unconscious circummigration they distribute the seeds of harmony over half a parish we are well disposed to this kind of sensible remembrances and are the less apt to be taken by those little airy tokens impalpable to the palate which under the names of rings lockets keepsakes amuse some people's fancy mightily we could never away with these indigestible trifles they are the very kickshaws and foppery of friendship twelve that home is home though it is never so homely homes there are we are sure that are no homes the home of the very poor man and another which we shall speak to presently crowded places of cheap entertainment and the benches of alehouses if they could speak might bear mournful testimony to the first to them the very poor man resorts for an image of the home which he cannot find at home for a starved grate and a scanty firing that is not enough to keep alive the natural heat in the fingers of so many shivering children with their mother he finds in the depth of winter always a blazing hearth and a hob to warm his pittance of beer by instead of the clamours of a wife made gaunt by famishing he meets with a cheerful attendance beyond the merits of the trifle which he can afford to spend he has companions which his home denies him for the very poor man has no visitors he can look into the goings-on of the world and speak a little to politics at home there are no politics stirring but the domestic all interests real or imaginary all topics that should expand the mind of man and connect him to a sympathy with general existence are crushed in the absorbing consideration of food to be obtained for the family beyond the price of bread news is senseless and impertinent at home there is no larder here there is at least a show of plenty and while he cooks his lean scrap of butcher's meat before the common bars or munches his humbler cold viands his relishing bread and cheese with an onion in a corner where no one reflects upon his poverty he has sight of the substantial joint providing for the landlord and his family he takes an interest in the dressing of it and while he assists in removing the trivet from the fire he feels that there is such a thing as beef and cabbage which he was beginning to forget at home all this while he deserts his wife and children but what wife and what children prosperous men who object to this desertion image to themselves some clean contented family like that which they go home to but look at the countenance of the poor wives 
who follow and persecute their good man to the door of the public house which he is about to enter, when something like shame would restrain him, if stronger misery did not induce him to pass the threshold. That face, ground by want, in which every cheerful, every conversable lineament has been long effaced by misery, is that a face to stay at home with? Is it more a woman or a wild cat? Alas, it is the face of the wife of his youth that once smiled upon him. It can smile no longer. What comforts can it share? What burthens can it lighten? Oh, tis a fine thing to talk of the humble meal shared together. But what if there be no bread in the cupboard? The innocent prattle of his children takes out the sting of a man's poverty. But the children of the very poor do not prattle. It is none of the least frightful features in that condition that there is no childishness in its dwellings. Poor people, said a sensible old nurse to us once, do not bring up their children, they drag them up. The little careless darling of the wealthier nursery, in their hovel, is transformed betimes into a premature reflecting person. No one has time to dandle it, no one thinks it worth while to coax it, to soothe it, to toss it up and down, to humour it. There is none to kiss away its tears. If it cries, it can only be beaten. It has been prettily said that a babe is fed with milk and praise, but the aliment of this poor babe was thin, unnourishing. The return to its little baby tricks and efforts to engage attention, bitter, ceaseless objurgation. It never had a toy, or knew what a coral meant. It grew up without the lullaby of nurses. It was a stranger to the patient fondle, the hushing caress, the attracting novelty, the costlier plaything, or the cheaper off-hand contrivance to divert the child, the prattled nonsense best sends to it, the wise impertinences, the wholesome lies, the apt story interposed that puts a stop to present sufferings and awakens the passion of young wonder. It was never sung to. No one ever told to it a tale of the nursery. It was dragged up to live or to die, as it happened. It had no young dreams. It broke at once into the iron realities of life. A child exists not for the very poor as any object of dalliance. It is only another mouth to be fed, a pair of little hands to be betimes inured to labour. It is the rival till it can be the co-operator for food with the parent. It is never his mirth, his diversion, his solace. It never makes him young again, with recalling his young times. The children of the very poor have no young times. It makes the very heart to bleed, to overhear the casual street talk between a poor woman and her little girl a woman of the better sort of poor, in a condition rather above the squalid beings which we have been contemplating. It is not of toys, of nursery books, of summer holidays fitting that age, of the promised sight or play, of praised sufficiency at school. It is of mangling and clear-starching, at the price of coals or of potatoes, the questions of the child that should be the very outpourings of curiosity and idleness are marked with forecast and melancholy providence. It has come to be a woman before it was a child. It has learned to go to market. 
it chaffers, it haggles, it envies, it murmurs, it is knowing, acute, sharpened, it never prattles. Had we not reason to say that the home of the very poor is no home? There is yet another home which we are constrained to deny to be one. It has a larder which the home of the poor man wants, its fireside conveniences of which the poor dream not. But with all this it is no home. It is the house of the man that is infested with many visitors. May we be branded for the veriest churl if we deny our heart to the many noble-hearted friends that at times exchange their dwelling for our poor roof. It is not of guests that we complain, but of endless, purposeless visitants, droppers in, as they are called. We sometimes wonder from what sky they fall. It is the very error of the position of our lodging. Its horoscopy was ill-calculated, being just situate in a medium, a plaguy suburban mid-space, fitted to catch idlers from town or country. We are older than we were, and age is easily put out of its way. We have fewer sands in our glass to reckon upon, and we cannot brook to see them drop in endlessly succeeding impertinences. At our time of life, to be alone sometimes is as needful as sleep. It is the refreshing sleep of the day. The growing infirmities of age manifest themselves in nothing more strongly than in an inveterate dislike of interruption. The thing which we are doing we wish to be permitted to do. We have neither much knowledge nor devices, but there are fewer in the place to which we hasten. We are not willingly put out of our way, even at a game of ninepins. While youth was, we had vast reversions in time future. We are reduced to a present pittance and obliged to economize in that article. We bleed away our moments now as hardly as our ducats. We cannot bear to have our thin wardrobe eaten and fretted into by moths. We are willing to barter our good time with a friend who gives us in exchange his own. Herein is the distinction between the genuine guest and the visitant. This latter takes your good time and gives you his bad in exchange. The guest is domestic to you as your good cat or household bird. The visitant is your fly that flaps in at your window and out again, leaving nothing but a sense of disturbance and victuals spoiled. The inferior functions of life begin to move heavily. We cannot concoct our food with interruptions. Our chief meal, to be nutritive, must be solitary. With difficulty we can eat before a guest, and never understood what the relish of public feasting meant. Meats have no seapaw, nor digestion fair play in a crowd. The unexpected coming in of a visitant stops the machine. There is a punctual generation who time their calls to the precise commencement of your dining hour, not to eat but to see you eat. A knife and fork drop instinctively and we feel that we have swallowed our latest morsel. Others again show their genius, as we have said, in knocking the moment you have just sat down to a book. They have a peculiar, compassionating sneer, 
with which they hope though they do not interrupt your studies though they flutter off the next moment to carry their impertinences to the nearest student that they can call their friend the tone of the book is spoiled we shut the leaves and with dante's lovers read no more that day it were well if the effect of intrusion were simply coextensive with its presence but it mars all the good hours afterwards these scratches in appearance leave an orifice that closes not hastily it is a prostitution of the bravery of friendship says worthy bishop taylor to spend it upon impertinent people who are it may be loads to their families but can never ease my loads this is the secret of their gaddings their visits and morning calls they too have homes which are no homes thirteen that you must love me and love my dog a good sir or madam as it may be we most willingly embrace the offer of your friendship we long have known your excellent qualities we have wished to have you nearer to us to hold you within the very innermost fold of our heart we can have no reserve towards a person of your open and noble nature the frankness of your humour suits us exactly we have been long looking for such a friend a quick let us disburthen our troubles into each other's bosom let us make our single joys shine by reduplication but yeah 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 what is this confounded cur he has fastened his tooth, which is none of the bluntest, just in the fleshy part of my leg. It is my dog, sir. You must love him for my sake. Here, test, test, test. But he has bitten me. I, that he is apt to do, till you are better acquainted with him i have had him three years he never bites me yap 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 he is at it again oh sir you must not kick him he does not like to be kicked i expect my dog to be treated with all the respect due to myself but do you always take him out with you when you go a friendship hunting invariably tis the sweetest prettiest best conditioned animal i call him my test the touchstone by which i try a friend no one can properly be said to love me who does not love him excuse us dear sir or madam aforesaid if upon further consideration we are obliged to decline the otherwise invaluable offer of your friendship we do not like dogs mighty well sir you know the conditions you may have worse offers come along test the above dialogue is not so imaginary but that in the intercourse of life we have had frequent occasions of breaking off an agreeable intimacy by reason of these canine appendages they do not always come in the shape of dogs 
they sometimes wear the more plausible and human character of kinsfolk, near acquaintances, my friend's friend, his partner, his wife, or his children. We could never yet form a friendship, not to speak of more delicate correspondences, however much to our taste, without the intervention of some third anomaly, some impertinent clog affixed to the relation, the understood dog, in the proverb. The good things of life are not to be had singly, but come to us with a mixture, like a schoolboy's holiday, with a task affixed to the tail of it. What a delightful companion is X, if he did not always bring his tall cousin with him. He seems to grow with him, like some of those double births which we remember to have read of with such wonder and delight in the old Athenian oracle, where Swift commenced author by writing Pindaric odes, what a beginning for him, upon Sir William Temple. There is the picture of the brother, with the little brother peeping out at his shoulder, a species of fraternity which we have no name of kin close enough to comprehend. When X comes poking in his head and shoulders into your room, as if to feel his entry, you think, surely you have now got him to yourself. What a three hours chat we shall have! But ever in the haunch of him, and before his diffident body is well disclosed in your apartment, appears the haunting shadow of the cousin, overpeering his modest kinsman, and sure to overlay the expected good talk with his insufferable prosperity of stature and uncorresponding dwarfishness of observation. Misfortunes seldom come alone. Tis hard when a blessing comes accompanied. Cannot we, like Sempronia, without sitting down to chess with her eternal brother? Or no Sulpicia, without knowing all the round of her card-playing relations? Must my friend's brethren of necessity be mine also? Must we be hand and glove with Dick Selby, the parson, or Jack Selby, the calico printer, because W.S., who is neither but a ripe wit and a critic, has the misfortune to claim a common parentage with them? Let him lay down his brothers, and tis odds, but we will cast him in a pair of hours, we have a superflux, to balance the concession. Let F. H. lay down his garrulous uncle, and Honorius dismiss his vapid wife, and superfluous establishment of six boys, things between boy and manhood, too ripe for play, too raw for conversation, that come in impudently staring their father's old friend out of countenance, and will neither aid nor let alone the conference, that we may once more meet upon equal terms, as we were wont to do in the disengaged state of bachelorhood. It is well if your friend or mistress be content with these canicular probations. Few young ladies but in this sense keep a dog. But when Rutilia hounds at you her tiger aunt, or Ruspina expects you to cherish and fondle her viper sister, whom she has preposterously taken into her bosom 
to try stinging conclusions upon your constancy, they must not complain if the house be rather thin of suitors. Scylla must have broken off many excellent matches in her time, if she insisted upon all that loved her, loving her dogs also. An excellent story to this moral is told of Mary of Delacruscan memory. In tender youth he loved and courted a modest appanage to the opera, in truth a dancer, who had won him by the artless contrast between her manners and situation. She seemed to him a native violet that had been transplanted by some rude accident into that exotic and artificial hotbed. Nor, in truth, was she less genuine and sincere than she appeared to him. He wooed and won this flower, only for appearance sake, and for due honour to the bride's relations. She craved that she might have the attendance of her friends and kindred at the approaching solemnity. The request was too amiable not to be conceded, and in this solicitude for conciliating the good will of more relations, he found a presage of her superior attentions to himself when the golden shaft should have killed the flock of all affections else. The morning came, and at the Star and Garter, Richmond, the place appointed for the breakfasting, accompanied with one English friend, he impatiently awaited what reinforcements the bride should bring to grace the ceremony. A rich muster she had made. They came in six coaches, the whole corps du ballet, French, Italian, men and women, Monsieur de Beau, the famous pirouetta of the day, led his fair spouse, but craggy from the banks of the Seine. The prima donna, had sent her excuse. But the first and second Buffa were there, and Signor Scaparelli, and Signora Chamien, and Madame Violetta, with a countless cavalcade besides of choruses, figurantes, at the sight of whom Mary afterwards declared that then for the first time it struck him seriously that he was about to marry a dancer. But there was no help for it. Besides, it was her day. These were, in fact, her friends and kinsfolk. The assemblage, though whimsical, was all very natural. But when the bride, handing out of the last coach, a still more extraordinary figure than the rest, presented to him as her father, the gentleman that was to give her away, no less a person than Signor Delpini himself, with a sort of pride as much as to say, See what I have brought to do us honour. The thought of so extraordinary a paternity quite overcame him, and slipping away under some pretence from the bride and her motley adherents, poor Mary took horse from the backyard to the nearest sea-coast, from which, shipping himself to America, he shortly after consoled himself with a more congenial match in the person of Miss Brunton relieved from his intended clown father, and a bevy of painted buffars for bridesmaids. 14. That we should rise with the lark. 
at what precise minute that little airy musician doffs his night-gear and prepares to tune up his unseasonable matins we are not naturalists enough to determine but for a mere human gentleman that has no orchestra business to call him from his warm bed to such preposterous exercises we take ten or half after ten eleven of course during this christmas solstice to be the very earliest hour at which he can begin to think of abandoning his pillow to think of it we say for to do it in earnest requires another half-hour's good consideration not but there are pretty sunrisings as we are told and such like gourds abroad in the world in summer time especially some hours before what we have assigned which a gentleman may see as they say only for getting up but having been tempted once or twice in earlier life to assist at those ceremonies we confess our curiosity abated we are no longer ambitious of being the sun's courtiers to attend at his morning levies we hold the good hours of the dawn too sacred to waste them upon such observances which have in them besides a something pagan and persic to say truth we never anticipated our usual hour or got up with the sun as tis called to go a journey or upon a foolish whole day's pleasuring but we suffered for it all the long hours after in listlessness and headaches nature herself sufficiently declaring her sense of our presumption in aspiring to regulate our frail waking courses by the measures of that celestial and sleepless traveller we deny not that there is something sprightly and vigorous at the outset especially in these break-of-day excursions it is flattering to get the start of a lazy world to conquer death by proxy in his image but the seeds of sleep and mortality are in us and we pay usually in strange qualms before night falls the penalty of the unnatural inversion therefore while the busy part of mankind are fast huddling on their clothes are already up and about their occupations content to have swallowed their sleep by wholesale we chose to linger abed and digest our dreams it is the very time to recombine the wandering images which night in a confused mass presented to snatch them from forgetfulness, to shape and mould them. Some people have no good of their dreams. Like fast feeders, they gulp them too grossly to taste them curiously. We love to chew the cud of a foregone vision, to collect the scattered rays of a brighter phantasm, or act over again with firmer nerves the sadder nocturnal tragedies, to drag into daylight a struggling and half-vanishing nightmare, to handle and examine the terrors or the airy solaces. We have too much respect for these spiritual communications to let them go so lightly. We are not so stupid or so careless as that imperial forgetter of his dreams, that we should need a seer to remind us of the form of them. They seem to us to have as much significance as our waking concerns, 
or rather to import us more nearly, as more nearly we approach by years to the shadowy world, whither we are hastening. We have shaken hands with the world's business, we have done with it, we have discharged ourselves of it. Why should we get up? We have neither suit to solicit, nor affairs to manage. The drama has shut in upon us at the fourth act. We have nothing here to expect, but in a short time a sick-bed and a dismissal. We delight to anticipate death by such shadows as night affords. We are already half acquainted with ghosts. We were never much in the world. Disappointment early struck a dark veil between us and its dazzling illusions. Our spirits showed grey before our hairs. The mighty changes of the world already appear as but the vain stuff out of which dramas are composed. We have asked no more of life than what the mimic images in playhouses present us with. Even those types have waxed fainter. Our clock appears to have struck. We are superannuated. In this dearth of mundane satisfaction, we contract politic alliances with shadows. It is good to have friends at court. The abstracted media of dreams seems no ill introduction to that spiritual presence upon which in no long time we expect to be thrown. We are trying to know a little of the usages of that colony, to learn the language and the faces we shall meet with there, that we may be the less awkward at our first coming among them. We willingly call a phantom our fellow, as knowing we shall soon be of their dark companionship. Therefore we cherish dreams. We try to spell in them the alphabet of the invisible world, and think we know already how it shall be with us. Those uncouth shapes, which, while we clung to flesh and blood, affrighted us, have become familiar. We feel attenuated into their meagre essences, and have given the hand of halfway approach to incorporeal being. We once thought life to be something, but it has unaccountably fallen from us before its time. Therefore we choose to dally with visions. The sun has no purposes of ours to light us to. Why should we get up? Fifteen. That we should lie down with the lamb. We could never quite understand the philosophy of this arrangement, or the wisdom of our ancestors, in sending us for instruction to these woolly bedfellows. A sheep, when it is dark, has nothing to do but to shut his silly eyes and sleep if he can. Man found out long sixes. Hail, candlelight, without disparagement to sun or moon, the kindliest luminary of the three, if we may not rather style thee their radiant deputy, mild viceroy of the moon. We love to read, talk, sit silent, eat, drink, sleep by candlelight. They are everybody's sun and moon. This is our peculiar and household planet. Wanting it, what savage, unsocial nights 
must our ancestors have spent wintering in caves and unillumined fastnesses they must have lain about and grumbled at one another in the dark what repartees could have passed when he must have felt about for a smile and handled a neighbour's cheek to be sure that he understood it this accounts for the seriousness of the elder poetry it has a sombre cast try hesiod or ossian derived from the tradition of those unlanterned nights jokes came in with candles we wonder how they saw to pick up a pin if they had any how did they sup what a melange of chance carving they must have made of it here one had got a leg of a goat when he wanted a horse's shoulder there another had dipped his scooped palm in a kidskin of wild honey when he meditated right mare's milk there is neither good eating nor drinking in fresco who even in these civilized times has never experienced this when at some economic table he has commenced dining after dusk and waited for the flavour till the lights came the senses absolutely give and take reciprocally can you tell pork from veal in the dark or distinguish sherris from pure malaga take away the candle from the smoking man by the glimmering of the left ashes he knows that he is still smoking but he knows it only by an inference till the restored light coming in aid of the olfactories reveals to both senses the full aroma then how he redoubles his puffs how he burnishes there is absolutely no such thing as reading but by a candle we have tried the affectation of a book at noonday in gardens and in sultry arbours but it was labour thrown away those gay motes in the beam come about you hovering and teasing like so many coquettes that will have you all to their self and are jealous of your abstractions by the midnight taper the writer digests his meditations by the same light we must approach to their perusal if we would catch the flame the odour it is a mockery all that is reported of the influential phoebus no true poem ever owed its birth to the sun's light they are abstracted works things that were born when none but the still night and his dumb candle saw his pinching throes. Marry, daylight, daylight might furnish the images, the crude material, but for the fine shapings, the true turning and filing, as mine author hath it, they must be content to hold their inspiration of the candle the mild internal light that reveals them like fires on the domestic hearth goes out in the sunshine night and silence call out the starry fancies milton's morning hymn on paradise we would hold a good wager was penned at midnight and taylor's richer description of a sunrise smells decidedly of the taper even ourself in these our humbler lucubrations tune our best measured cadences prose has her cadences not unfrequently to the charm of the drowsier watchman blessing the doors
or the wild sweep of winds at midnight even now a loftier speculation than we have yet attempted courts our endeavours we would indite something about the solar system betty bring the candles sixteen that a sulky temper is a misfortune we grant that it is and a very serious one to a man's friends and to all that have to do with him but whether the condition of the man himself is so much to be deplored may admit of a question we can speak a little to it being ourselves but lately recovered we whisper it in confidence reader out of a long and desperate fit of the sullens was the cure a blessing the conviction which wrought it came too clearly to leave a scruple of the fanciful injuries for they were mere fancies which had provoked the humour but the humour itself was too self-pleasing while it lasted we know how bare we lay ourselves in the confession to be abandoned all at once with the grounds of it we still brood over wrongs which we know to have been imaginary and for our old acquaintance northrop whom we find to have been a truer friend than we took him for we substitute some phantom a gaius or a Titius, as like him as we dare to form it to wreak our yet unsatisfied resentments on it is mortifying to fall at once from the pinnacle of neglect to forego the idea of having been ill-used and contumaciously treated by an old friend the first thing to aggrandize a man in his own conceit is to conceive of himself as neglected there let him fix if he can to undeceive him is to deprive him of the most tickling morsel within the range of self-complacency no flattery can come near it happy is he who suspects his friend of an injustice but supremely blessed who thinks all his friends in a conspiracy to depress and undervalue him there is a pleasure we sing not to the profane far beyond the reach of all that the world counts joy a deep enduring satisfaction in the depths where the superficial seek it not of discontent were we to recite one half of this mystery which we were let into by our late dissatisfaction all the world would be in love with disrespect we should wear a slight for a bracelet and neglects and contumacies would be the only matter for courtship unlike to that mysterious book in the apocalypse the study of this mystery is unpalatable only in the commencement the first sting of a suspicion is grievous but wait out of that wound which to flesh and blood seems so difficult there is balm and honey to be extracted your friend passed you on such or such a day having in his company one that you conceived worse than ambiguously disposed towards you passed you in the street without notice to be sure he is something short-sighted and it was in your power to have accosted him but facts and sane inferences are trifles to a true adept in the science of dissatisfaction he must have seen you and Southey, who was with him, must have been the cause of the contempt. It galls you, and well it may. But have patience. 
go home and make the worst of it and you are a made man from this time shut yourself up and rejecting as an enemy to your peace every whispering suggestion that but insinuates there may be a mistake reflect seriously upon the many lesser instances which you had begun to perceive in proof of your friend's disaffection towards you none of them singly was much to the purpose but the aggregate weight is positive and you have this last affront to clench them thus far the process is anything but agreeable but now to your relief comes in the comparative faculty you conjure up all the kind feelings you have had for your friend what you have been to him and what you would have been to him if he would have suffered you how you defended him in this or that place and his good name his literary reputation and so forth was always dearer to you than your own your heart spite of itself yearns towards him you could weep tears of blood but for a restraining pride how say you do you not yet begin to apprehend a comfort some alley of sweetness in the bitter waters stop not here nor penuriously cheat yourself of your reversions you are on vantage ground enlarge your speculations and take in the rest of your friends as a spark kindles more sparks was there one among them who has not to you proved hollow false slippery as water begin to think that the relation itself is inconsistent with mortality that the very idea of friendship with its component parts as honour fidelity steadiness exists but in your single bosom image yourself to yourself as the only possible friend in a world incapable of that communion now the gloom thickens the little star of self-love twinkles that is to encourage you through deeper glooms than this you are not yet at the half point of your elevation you are not yet believe me half sulky enough adverting to the world in general as these circles in the mind will spread to infinity reflect with what strange injustice you have been treated in quarters where setting gratitude and the expectation of friendly returns aside as chimeras you pretended no claim beyond justice the naked due of all men think the very idea of right and fit fled from the earth or your breast the solitary receptacle of it till you have swelled yourself into at least one hemisphere the other being the vast arabia stony of your friends and the world aforesaid to grow bigger every moment in your own conceit and the world to lessen to deify yourself at the expense of your species to judge the world this is the acme and supreme point of your mystery these the true pleasures of sulkiness we profess no more of this grand secret than what our self experimented on one rainy afternoon in the last week sulking in our study we had proceeded to the penultimate point at which the true adept seldom stops where the consideration of benefit forgot is about to merge in the meditation of general injustice when a knock at the door was followed by the entrance of the very friend whose not seeing of us in the morning for we will now confess the case our own an accidental oversight 
had given rise to so much agreeable generalization to mortify us still more and take down the whole flattering superstructure which pride had piled upon neglect he had brought in his hand the identical southey in whose favour we had suspected him of the contumacy asseverations were needless where the frank manner of them both was convictive of the injurious nature of the suspicion we fancied that they perceived our embarrassment but were too proud or something else to confess to the secret of it we had been but too lately in the condition of the noble patient in argos qui se credebat miros audire tragedos in vacuo laetus sesso plazorque teatro and could have exclaimed with equal reason against the friendly hands that cured us pol me ocidistis amici non savastis ait qui sic extata voluptas et dentus parvim mentis gratissimus error end of essay twenty Essay 25 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison On Some of the Old Actors London Magazine, Feb. 1822 of all the actors who flourished in my time a melancholy phrase if taken a right reader bensley had most of the swell of soul was greatest in the delivery of heroic conceptions the emotions consequent upon the presentment of a great idea to the fancy he had the true poetical enthusiasm the rarest faculty among players none that i remember possessed even a portion of that fine madness which he threw out in hotspur's famous rant about glory or the transports of the venetian incendiary at the vision of the fired city see footnote one his voice had the dissonance and at times the inspiriting effect of the trumpet his gait was uncouth and stiff but no way embarrassed by affectation and the thoroughbred gentleman was uppermost in every movement he seized the moment of passion with the greatest truth like a faithful clock never striking before the time never anticipating or leading you to anticipate he was totally destitute of trick and artifice he seemed come upon the stage to do the poet's message simply and he did it with as genuine fidelity as the nuncios in homer deliver the errands of the gods he let the passion or the sentiment do its own work without prop or bolstering he would have scorned to mount a banquet and betrayed none of that cleverness which is the bane of serious acting for this reason his iago was the only endurable one which i remember to have seen no spectator from his action could divine more of his artifice 
than Othello was supposed to do. His confessions in soliloquy alone put you in possession of the mystery. There were no by intimations to make the audience fancy their own discernment so much greater than that of the moor, who commonly stands like a great helpless mark set up for mine ancient, and a quantity of barren spectators to shoot their bolts at. The Iago of Bensley did not go to work so grossly. There was a triumphant tone about the character, natural to a general consciousness of power, but none of that petty vanity which chuckles and cannot contain itself upon any little successful stroke of its knavery, which is common with your small villains and green probationers in mischief. It did not clap or crow before its time. It was not a man setting his wits at a child and winking all the while at other children who are mightily pleased at being let into the secret, but a consummate villain, entrapping a noble nature into toils against which no discernment was available, where the manner was as fathomless as the purpose seemed dark and without motive. The part of Malvolio in the Twelfth Night was performed by Bensley, with a richness and a dignity, of which, to judge from some recent castings of that character, the very tradition must be worn out from the stage. No manager in those days would have dreamed of giving it to Mr. Baddeley or Mr. Parsons. When Bensley was occasionally absent from the theatre, John Kemble thought it no derogation to succeed to the part. Malvolio is not essentially ludicrous. He becomes comic but by accident. He is cold, austere, repelling, but dignified, consistent, and, for what appears, rather of an overstretched morality. Maria describes him as a sort of Puritan, and he might have worn his gold chain with honour in one of our old roundhead families, in the service of a Lambert or a Lady Fairfax. But his morality and his manners are misplaced in Illyria. He is opposed to the proper levities of the piece, and falls in the unequal contest. Still, his pride, or his gravity, call it which you will, is inherent, and native to the man, not mock or affected, which latter only are the fit objects to excite laughter. His quality is at the best unlovely, but neither buffoon nor contemptible. His bearing is lofty, a little above his station, but probably not much above his deserts. We see no reason why he should not have been brave, honourable, accomplished. His careless committal of the ring to the ground, which he was commissioned to restore to Cesario, bespeaks a generosity of birth and feeling. See footnote two. His dialect on all occasions is that of a gentleman and a man of education. We must not confound him with the eternal low steward of comedy. He is master of the household to a great princess, a dignity probably conferred upon him for other respects than age or length of service. See footnote 3. Olivia, at the first indication of his supposed madness, 
declares that she would not have him miscarry for half of her dowry. Does this look as if the character was meant to appear little or insignificant? Once, indeed, she accuses him to his face. Of what? Of being sick of self-love. But with a gentleness and considerateness which could not have been if she had not thought that this particular infirmity shaded some virtues. His rebuke to the night and his sottish revellers is sensible and spirited, and when we take into consideration the unprotected condition of his mistress and the strict regard with which her state of real or dissembled mourning would draw the eyes of the world upon her house affairs. Malvolio might feel the honour of the family in some sort in his keeping, as it appears not that Olivia had any more brothers or kinsmen to look to it, for Sir Toby had dropped all such nice respects at the buttery hatch that Malvolio was meant to be represented as possessing some estimable qualities, the expression of the Duke in his anxiety to have him reconciled almost infers, pursue him and entreat him to a peace. Even in his abused state of chains and darkness, a sort of greatness seems never to desert him. He argues highly and well with the supposed Sir Topas, see footnote four, and philosophizes gallantly upon his straw. There must have been some shadow of worth about the man. He must have been something more than a mere vapour, a thing of straw, or jack in office before Fabian and Maria could have ventured sending him upon a courting errand to Olivia. There was some consonancy, as he would say, in the undertaking, or the jest would have been too bold, even for that house of misrule. There was example for it, said Malvolio, the lady of the Strachey, married the yeoman of the wardrobe. Possibly, too, he might remember, for it must have happened about his time, an instance of a Duchess of Malfi, a countrywoman of Olivia's, and her equal at least, descending from her state to court her steward. The misery of them that are born great they are forced to woo, because none dare woo them. To be sure, the lady was not very tenderly handled for it by her brothers in the sequel, but their vengeance appears to have been whetted rather by her presumption in remarrying at all, when they had meditated the keeping of her fortune in their family than by her choice of an inferior, of Antonio's noble merits especially, for her husband. And, besides, Olivia's brother was just dead. Malvolio was a man of reading, and possibly reflected upon these lines, or something like them, in his own country poetry. Ceremony has made many fools. It is as easy way unto a duchess as to a hatted dame, if her love answer, but that by timorous honours, pale respects, idle degrees of fear, men make their ways hard of themselves. "'Tis but fortune. All is fortune. Maria once told me if she did affect me, and I have heard herself come thus near that, should she fancy, 
it should be one of my complexion. If here was no encouragement, the devil is in it. I wish we could get at the private history of all this, between the countess herself, serious or dissembling, for one hardly knows how to apprehend this fantastical great lady, and the practices of that delicious little piece of mischief Maria, the lime twigs laid by Machiavel the waiting maid, the man might well be wrapped into a fool's paradise. Bensley threw over the part an air of Spanish loftiness. He looked, spake, and moved like an old Castilian. He was starch, spruce, opinionated. But his superstructure of pride seemed bottomed upon a sense of worth. There was something in it beyond the coxcomb. It was big and swelling, but you could not be sure that it was hollow. You might wish to see it taken down, but you felt that it was upon an elevation. He was magnificent from the outset, but when the decent sobrieties of the character began to give way, and the poison of self-love in his conceit of the countess's affection gradually to work, you would have thought that the hero of La Mancha in person stood before you. How he went smiling to himself, with what ineffable carelessness would he twirl his gold chain? What a dream it was! You were infected with the illusion, and did not wish that it should be removed. You had no room for laughter. If an unseasonable reflection of morality obtruded itself, it was a deep sense of the pitiable infirmity of man's nature that can lay him open to such frenzies. But, in truth, you rather admired than pity the lunacy while it lasted. You felt that an hour of such mistake was worth an age with the eyes open. Who would not wish to live but for a day in the conceit of such a lady's love as Olivia. Why, the Duke would have given his principality, but for a quarter of a minute, sleeping or waking, to have been so deluded. The man seemed to tread upon air, to taste manner, to walk with his head in the clouds, to mate Hyperion. Oh, shake not the castles of his pride! Endure yet for a season bright moments of confidence. Stand still, ye watchers of the element, that Malvolio may be still in fancy, fair Olivia's lord. But fate and retribution say no. I hear the mischievous titter of Maria the witty taunts of Sir Toby, the still more insupportable triumph of the foolish knight. The counterfeit Sir Topaz is unmasked, and thus the whirligig of time, as the true clown hath it, brings in his revenges. I confess that I never saw the catastrophe of this character while Bensley played it, without a kind of tragic interest. There was good foolery, too. Few now remember Dodd. What an ague-cheek the stage lost in him. Lovegrove, who came nearest to the old actors, 
revived the character some few seasons ago, and made it sufficiently grotesque. But Dodd was it, as it came out of nature's hands. It might be said to remain in puris naturalibus, in expressing slowness of apprehension, this actor surpassed all others. You could see the first dawn of an idea stealing slowly over his countenance, climbing up by little and little with a painful process, till it cleared up at last to the fullness of a twilight conception, its highest meridian. He seemed to keep back his intellect, as some have had the power to retard their pulsation. The balloon takes less time in filling than it took to cover the expansion of his broad, moony face over all its quarters with expression. A glimmer of understanding would appear in a corner of his eye, and, for lack of fuel, go out again. A part of his forehead would catch a little intelligence, and be a long time in communicating it to the remainder. I am ill at dates, but I think it is now better than five and twenty years ago that, walking in the gardens of Gray's Inn, they were then far finer than they are now. The accursed Verulam bridges had not encroached upon all the east side of them, cutting out delicate green crankles, and shouldering away one or two of the stately alcoves of the terrace. The survivor stands gaping and relationless, as if it remembered its brother. They are still the best gardens of any of the inns of court, my beloved temple not forgotten. Have the gravest character, their aspect being altogether reverend and law-breathing. Bacon has left the impress of his foot upon their gravel walks. Taking my afternoon solace on a summer day upon the aforesaid terrace, a comely, sad personage came towards me, whom from his grave air and deportment I judged to be one of the old benches of the inn. He had a serious, thoughtful forehead, and seemed to be in meditations of mortality. As I have an instinctive awe of old benches, I was passing him with that sort of sub-indicative token of respect which one is apt to demonstrate towards a venerable stranger, and which rather denotes an inclination to greet him than any positive motion of the body to that effect, a species of humility and will-worship, which I observe nine times out of ten rather puzzles than pleases the person it is offered to. When the face, turning full upon me, strangely identified itself with that of Dodd, upon close inspection I was not mistaken. But could this sad, thoughtful countenance be the same vacant face of folly which I had hailed so often under circumstances of gaiety, which I had never seen without a smile, or recognised but as the usher of mirth, that looked out so formerly flat in Foppington, so frothily pert in Tattle, so impotently busy in Backbite, 
so blankly divested of all meaning, or resolutely expressive of none, in acres, in fribble, and a thousand agreeable impertinences. Was this the face, full of thought and carefulness, that had so often divested itself at will of every trace of either, to give me diversion, to clear my cloudy face for two or three hours at least of its furrows. Was this the face, manly, sober, intelligent, which I had so often despised, made mocks at, made merry with. The remembrance of the freedoms which I had taken with it came upon me with a reproach of insult. I could have asked it pardon. I thought it looked upon me with a sense of injury. There is something strange as well as sad in seeing actors your pleasant fellows particularly, subjected to and suffering the common lot, their fortunes, their casualties, their deaths, seem to belong to the scene, their actions to be amenable to poetic justice only. We can hardly connect them with more awful responsibilities. The death of this fine actor took place shortly after this meeting. He had quitted the stage some months, and, as I learned afterwards, had been in the habit of resorting daily to these gardens almost to the day of his decease. In these serious walks, probably he was divesting himself of many scenic and some real vanities, weaning himself from the frivolities of the lesser and the greater theatre, doing gentle penance for a life of no very reprehensible fooleries, taking off by degrees the buffoon mask which he might feel he had worn too long and rehearsing for a more solemn cast of part. Dying, he put on the weeds of Dominic. See footnote 5. The elder palmer of stage-treading celebrity commonly played Sir Toby in those days, but there is a solidity of wit in the jests of that half full stuff, which he did not quite fill out. He was as much too showy as Moody, who sometimes took the part, was dry and sottish. In sock or buskin there was an air of swaggering gentility about Jack Palmer. He was a gentleman, with a slight infusion of the footman, his brother Bob, of recenter memory, who was his shadow in everything while he lived, and dwindled into less than a shadow afterwards, was a gentleman with a little stronger infusion of the latter ingredient. That was all. It is amazing how a little of the more or less makes a difference in these things. When you saw Bobby in the Duke's Servant, see footnote 6, you said, What a pity such a pretty fellow was only a servant. When you saw Jack figuring in Captain Absolute, you thought you could trace his promotion to some lady of quality who fancied the handsome fellow in his top-knot, and had bought him a commission. Therefore, Jack, 
in Dick Hamlet was insuperable. Jack had two voices, both plausible, hypocritical, and insinuating, but his secondary or supplemental voice still more decisively histrionic than his common one. It was reserved for the spectator, and the dramatis personae who was supposed to know nothing at all about it. The lies of young Wilding, and the sentiments in Joseph's surface, were thus marked out in a sort of italics to the audience. This secret correspondence with the company before the curtain, which is the bane and death of tragedy, has an extremely happy effect in some kinds of comedy, in the more highly artificial comedy of Congreve, or of Sheridan especially, where the absolute sense of reality so indispensable to scenes of interest, is not required, or would rather interfere to diminish your pleasure. The fact is, you do not believe in such characters as service, the villain of artificial comedy, even while you read or see them. If you did, they would shock and not divert you. When Ben, in Love for Love, returns from sea, the following exquisite dialogue occurs at his first meeting with his father. Sir Samson, Thou hast been many a weary league, Ben, since I saw thee. Ben, Ay, ay, been, been far enough, and that be all. Well, father, and how do all at home? How does brother Dick and brother Val? Sir Samson, Dick, body o' me. Dick has been dead these two years. I writ you word when you were at Leghorn. Bem. Mess, that's true. Mary, I had forgot. Dick's dead, as you say. Well, and how? I have a many questions to ask you. Here is an instance of insensibility which, in real life, would be revolting, or rather, in real life, could not have coexisted with the warm-hearted temperament of the character. But when you read it in the spirit with which such playful selections and specious combinations rather than strict metaphrases of nature should be taken, or when you saw Bannister play it, it neither did nor does wound the moral sense at all. For what is Ben, the pleasant sailor which Bannister gave us, but a piece of a satire, a creation of Congreve's fancy, a dreamy combination of all the accidents of a sailor's character, his contempt of money, his credulity to women, with that necessary estrangement from home, which it is just within the verge of credibility to suppose might produce such an hallucination as is here described. We never think the worse of Ben for it, or feel it as a stain upon his character. But when an actor comes, and instead of the delightful phantom, the creature dear to half-belief which Bannister exhibited, displays before our eyes a downright concretion of a whopping sailor, a jolly warm-hearted jack-tar, and nothing else. 
when, instead of investing it with a delicious confoundedness of the head, and a veering, undirected goodness of purpose, he gives to it a downright daylight understanding, and a full consciousness of its actions, thrusting forward the sensibilities of the character with a pretense as if it stood upon nothing else, and was to be judged by them alone. We feel the discord of the thing. The scene is disturbed. A real man has got in among the dramatis personae, and puts them out. We want the sailor turned out. We feel that his true place is not behind the curtain but in the first or second gallery. To be resumed occasionally. Elia. Footnote 1. How lovely the Adriatic whore, dressed in her flames will shine, devouring flames such as will burn her to her watery bottom and hiss in her foundation pierre in venice preserved a footnote two viola she took the ring from me on none of it malvolio come sir you peevishly threw it to her and her will is, it should be so returned. If it be worth stooping for, there it lies in your eye. If not, be it his that finds it. Footnote 3 Mrs. Inchbald seems to have fallen into the common mistake of the character in some sensible observations otherwise upon this comedy. It might be asked, she says, whether this credulous steward was much deceived in imputing a degraded taste in the sentiments of love to his fair lady Olivia, as she actually did fall in love with a domestic, and one who, from his extreme youth, was perhaps a greater reproach to her discretion than had she cast a tender regard upon her old and faithful servant. But where does she gather the fact of his age? Neither Maria nor Fabian ever cast that reproach upon him. Footnote 4 Clown What is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl? Malvolio that the soul of our grandam might haply inhabit a bird. Clown, oh, what thinkest thou of his opinion? Malvolio, I think nobly of the soul, and no way approve of his opinion. Footnote 5 Dodd was a man of reading, and left at his death a choice collection of old English literature. I should judge him to have been a man of wit. I know one instance of an impromptu which no length of study could have bettered. My merry friend, Jem White, had seen him one evening in ague cheek and recognising dodd the next day in fleet street was irresistibly impelled to take off his hat and salute him as the identical knight of the preceding evening with a save you sir andrew dodd not at all disconcerted at this unusual address from a stranger with a courteous, half-rebuking wave of the hand, put him off with an away fool.
Footnote 6. High Life Below Stairs. Essay 26 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Old Actors. London Magazine, April 1822. The artificial comedy or comedy of manners is quite extinct on our stage. Congreve and Farquhar show their heads once in seven years, only to be exploded and put down instantly. The times cannot bear them. Is it for a few wild speeches an occasional license of dialogue? I think not altogether. The business of their dramatic characters will not stand the moral test. We screw everything up to that. Idle gallantry in a fiction, a dream, the passing pageant of an evening, startles us in the same way as the alarming indications of profligacy in a son or ward in real life should startle a parent or guardian. We have no such middle emotions as dramatic interests left. We see a stage libertine playing his loose pranks of two hours' duration, and of no after-consequence, with the severe eyes which inspect real vices with their bearings upon two worlds. We are spectators to a plot or intrigue, not reducible in life to the point of strict morality, and take it all for truth. We substitute a real for a dramatic person, and judge him accordingly. We try him in our courts, from which there is no appeal to the dramatis personae, his peers. We have been spoiled with not sentimental comedy, but a tyrant far more pernicious to our pleasures, which has succeeded to it, the exclusive and all-devouring drama of common life, where the moral point is everything, where, instead of the fictitious, half-believed personages of the stage, the phantoms of old comedy, we recognize ourselves, our brothers, aunts, kinsfolk, allies, patrons, enemies, the same as in life, with an interest in what is going on so hearty and substantial that we cannot afford our moral judgment in its deepest and most vital results to compromise or slumber for a moment. What is there transacting, by no modification, is made to affect us in any other manner than the same events or characters would do in our relationships of life. We carry our fireside concerns to the theatre with us. We do not go thither, like our ancestors, to escape from the pressure of reality, so much as to confirm our experience of it, to make assurance double, and take a bond of fate. We must live our toilsome lives twice over, as it was the mournful privilege of Ulysses to descend twice to the shades. All that neutral ground of character which stood between vice and virtue, or which, in fact, was indifferent to neither, where neither properly was called in question, that, 
happy breathing-place from the burden of a perpetual moral questioning, the sanctuary and quiet Alsatia of hunted casuistry, is broken up and disfranchised as injurious to the interests of society. The privileges of the place are taken away by law. We dare not dally with images or names of wrong. We bark like foolish dogs at shadows. We dread infection from the scenic representation of disorder, and fear a painted pustule. In our anxiety that our morality should not take cold, we wrap it up in a great blanket surtout of precaution against the breeze and sunshine. I confess for myself that, with no great delinquencies to answer for, I am glad for a season to take an airing beyond the diocese of the strict conscience, not to live always in the precincts of the law-courts, but now and then, for a dream while or so, to imagine a world with no meddling restrictions, to get into recesses whither the hunter cannot follow me. Secret shades of woody Ida's inmost grove, while yet there was no fear of Jove. I come back to my cage and my restraint, the fresher and more healthy for it. I wear my shackles more contentedly, for having respired the breath of an imaginary freedom. I do not know how it is with others, but I feel the better always for the perusal of one of Congreve's, nay, why should I not add, even of Wycherley's comedies? I am the gayer, at least, for it, and I could never connect those sports of a witty fancy in any shape, with any result to be drawn from them to imitation in real life. They are a world of themselves, almost as much as a fairyland. Take one of their characters, male or female, with few exceptions they are alike, and place it in a modern play, and my virtuous indignation shall rise against the profligate wretch as warmly as the Catos of the pit could desire, because in a modern play I am to judge of right and wrong, and the standard of police is the measure of poetical justice. The atmosphere will blight it. It cannot thrive here. It is got into a moral world where it has no business, from which it must needs fall headlong, as dizzy and incapable of keeping its stand as a Swedenborgian bad spirit that has wandered unawares within the sphere of one of his good men or angels. But in its own world, do we feel the creature is so very bad? The Fainals and the Mirabels, the Dorimants and Lady Touchwoods, in their own sphere, do not offend my moral sense, or, in fact, appeal to it at all. They seem engaged in their proper element. They break through no laws, or conscientious restraints. They know of none. They have got out of Christendom, into the land, what shall I call it, of cuckoldry, the utopia of gallantry, where pleasure is duty, and the manners perfect freedom. It is altogether a speculative scene of things which has no reference whatever to the world that is. No good person can be justly offended as a spectator, because no good person suffers on the stage. Judged morally, every character in these plays, the few exceptions only are mistakes, is alike 
essentially vain and worthless. The great art of Congreve is especially shown in this, that he has entirely excluded from his scenes some little generosities in the part of Angelica perhaps accepted, not only anything like a faultless character, but any pretensions to goodness or good feelings whatsoever. Whether he did this designedly or instinctively, the effect is as happy as the design, if design, was bold. I used to wonder at the strange power which his way of the world in particular possesses of interesting you all along in the pursuits of characters for whom you absolutely care nothing, for you neither hate nor love his personages. And I think it is owing to this very indifference for any that you endure the whole. He has spread a privation of moral light, I will call it, rather than by the ugly name of palpable darkness over his creations, and his shadows flit before you without distinction or preference. Had he introduced a good character, a single gush of moral feeling, a revulsion of the judgment to actual life and actual duties, the impertinent Goshen would have only lighted to the discovery of deformities which now are none, because we think them none. Translated into real life, the characters of his and his friend Wycherley's dramas are profligates and strumpets, the business of their brief existence, the undivided pursuit of lawless gallantry. No other spring of action or possible motive of conduct is recognised. The principles which universally acted upon must reduce this frame of things to a chaos. But we do them wrong in so translating them. No such effects are produced in their world. When we are among them, we are amongst a chaotic people. We are not to judge them by our usages. No reverend institutions are insulted by their proceedings, for they have none among them. No peace of families is violated, for no family ties exist among them. No purity of the marriage bed is stained, for none is supposed to have a being. No deep affections are disquieted, no holy wedlock bands are snapped asunder, for affection's depth and wedded faith are not of the growth of that soil. There is neither right nor wrong, gratitude or its opposite, claim or duty, paternity or sonship. Of what consequence is it to virtue, or how is she at all concerned about it, whether Sir Simon or Dapperwit steal away Miss Martha, or who is the father of Lord Froth's or Sir Paul Pliant's children? The whole is a passing pageant, where we should sit as unconcerned at the issues for life or death as at a battle of the frogs and mice. But like Don Quixote, we take part against the puppets, and quite as impertinently. We dare not contemplate an Atlantis, a scheme out of which our coxcomical moral sense is for a little transitory ease excluded. We have not the courage to imagine a state of things for which there is neither reward nor punishment. We cling to the painful necessities of shame and blame. We would indict our very dreams. 
amidst the mortifying circumstances attendant upon growing old it is something to have seen the school for scandal in its glory this comedy grew out of congreve and witchily but gathered some allays of the sentimental comedy which followed theirs it is impossible that it should be now acted though it continues at long intervals to be announced in the bills its hero when palmer played it at least was joseph surface when i remember the gay boldness the graceful solemn plausibility the measured step the insinuating voice to express it in a word the downright acted villainy of the part so different from the pressure of conscious actual wickedness the hypocritical assumption of hypocrisy which made jack so deservedly a favourite in that character i must needs conclude the present generation of playgoers more virtuous than myself or more dense i freely confess that he divided the palm with me with his better brother that in fact i liked him quite as well not but there are passages like that for instance where joseph is made to refuse a pittance to a poor relation incongruities which sheridan was forced upon by the attempt to join the artificial with the sentimental comedy either of which must destroy the other but over these obstructions jack's manner floated him so lightly that a refusal from him no more shocked you than the easy compliance of charles gave you in reality any pleasure you got over the paltry question as quickly as you could to get back into the regions of pure comedy where no cold moral reigns the highly artificial manner of palmer in this character counteracted every disagreeable impression which you might have received from the contrast supposing them real between the two brothers you did not believe in joseph with the same faith with which you believed in charles the latter was a pleasant reality the former a no less pleasant poetical foil to it the comedy i have said is incongruous a mixture of congreve with sentimental incompatibilities the gaiety upon the whole is buoyant but it required the consummate art of palmer to reconcile the discordant elements a player with jack's talents if we had one now would not dare to do the part in the same manner he would instinctively avoid every turn which might tend to unrealize and so to make the character fascinating he must take his cue from his spectators who would expect a bad man and a good man as rigidly opposed to each other as the deathbed of those geniuses are contrasted in the prints which i am sorry to see have disappeared from the windows of my old friend carrington bowles of st paul's churchyard memory an exhibition as venerable as the adjacent cathedral and almost coeval of the bad and good man at the hour of death where the ghastly apprehensions of the former and truly the grim phantom with his reality of a toasting fork is not to be despised so finely contrast with the meek complacent kissing of the rod taking it in like honey and butter 
with which the latter submits to the scythe of the gentle bleeder time who wields his lancet with the apprehensive finger of a popular young lady's surgeon what flesh like loving grass would not covet to meet half-way the stroke of such a delicate mower john palmer was twice an actor in this exquisite part he was playing to you all the while that he was playing upon sir peter and his lady you had the first intimation of a sentiment before it was on his lips his altered voice was meant to you and you were to suppose that his fictitious co-flutterers on the stage perceived nothing at all of it what was it to you if that half-reality the husband was overreached by the puppetry or the thin thing lady teasel's reputation was persuaded it was dying of a plethory the fortunes of othello and desdemona were not concerned in it poor jack has passed from the stage in good time that he did not live to this our age of seriousness the fidgety pleasant old teasel king too is gone in good time his manner would scarce have passed current in our day we must love or hate acquit or condemn censure or pity exert our detestable coxcombry of moral judgment upon everything joseph surface to go down now must be a downright revolting villain no compromise his first appearance must shock and give horror his specious plausibilities which the pleasurable faculties of our fathers welcomed with such hearty greetings knowing that no harm dramatic harm even could come or was meant to come of them must inspire a cold and killing aversion charles the real canting person of the scene for the hypocrisy of joseph has its ulterior legitimate ends but his brother's professions of a good heart centre in downright self-satisfaction must be loved and joseph hated to balance one disagreeable reality with another sir peter teasel must be no longer the comic idea of a fretful old bachelor bridegroom whose teasings while king acted it were evidently as much played off at you as they were meant to concern anybody on the stage he must be a real person capable in law of sustaining an injury a person towards whom duties are to be acknowledged the genuine crim con antagonist of the villainous seducer joseph to realize him more his sufferings under his unfortunate match must have the downright pungency of life must or should make you not mirthful but uncomfortable just as the same predicament would move you in a neighbour or old friend the delicious scenes which give the play its name and zest must affect you in the same serious manner as if you heard the reputation of a dear female friend attacked in your real presence crabtree and sir benjamin those poor snakes that lived but in the sunshine of your mirth must be ripened by this hot-bed process of realization into asps or amphisbanas and mrs candor oh frightful 
become a hooded serpent? Or who that remembers Parsons and Dodd, the wasp and butterfly of the school for scandal in those two characters, and charming, natural Miss Pope, the perfect gentlewoman, as distinguished from the fine lady of comedy in this latter part, would forego the true scenic delight, the escape from life, the oblivion of consequences, the holiday barring out of the pedant reflection, those Saturnalia of two or three brief hours well won from the world, to sit instead at one of our modern plays, to have his coward conscience that, forsooth, must not be left for a moment, stimulated with perpetual appeals, dulled, rather, and blunted, as a faculty without repose must be, and his moral vanity pampered with images of notional justice, notional beneficence, lives saved without the spectator's risk, and fortunes given away that cost the author nothing. No piece was, perhaps, ever so completely cast in all its parts as this manager's comedy. Miss Farron had succeeded to Mrs. Abingdon in Lady Teasel, and Smith, the original Charles, had retired when I first saw it. The rest of the characters, with very slight exceptions, remained. I remember it was then the fashion to cry down John Kemble, who took the part of Charles after Smith, but I thought very unjustly. Smith, I fancy, was more airy, and took the eye with a certain gaiety of person. He brought with him no sombre recollections of tragedy. He had not to expiate the fault of having pleased beforehand in lofty declamation. He had no sins of Hamlet or of Richard to atone for. His failure in these parts was a passport to success in one of so opposite a tendency. But as far as I could judge, the weighty sense of Kemble made up for more personal incapacity than he had to answer for. His harshest tones in this part came steeped and dulcified in good humour. He made his defects a grace. His exact declamatory manner, as he managed it, only served to convey the points of his dialogue with more precision. It seemed to head the shaft to carry them deeper. Not one of his sparkling sentences was lost. I remember minutely how he delivered each in succession, and cannot by any effort imagine how any of them could be altered for the better. No man could deliver brilliant dialogue, the dialogue of Congreve, or of Wycherley, because none understood it, half so well as John Kemble. His valentine in love for love was, to my recollection, faultless. He flagged sometimes in the intervals of tragic passion. He would slumber over the level parts of an heroic character. His Macbeth has been known to nod. But he always seemed to me to be particularly alive to pointed and witty dialogue. The relaxing levities of tragedy have not been touched by any since him. The playful court-bred spirit in which he condescended to the players in Hamlet, the sportive relief which he threw into the darker shades of Richard, disappeared with him. 
tragedy is become a uniform dead weight they have fastened lead to her buskins she never pulls them off for the ease of a moment to invert a commonplace from niobe she never forgets herself to liquefaction john had his sluggish moods his torpors but they were the halting stones and resting places of his tragedy politic savings and fetches of the breath husbandry of the lungs when nature appointed him to be an economist rather i think than errors of the judgment they were at worst less painful than the eternal tormenting unappeasable vigilance the lidless dragon eyes of present fashionable tragedy the story of his swallowing opium pills to keep him lively upon the first night of a certain tragedy we may presume to be a piece of retaliatory pleasantry on the part of the suffering author but indeed john had the art of diffusing a complacent equable dullness which you knew not where to quarrel with over a piece which he did not like beyond any of his contemporaries john kemble had made up his mind early that all the good tragedies which could be written had been written and he resented any new attempt his shelves were full the old standards were scope enough for his ambition he ranged in them absolute and fair in otway full in shakespeare shone he succeeded to the old lawful thrones and did not care to adventure bottomry with a sir edward mortimer or any casual speculator that offered i remember too acutely for my peace the deadly extinguisher which he put upon my friend g's antonio g satiate with visions of political justice possibly not to be realized in our time or willing to let the sceptical worldling see that his anticipations of the future did not preclude a warm sympathy for men as they are and have been wrote a tragedy he chose a story affecting romantic spanish the plot simple without being naked the incidents uncommon without being overstrained antonio who gives the name to the piece is a sensitive young castilian who in a fit of his country honour immolates his sister but i must not anticipate the catastrophe the play reader is extant in choice english and you will employ a spare half-crown not injudiciously in the quest of it the conception was bold and the denouement the time and place in which the hero of it existed considered and not much out of keeping yet it must be confessed that it required a delicacy of handling both from the author and the performer so as not much to shock the prejudices of a modern english audience g in my opinion had done his part john who was in familiar habits with the philosopher had undertaken to play antonio great expectations were formed a philosopher's first play was a new era the night arrived i was favoured with a seat 
in an advantageous box between the author and his friend M. G. sat cheerful and confident in his friend M.'s looks, who had perused the manuscript, I read some terror. Antonio, in the person of John Philip Kemble, at length appeared, starched out in a ruff which no one could dispute, and in most irreproachable mustachios. John always dressed most provokingly correct on these occasions the first act swept by solemn and silent it went off as g assured m exactly as the opening act of a piece the protasis should do the cue of the spectators was to be mute the characters were but in their introduction the passions and the incidents would be developed hereafter. Applause hitherto would be impertinent. Silent attention was the effect all desirable. Poor M. acquiesced, but in his honest, friendly face I could discern a working which told how much more acceptable the plaudit of a single hand, however misplaced, would have been than all this reasoning. The second act, as in duty bound, rose a little in interest, but still John kept his forces under, in policy, as G would have it, and the audience were most complacently attentive. The protasis, in fact, was scarcely unfolded, the interest would warm in the next act, against which a special incident was provided. M. wiped his cheek, flushed with a friendly perspiration, tis M.'s way of showing his zeal, from every pore of him a perfume falls. I honour it above Alexander's. He had once or twice, during this act, joined his palms in a feeble endeavour to elicit a sound. They emitted a solitary noise, without an echo. There was no deep to answer to his deep. G. repeatedly begged him to be quiet. The third act, at length, brought on the scene which was to warm the piece progressively to the final flaming forth of the catastrophe. A philosophic calm settled upon the clear brow of G as it approached. The lips of M quivered. A challenge was held forth upon the stage, and there was promise of a fight. The pit roused themselves on this extraordinary occasion, and as their manner is, seemed disposed to make a ring, when suddenly Antonio, who was the challenged, turning the tables upon the hot challenger Don Guzman, who, by the way, should have had his sister, bulks his humour, and the pit's reasonable expectation at the same time, with some speeches out of the new philosophy against duelling. The audience were here fairly caught. Their courage was up and on the alert. A few blows, ding-dong, as R, the dramatist, afterwards expressed it to me, might have done the business, when their most exquisite moral sense was suddenly called in to assist in the mortifying negation of their own pleasure. They could not applaud, for disappointment. They would not condemn, for morality's sake. The interest stood stone still, and John's manner was not at all calculated to unpetrify it. It was Christmas time, and the atmosphere furnished some pretext 
for asthmatic affections. One began to cough, his neighbour sympathised with him, till a cough became epidemical. But when, from being half artificial in the pit, the cough got frightfully naturalised among the fictitious persons of the drama, and Antonio himself, albeit it was not set down in the stage directions, seemed more intent upon relieving his own lungs than the distresses of the author and his friends. Then G first knew fear, and, mildly turning to M, intimated that he had not been aware that Mr. K laboured under a cold, and that the performance might possibly have been postponed with advantage for some nights further, still keeping the same serene countenance, while M swept like a bull. It would be invidious to pursue the fates of this ill-starred evening. In vain did the plot thicken in the scenes that followed. In vain the dialogue wax more passionate and stirring, and the progress of the sentiment point more and more clearly to the arduous development which impended. In vain the action was accelerated while the acting stood still. From the beginning John had taken his stand, had wound himself up to an even tenor of stately declamation, from which no exigence of dialogue or person could make him swerve for an instant, to dream of his rising with the scene, the common trick of tragedians was preposterous, for from the onset he had planted himself as upon a terrace on an eminence vastly above the audience, and he kept that sublime level to the end. He looked from his throne of elevated sentiment upon the underworld of spectators with a most sovereign and becoming contempt. There was excellent pathos delivered out to them, and they would receive it, so, and they would not receive it, so. There was no offence against decorum in all this, nothing to condemn, to damn. Not an irreverent symptom of a sound was to be heard. The procession of verbiage stalked on through four and five acts, no one venturing to predict what would come of it, when towards the winding up of the latter, Antonio, with an irrelevancy that seemed to stagger Elvira herself, for she had been coolly arguing the point of honour with him, suddenly whips out a poniard, and stabs his sister to the heart. The effect was as if a murder had been committed in cold blood. The whole house rose up in clamorous indignation, demanding justice. The feeling rose far above hisses. I believe at that instant, if they could have got him, they would have torn the unfortunate author to pieces. Not that the act itself was so exorbitant, or of a complexion different from what they themselves would have applauded upon another occasion in a Brutus or an Appius, but for want of attending to Antonio's words, which palpably led to the expectation of no less dire an event, Instead of being seduced by his manner, 
which seemed to promise a sleep of a less alarming nature than it was his cue to inflict upon Elvira. They found themselves betrayed into an accomplished ship of murder, a perfect misprision of parricide, while they dreamed of nothing less. M, I believe, was the only person who suffered acutely from the failure, for G, thenceforward, with a serenity unattainable, but by the true philosophy, abandoning a precarious popularity, retired into his fast hold of speculation. The drama in which the world was to be his tiring room, and remote posterity, his applauding spectators at once, and actors. Elia Essay 27 of The Last Essays of Elia by Charles Lamb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Old Actors. London Magazine. October 1822. I do not know a more mortifying thing than to be conscious of a foregone delight, with a total oblivion of the person and manner which conveyed it. In dreams I often stretch and strain after the countenance of Edwin, whom I once saw in Peeping Tom. I cannot catch a feature of him. He is no more to me than Noakes or Pinkethman. Parsons and still more Dodd were near being lost to me, till I was refreshed with their portrait's fine treat the other day at Mr. Matthews's gallery at Highgate, which, with the exception of the Hogarth pictures a few years since exhibited in Pall Mall, was the most delightful collection I ever gained admission to. There hang the players in their single persons and in grouped scenes from the restoration. Betterton's booths, garricks, justifying the prejudices which we entertain for them, the brace girdles, the Mountforts, and the old fields fresh as Kibber has described them, the Waffington, a true Hogarth, upon a couch, dallying and dangerous, the screen scene in Brinsley's famous comedy with Smith and Mrs. Abingdon, whom I have not seen, and the rest whom, having seen, I see still there. There is Henderson, unrivalled in Comus, whom I saw at second hand in the elder Harley. Harley, the rival of Holman in Horatio. Holman, with the bright glittering teeth in Lothario, and the deep pavoir sighs in Romeo. The jolliest person, our son is fat, of any hamlet I have yet seen, with the most laudable attempts for a personable man at looking melancholy, and Pope, the abdicated monarch of tragedy and comedy in Harry the Eighth and Lord Townley. There hang the two Aikins, brethren in mediocrity, Rawton, who in Kitely seemed to have forgotten that in prouder days he had personated Alexander, the specious form of John Palmer, with the special effrontery of Bobby Bensley, with the trumpet tongue, and little quick, the retired Diocletian of Islington, with his squeak like a Bartholomew fiddle. 
there are fixed cold as in life the immovable features of moody who afraid of o'erstepping nature sometimes stopped short of her and the restless fidgetiness of lewis who with no such fears not seldom leaped o'er the other side there hang farron and whitfield and burton and fillimore names of small account in those times but which remembered now or casually recalled by the sight of an old playbill with their associated recordations can drown an eye unused to flow there too hangs and not far removed from them in death the graceful plainness of the first mrs pope with a voice unstrung by age but which in her better days must have competed with the silver tones of barry himself so enchanting in decay do i remember it of all her lady parts exceeding herself in the lady quakeress there earth touched heaven of o'keefe when she played it to the merry cousin of lewis and mrs mattox the sensiblest of viragos and miss pope a gentlewoman ever to the verge of ungentility with churchill's compliment still burnishing upon her gay honeycomb lips there are the two banisters and sedgwick and kelly and dignam diggy and the bygone features of mrs ward matchless in lady love rule and the collective majesty of the whole kemble family and shakespeare's woman dora jordan and by her two antics who in former and in latter days have cheaply beguiled us of our griefs whose portraits we shall strive to recall for the sympathy of those who may not have had the benefit of viewing the matchless highgate collection mr Seward. Oh, for a slipshod muse to celebrate in numbers loose and shambling as himself the merits and the person of mr richard suet comedian richard or rather dicky suet for so in his lifetime he was best pleased to be called and time hath ratified the appellation lieth buried on the north side of the cemetery of holy paul to whose service his nonage and tender years were set apart and dedicated there are who do yet remember him at that period his pipe clear and harmonious he would often speak of his chorister days when he was a cherub dicky what clipped his wings or made it expedient that he should exchange the holy for the profane state whether he had lost his good voice his best recommendation to that office like sir john with hallowing and singing of anthems or whether he was a judge to lack something even in those early years of the gravity indispensable to an occupation which professeth to commerce with the skies i could never rightly learn but we find him after the probation of a twelvemonth or so reverting to a secular condition and become one of us i think he was not altogether of that timber out of which cathedral seats and sounding-boards are hewed but if a glad heart kind and therefore glad be any part of sanctity then might the robe of motley 
with which he invested himself with so much humility after his deprivation, and which he wore so long with so much blameless satisfaction to himself and to the public, be accepted for a surplus, his white stole and alb. The first fruits of his secularization was an engagement upon the boards of old Drury, at which theatre he commenced, as I have been told, with adopting the manner of Parsons in old men's characters. At the period in which most of us knew him, he was no more an imitator than he was in any true sense himself imitable. He was the Robin Goodfellow of the stage. He came in to trouble all things with a welcome perplexity, himself no whit troubled for the matter. He was known like Puck by his note, ha, 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 sometimes deepening to ho, 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 with an irresistible accession, derived perhaps remotely from his ecclesiastical education, foreign to his prototype of, oh, la, thousands of hearts yet respond to the chuckling, oh, la, <laughs> of Dicky Suet, brought back to their remembrance by the faithful transcript of his friend Matthews's mimicry. The force of nature could no further go. He drawled upon the stock of these two syllables, richer than the cuckoo. Care that troubles all the world was forgotten in his composition. Had he had but two grains, nay, half a grain of it, he could never have supported himself upon those two spider strings which served him in the latter part of his unmixed existence as legs. A doubt or a scruple must have made him totter, a sigh had puffed him down, the weight of a frown had staggered him, a wrinkle made him lose his balance. But on he went, scrambling upon those airy stilts of his, with Robin Goodfellow, thoroughbreak, thoroughbriar, reckless of a scratched face or a torn doublet. Shakespeare foresaw him when he framed his fools and jesters. They have all the true suet stamp, a loose gait, a slippery tongue, this last the ready midwife, to a without pain delivered jest, in words light as air, venting truths deep as the centre, with idlest rhymes, tagging conceit when busiest, singing with leer in the tempest, or Sir Toby at the buttery hatch. Jack Bannister and he had the fortune to be more of personal favourites with the town than any actors before or after. The difference, I take it, was this. Jack was more beloved for his sweet, good-natured, moral pretensions. Dicky was more liked for his sweet, good-natured, no pretensions at all. Your whole conscience stirred with Bannister's performance of Walter in The Children in the Wood. How dearly beautiful it was! But Dicky seemed like a thing, as Shakespeare says of love, too young to know what conscience is. He put us into Vesta's days. Evil fled before him not as from Jack, as from an antagonist, but because he could not touch him any more than a cannon-ball, a fly. 
he was delivered from the burden of that death. And when death came himself, not in metaphor, to fetch Dicky, it is recorded of him by Robert Palmer, who kindly watched his exit, that he received the last stroke, neither varying his accustomed tranquillity nor tune, with the simple exclamation, worthy to have been recorded in his epitaph. O oh, la! O oh, la, Bobby! Mr. Munden Not many nights ago we had come home from seeing this extraordinary performer in Cockletop, and uh, when we retired to our pillow, his whimsical visage still stuck by us in a manner as to threaten sleep. In vain we tried to divest ourselves of it by conjuring up the most opposite associations. We resolved to be serious. We raised up the gravest topics of life, private misery, public calamity, all would not do. There the antic sat, mocking our state. His queer bisnomy, his bewildering costume, all the strange things which he had raked together, his serpentine rod swagging about in his pocket, Cleopatra's tear, and the rest of his relics, O'Keefe's wild farce, and his wilder commentary, till the passion of laughter, like grief in excess, relieved itself by its own weight, inviting the sleep which in the first instance it had driven away. But we were not to escape so easily. No sooner did we fall into slumbers than the same image, only more perplexing, assailed us in the shape of dreams. Not one Munden, but five hundred, were dancing before us, like the faces which, whether you will or no, come when you have been taking opium. All the strange combinations, which this strangest of all strange mortals ever shot his proper countenance into, from the day he came commissioned to dry up the tears of the town for the loss of the now almost forgotten Edwin. Oh, for the power of the pencil to have fixed them when we awoke! A season or two since, there was exhibited a Hogarth gallery. We do not see where there should not be a Munden gallery. In richness and variety, the latter would not fall far short of the former. There is one face of Farley, one face of Knight, one face, but what a one it is, of Liston, but Munden has none that you can properly pin down and call his. When you think he has exhausted his battery of looks in unaccountable warfare with your gravity, suddenly he sprouts out an entirely new set of features like Hydra. He is not one, but legion, not so much a comedian as a company. If his name could be multiplied like his countenance, it might fill a playbill. He, and he alone, literally makes faces. Applied to any other person, the phrase is a mere figure, uh, denoting a certain modifications of the human countenance. Out of some invisible wardrobe, he dips for faces, as his friend Seward used for wigs, and fetches them out as easily. We should not be surprised to see him some day put out the head of a river horse, 
or come forth a peewit or lapwing some feathered metamorphosis we have seen this gifted actor in sir christopher curry in old daunton diffuse a glow of sentiment which has made the pulse of a crowded theatre beat like that of one man when he has come in aid of the pulpit doing good to the moral heart of a people we have seen some faint approaches to this sort of excellence in other players but in what has been truly denominated the sublime of farce munden stands out as single and unaccompanied as hogarth hogarth strange to tell had no followers the school of munden began and must end with himself can any man wonder like him can any man see ghosts like him or fight with his own shadow a cessar as he does in that strangely neglected thing the cobbler of preston where his alternations from the cobbler to the magnifico and from the magnifico to the cobbler keep the brain of the spectator in as wild a ferment as if some arabian night were being acted before him or as if thalaba were no tale who like him can throw or ever attempted to throw a supernatural interest over the commonest daily life objects a table or a joint stool in his conception rises into a dignity equivalent to cassiopeia's chair it is invested with constellatory importance you could not speak of it with more deference if it were mounted into the firmament a beggar in the hands of michael angelo says fuseli rose the patriarch of poverty so the gusto of munden antiquates and ennobles what it touches his pots and his ladles are as grand and primal as the seething pots and hooks seen in old prophetic vision a tub of butter contemplated by him amounts to a platonic idea he understands a leg of mutton in its quiddity he stands wondering amid the commonplace materials of life like primeval man with the sun and stars about him elia end of essay 27